Part One Prologue of Under Western Eyes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Under Western Eyes by Joseph Conrad. Part One Prologue. Epigraph i would take liberty from any hand as a hungry man would snatch a piece of bread miss halden to begin with i wish to disclaim the possession of those high gifts of imagination and expression which would have enabled my pen to create for the reader the personality of the man who called himself after the russian custom cyril son of isidore kirillo sidorovitch razumov if i have ever had these gifts in any sort of living form they have been smothered out of existence a long time ago under a wilderness of words words as is well known are the great foes of reality i have been for many years a teacher of languages it is an occupation which at length becomes fatal to whatever share of imagination observation and insight an ordinary person may be heir to to a teacher of languages there comes a time when the world is but a place of many words and man appears a mere talking animal not much more wonderful than a parrot this being so i could not have observed mr razumov or guessed at his reality by the force of insight much less have imagined him as he was even to invent the mere bald facts of his life would have been utterly beyond my powers but i think that without this declaration the readers of these pages will be able to detect in the story the marks of documentary evidence and that is perfectly correct it is based on a document all i have brought to it is my knowledge of the russian language which is sufficient for what is attempted here the document of course is something in the nature of a journal a diary yet not exactly that in its actual form for instance most of it was not written up from day to day though all the entries are dated some of these entries cover months of time and extend over dozens of pages all the earlier part is a retrospect in a narrative form relating to an event which took place about a year before i must mention that i have lived for a long time in geneva a whole quarter of that town on account of many russians residing there is called la petite russie little russia i had a rather extensive connection in little russia at that time yet i confess that i have no comprehension of the russian character the illogicality of their attitude the arbitrariness of their conclusions the frequency of the exceptional should present no difficulty to a student of many grammars but there must be something else in the way some special human trait one of those subtle differences that are beyond the ken of mere professors what must remain striking to a teacher of languages is the russians extraordinary love of words they gather them up they cherish them but they don't hoard them in their breasts on the contrary they are always ready to pour them out by the hour or by the night with an enthusiasm a sweeping abundance with such an aptness of application sometimes that as in the case of very accomplished parrots one can't defend oneself from the suspicion that they really understand what they say there is a generosity in their ardour of speech which removes it as far as possible from common loquacity and it is ever too disconnected to be classed as eloquence but i must apologize for this digression it would be idle to inquire why mr razumov has left this record behind him it is inconceivable that he should have wished any human eye to see it a mysterious impulse of human nature comes into play here putting aside samuel pepys who has forced in this way the door of immortality innumerable people criminals saints philosophers young girls statesmen and simple imbeciles have kept self-revealing records from vanity no doubt but also from other more inscrutable motives there must be a wonderful soothing power in mere words since so many men have used them for self-communion being myself a quiet individual i take it that what all men are really after is some form or perhaps only some formula of peace certainly they are crying loud enough for it at the present day what sort of peace kirillo sidorovitch razumov expected to find in the writing up of his record it passeth my understanding to guess the fact remains that he has written it mr razumov was a tall well-proportioned young man 
quite unusually dark for a russian from the central provinces his good looks would have been unquestionable if it had not been for a peculiar lack of fineness in the features it was as if a face modelled vigorously in wax with some approach even to a classical correctness of type had been held close to a fire till all sharpness of line had been lost in the softening of the material but even thus he was sufficiently good-looking his manner too was good in discussion he was easily swayed by argument and authority with his younger compatriots he took the attitude of an inscrutable listener a listener of the kind that hears you out intelligently and then just changes the subject this sort of trick which may arise either from intellectual insufficiency or from an imperfect trust in one's own convictions procured for mr razumov a reputation of profundity amongst a lot of exuberant talkers in the habit of exhausting themselves daily by ardent discussion a comparatively taciturn personality is naturally credited with reserved power by his comrades at the st petersburg university kirillo sidorovitch razumov third year's student in philosophy was looked upon as a strong nature an altogether trustworthy man this in a country where an opinion may be a legal crime visited by death or sometimes by a fate worse than mere death meant that he was worthy of being trusted with forbidden opinions he was liked also for his amiability and for his quiet readiness to oblige his comrades even at the cost of personal inconvenience mr razumov was supposed to be the son of an archpriest and to be protected by a distinguished nobleman perhaps of his own distant province but his outward appearance accorded badly with such humble origin such a descent was not credible it was indeed suggested that mr razumov was the son of an archpriest's pretty daughter which of course would put a different complexion on the matter this theory also rendered intelligible the protection of the distinguished nobleman all this however had never been investigated maliciously or otherwise no one knew or cared who the nobleman in question was razumov received a modest but very sufficient allowance from the hands of an obscure attorney who seemed to act as his guardian in some measure now and then he appeared at some professor's informal reception apart from that razumov was not known to have any social relations in the town he attended the obligatory lectures regularly and was considered by the authorities as a very promising student he worked at home in the manner of a man who means to get on but did not shut himself up severely for that purpose he was always accessible and there was nothing secret or reserved in his life end of part one prologue recording by expatriate in bangor maine part one chapter one of under western eyes by joseph conrad this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter one the origin of mr razumov's record is connected with an event characteristic of modern russia in the actual fact the assassination of a prominent statesman and still more characteristic of the moral corruption of an oppressed society where the noblest aspirations of humanity the desire of freedom an ardent patriotism the love of justice the sense of pity and even the fidelity of simple minds are prostituted to the lusts of hate and fear the inseparable companions of an uneasy despotism the fact alluded to above is a successful attempt on the life of mr de p the president of the notorious repressive commission of some years ago the minister of state invested with extraordinary powers the newspapers made noise enough about that fanatical narrow-chested figure in gold-laced uniform with a face of crumpled parchment insipid bespectacled eyes and the cross of the order of st procopius hung under the skinny throat for a time it may be remembered not a month passed without his portrait appearing in some one of the illustrated papers of europe he served the monarchy by imprisoning exiling or sending to the gallows men and women young and old with an equable unwearied industry in his mystic acceptance of the principle of autocracy he was bent on extirpating from the land every vestige of anything that resembled freedom in public institutions and in his ruthless persecution of the rising generation he seemed to aim at the destruction of the very hope of liberty itself it is said that this execrated personality 
had not enough imagination to be aware of the hate he inspired it is hardly credible but it is a fact that he took very few precautions for his safety in the preamble of a certain famous state paper he had declared once that the thought of liberty has never existed in the act of the creator from the multitude of men's counsel nothing could come but revolt and disorder and revolt and disorder in a world created for obedience and stability is sin it was not reason but authority which expressed the divine intention god was the autocrat of the universe it may be that the man who made this declaration believed that heaven itself was bound to protect him in his remorseless defence of autocracy on this earth no doubt the vigilance of the police saved him many times but as a matter of fact when his appointed fate overtook him the competent authorities could not have given him any warning they had no knowledge of any conspiracy against the minister's life had no hint of any plot through their usual channels of information had seen no signs were aware of no suspicious movements or dangerous persons mr de p was being driven towards the railway station in a two-horse uncovered sleigh with footmen and coachmen on the box snow had been falling all night making the roadway uncleared as yet at this early hour very heavy for the horses it was still falling thickly but the sleigh must have been observed and marked down as it drew over to the left before taking a turn the footman noticed a peasant walking slowly on the edge of the pavement with his hands in the pockets of his sheepskin coat and his shoulders hunched up to his ears under the falling snow on being overtaken this peasant suddenly faced about and swung his arm in an instant there was a terrible shock a detonation muffled in the multitude of snowflakes both horses lay dead and mangled on the ground and the coachman with a shrill cry had fallen off the box mortally wounded the footman who survived had no time to see the face of the man in the sheepskin coat after throwing the bomb this last got away but it is supposed that seeing a lot of people surging up on all sides of him in the falling snow and all running towards the scene of the explosion he thought it safer to turn back with them in an incredibly short time an excited crowd assembled round the sledge the minister president getting out unhurt into the deep snow stood near the groaning coachman and addressed the people repeatedly in his weak colourless voice i beg of you to keep off for the love of god i beg of you good people to keep off it was then that a tall young man who had remained standing perfectly still within a carriage gateway two houses lower down stepped out into the street and walking up rapidly flung another bomb over the heads of the crowd it actually struck the minister president on the shoulder as he stooped over his dying servant then falling between his feet exploded with a terrific concentrated violence striking him dead to the ground finishing the wounded man and practically annihilating the empty sledge in the twinkling of an eye with a yell of horror the crowd broke up and fled in all directions except for those who fell dead or dying where they stood nearest to the minister president and one or two others who did not fall till they had run a little way the first explosion had brought together a crowd as if by enchantment the second made as swiftly a solitude in the street for hundreds of yards in each direction through the falling snow people looked from afar at the small heap of dead bodies lying upon each other near the carcasses of the two horses nobody dared to approach till some cossacks of a street patrol galloped up and dismounting began to turn over the dead amongst the innocent victims of the second explosion laid out on the pavement there was a body dressed in a peasant's sheepskin coat but the face was unrecognizable there was absolutely nothing found in the pockets of its poor clothing and it was the only one whose identity was never established that day mr razumov got up at his usual hour and spent the morning within the university buildings listening to the lectures and working for some time in the library he heard the first vague rumour of something in the way of bomb-throwing at the table of the student's ordinary where he was accustomed to eat his two o'clock dinner but this rumour was made up of mere whispers and this was russia where it was not always safe for a student especially to appear too much interested in certain kinds of whispers razumov was one of those men who living in a period of mental and political unrest keep an instinctive hold on normal practical everyday life he was aware of the emotional tension of his time he even responded to it in an indefinite way but his main concern was with his work his studies and with his own future officially and in fact without a family for the daughter of the archpriest had long been dead no home influences had shaped his opinions or his feelings 
he was as lonely in the world as a man swimming in the deep sea the word razumov was the mere label of a solitary individuality there were no razumovs belonging to him anywhere his closest parentage was defined in the statement that he was a russian whatever good he expected from life would be given to or withheld from his hopes by that connection alone this immense parentage suffered from the throes of internal dissensions and he shrank mentally from the fray as a good-natured man may shrink from taking definite sides in a violent family quarrel razumov going home reflected that having prepared all the matters of the forthcoming examination he could now devote his time to the subject of the prize essay he hankered after the silver medal the prize was offered by the ministry of education the names of the competitors would be submitted to the minister himself the mere fact of trying would be considered meritorious in the higher quarters and the possessor of the prize would have a claim to an administrative appointment of the better sort after he had taken his degree the student razumov in an access of elation forgot the dangers menacing the stability of the institutions which give rewards and appointments but remembering the medalist of the year before razumov the young man of no parentage was sobered he and some others happened to be assembled in their comrades rooms at the very time when that last received the official advice of his success he was a quiet unassuming young man forgive me he had said with a faint apologetic smile and taking up his cap i am going out to order up some wine but i must first send a telegram to my folk at home i say won't the old people make it a festive time for the neighbours for twenty miles round our place razumov thought there was nothing of that sort for him in the world his success would matter to no one but he felt no bitterness against the nobleman his protector who was not a provincial magnate as was generally supposed he was in fact nobody less than prince k once a great and splendid figure in the world and now his day being over a senator and a gouty invalid living in a still splendid but more domestic manner he had some young children and a wife as aristocratic and proud as himself in all his life razumov was allowed only once to come into personal contact with the prince it had the air of a chance meeting in the little attorney's office one day razumov coming in by appointment found a stranger standing there a tall aristocratic-looking personage with silky grey side-whiskers the bald-headed sly little lawyer fellow called out come in come in mr razumov with a sort of ironic heartiness then turning deferentially to the stranger with the grand air a ward of mine your excellency one of the most promising students of his faculty in the st petersburg university to his intense surprise razumov saw a white shapely hand extended to him he took it in great confusion it was soft and passive and heard at the same time a condescending murmur in which he caught only the words satisfactory and persevere but the most amazing thing of all was to feel suddenly a distinct pressure of the white shapely hand just before it was withdrawn a light pressure like a secret sign the emotion of it was terrible razumov's heart seemed to leap into his throat when he raised his eyes the aristocratic personage motioning the little lawyer aside had opened the door and was going out the attorney rummaged amongst the papers on his desk for a time do you know who that was he asked suddenly razumov whose heart was thumping hard yet shook his head in silence that was prince k you wonder what he could be doing in the hole of a poor legal rat like myself eh these awfully great people have their sentimental curiosities like common sinners but if i were you kirylo sidorovitch he continued leering and laying a peculiar emphasis on the patronymic i wouldn't boast at large of the introduction it would not be prudent kirylo sidorovitch oh dear no it would be in fact dangerous for your future the young man's ears burned like fire his sight was dim that man razumov was saying to himself he henceforth it was by this monosyllable that mr razumov got into the habit of referring mentally to the stranger with grey silky side whiskers from that time too when walking in the more fashionable quarters he noted with interest the magnificent horses and carriages with prince k s liveries on the box once he saw the princess get out she was shopping followed by two girls of which one was nearly a head taller than the other their fair hair hung loose down their backs in the english style they had merry eyes their coats muffs and little fur caps were exactly alike and their cheeks and noses were tinged a cheerful pink by the frost 
they crossed the pavement in front of him and razumov went on his way smiling shyly to himself his daughters they resembled him the young man felt a glow of warm friendliness towards these girls who would never know of his existence presently they would marry generals or kammerherrs and have girls and boys of their own who perhaps would be aware of him as a celebrated old professor decorated possibly a privy councillor one of the glories of russia nothing more but a celebrated professor was a somebody distinction would convert the label razumov into an honoured name there was nothing strange in the student razumov's wish for distinction a man's real life is that accorded to him in the thoughts of other men by reason of respect or natural love returning home on the day of the attempt on mr de p s life razumov resolved to have a good try for the silver medal climbing slowly the four flights of the dark dirty staircase in the house where he had his lodgings he felt confident of success the winner's name would be published in the papers on new year's day and at the thought that he would most probably read it there razumov stopped short on the stairs for an instant then went on smiling faintly at his own emotion this is but a shadow he said to himself but the metal is a solid beginning with those ideas of industry in his head the warmth of his room was agreeable and encouraging i shall put in four hours of good work he thought but no sooner had he closed the door than he was horribly startled all black against the usual tall stove of white tiles gleaming in the dusk stood a strange figure wearing a skirted close-fitting brown cloth coat strapped round the waist in long boots and with a little astrakhan cap on its head it loomed lithe and martial razumov was utterly confounded it was only when the figure advancing two paces asked in an untroubled grave voice if the outer door was closed that he regained his power of speech halden victor victorovitch is that you yes the outer door is shut all right but this is indeed unexpected victor halden a student older than most of his contemporaries at the university was not one of the industrious set he was hardly ever seen at lectures the authorities had marked him as restless and unsound very bad notes but he had a great personal prestige with his comrades and influenced their thoughts razumov had never been intimate with him they had met from time to time at gatherings in other students houses they had even had a discussion together one of those discussions on first principles dear to the sanguine minds of youth razumov wished the man had chosen some other time to come for a chat he felt in good trim to tackle the prize essay but as holden could not be slightingly dismissed razumov adopted the tone of hospitality asking him to sit down and smoke kirylo sidorovitch said the other flinging off his cap we are not perhaps in exactly the same camp your judgment is more philosophical you are a man of few words but i haven't met anybody who dared to doubt the generosity of your sentiments there is a solidity about your character which cannot exist without courage razumov felt flattered and began to murmur shyly something about being very glad of his good opinion when holden raised his hand that is what i was saying to myself he continued as i dodged in the woodyard down by the riverside he has a strong character this young man i said to myself he does not throw his soul to the winds your reserve has always fascinated me kirylo sidorovitch so i tried to remember your address but look here it was a piece of luck your dvornik was away from the gate talking to a sleigh driver on the other side of the street i met no one on the stairs not a soul as i came up to your floor i caught sight of your landlady coming out of your rooms but she did not see me she crossed the landing to her own side and then i slipped in i have been here two hours expecting you to come in every moment razumov had listened in astonishment but before he could open his mouth halden added speaking deliberately it was i who removed de p this morning razumov kept down a cry of dismay the sentiment of his life being utterly ruined by this contact with such a crime expressed itself quaintly by a sort of half derisive mental exclamation there goes my silver medal Alden continued after waiting a while you say nothing kirylo sidorovitch i understand your silence to be sure i cannot expect you with your frigid english manner to embrace me but never mind your manners you have enough heart to have heard the sound of weeping and gnashing of teeth this man raised in the land that would be enough to get over any philosophical hopes he was uprooting the tender plant he had to be stopped he was a dangerous man a convinced man 
three more years of his work would have put us back fifty years into bondage and look at all the lives wasted at all the souls lost in that time his curt self-confident voice suddenly lost its ring and it was in a dull tone that he added yes brother i have killed him it's weary work razumov had sunk into a chair every moment he expected a crowd of policemen to rush in there must have been thousands of them out looking for that man walking up and down in his room alden was talking again in a restrained steady voice now and then he flourished an arm slowly without excitement he told razumov how he had brooded for a year how he had not slept properly for weeks he and another had a warning of the minister's movements from a certain person late the evening before he and that another prepared their engines and resolved to have no sleep till the deed was done they walked the streets under the falling snow with the engines on them exchanging not a word the livelong night when they happened to meet a police patrol they took each other by the arm and pretended to be a couple of peasants on the spree they reeled and talked in drunken hoarse voices except for these strange outbreaks they kept silence moving on ceaselessly their plans had been previously arranged at daybreak they made their way to the spot which they knew the sledge must pass when it appeared in sight they exchanged a muttered good-bye and separated the other remained at the corner Holden took up a position a little farther up the street after throwing his engine he ran off and in a moment was overtaken by the panic-struck people flying away from the spot after the second explosion they were wild with terror he was jostled once or twice he slowed down for the rush to pass him and then turned to the left into a narrow street there he was alone he marvelled at this immediate escape the work was done he could hardly believe it he fought with an almost irresistible longing to lie down on the pavement and sleep but this sort of faintness a drowsy faintness passed off quickly he walked faster making his way to one of the poorer parts of the town in order to look up zimianitch this zimianitch razumov understood was a sort of town peasant who had got on owner of a small number of sledges and horses for hire alden paused in his narrative to exclaim a bright spirit a hardy soul the best driver in st petersburg he has a team of three horses there ah he's a fellow this man had declared himself willing to take out safely at any time one or two persons to the second or third railway station on one of the southern lines but there had been no time to warn him the night before his usual haunt seemed to be a low-class eating-house on the outskirts of the town when holden got there the man was not to be found he was not expected to turn up again till the evening holden wandered away restlessly he saw the gate of a woodyard open and went in to get out of the wind which swept the bleak broad thoroughfare the great rectangular piles of cut wood loaded with snow resembled the huts of a village at first the watchman who discovered him crouching amongst them talked in a friendly manner he was a dried-up old man wearing two ragged army coats one over the other his wizened little face tied up under the jaw and over the ears in a dirty red handkerchief looked comical presently he grew sulky and then all at once without rhyme or reason began to shout furiously aren't you ever going to clear out of this you loafer we know all about factory hands of your sort a big strong young chap you aren't even drunk what do you want here you don't frighten us take yourself and your ugly eyes away holden stopped before the sitting razumov his supple figure with the white forehead above which the fair hair stood straight up had an aspect of lofty daring he did not like my eyes he said and so here i am razumov made an effort to speak calmly but pardon me victor victorovitch we know each other so little i don't see why you confidence said Halden. this word sealed razumov's lips as if a hand had been clapped on his mouth his brain seethed with arguments and so here you are he muttered through his teeth the other did not detect the tone of anger neither suspected it yes and nobody knows i am here you are the last person that could be suspected should i get caught that's an advantage you see and then speaking to a superior mind like yours i can well say all the truth it occurred to me that you you have no one belonging to you no ties no one to suffer for it if this came out by some means there have been enough ruined russian homes as it is but i don't see how my passage through your rooms can ever be known if i should be got hold of i'll know how to keep silent no matter what they may be pleased to do to me he added grimly 
he began to walk again while razumov sat still appalled you thought that he faltered out almost sick with indignation yes razumov yes brother some day you shall help to build you suppose that i am a terrorist now a destructor of what is but consider that the true destroyers are they who destroy the spirit of progress and truth not the avengers who merely kill the bodies of the persecutors of human dignity men like me are necessary to make room for self-contained thinking men like you well we have made the sacrifice of our lives but all the same i want to escape if it can be done it is not my life i want to save but my power to do i won't live idle oh no don't make any mistake razumov men like me are rare and besides an example like this is more awful to oppressors when the perpetrator vanishes without a trace they sit in their offices and palaces and quake all i want you to do is to help me to vanish no great matter that only to go by and by and see zimianitch for me at that place where i went this morning just tell him he whom you know wants a well-horsed sledge to pull up half an hour after midnight at the seventh lamp-post on the left counting from the upper end of karabelnaya if nobody gets in the sledge is to run round a block or two so as to come back past the same spot in ten minutes time razumov wondered why he had not cut short that talk and told this man to go away long before was it weakness or what he concluded that it was a sound instinct haldin must have been seen it was impossible that some people should not have noticed the face and appearance of the man who threw the second bomb haldin was a noticeable person the police in their thousands must have had his description within the hour with every moment the danger grew sent out to wander in the streets he could not escape being caught in the end the police would very soon find out all about him they would set about discovering a conspiracy everybody haldin had ever known would be in the greatest danger unguarded expressions little facts in themselves innocent would be counted for crimes razumov remembered certain words he said the speeches he had listened to the harmless gatherings he had attended it was almost impossible for a student to keep out of that sort of thing without becoming suspect to his comrades razumov saw himself shut up in a fortress worried badgered perhaps ill-used he saw himself deported by an administrative order his life broken ruined and robbed of all hope he saw himself at best leading a miserable existence under police supervision in some small far-away provincial town without friends to assist his necessities or even take any steps to alleviate his lot as others had others had fathers mothers brothers relations connections to move heaven and earth on their behalf he had no one the very officials that sentenced him some morning would forget his existence before sunset he saw his youth pass away from him in misery and half starvation his strength give way his mind become an abject thing he saw himself creeping broken down and shabby about the streets dying unattended in some filthy hole of a room or on the sordid bed of a government hospital he shuddered then the peace of bitter calmness came over him it was best to keep this man out of the streets till he could be got rid of with some chance of escaping that was the best that could be done razumov of course felt the safety of his lonely existence to be permanently endangered this evening's doings could turn up against him at any time as long as this man lived and the present institutions endured they appeared to him rational and indestructible at that moment they had a force of harmony in contrast with the horrible discord of this man's presence he hated the man he said quietly yes of course i will go you must give me precise directions and for the rest depend on me ah you are a fellow collected cool as a cucumber a regular englishman where did you get your soul from there aren't many like you look here brother men like me leave no posterity but their souls are not lost no man's soul is ever lost it works for itself or else where would be the sense of self-sacrifice of martyrdom of conviction of faith the labours of the soul what will become of my soul when i die in the way i must die soon very soon perhaps it shall not perish don't make a mistake razumov this is not murder it is war war my spirit shall go on warring in some russian body till all falsehood is swept out of the world the modern civilization is false but a new revelation shall come out of russia ha you say nothing you are a sceptic 
i respect your philosophical scepticism razumov but don't touch the soul the russian soul that lives in all of us it has a future it has a mission i tell you or else why should i have been moved to do this reckless like a butcher in the middle of all these innocent people scattering death i i i wouldn't hurt a fly not so loud warned razumov harshly haldin sat down abruptly and leaning his head on his folded arms burst into tears he wept for a long time the dusk had deepened in the room razumov motionless in sombre wonder listened to the sobs the other raised his head got up and with an effort mastered his voice yes men like me leave no posterity he repeated in a subdued tone i have a sister though she's with my old mother i persuaded them to go abroad this year thank god not a bad little girl my sister she has the most trustful eyes of any human being that ever walked this earth she will marry well i hope she may have children sons perhaps look at me my father was a government official in the provinces he had a little land too a simple servant of god a true russian in his way his was the soul of obedience but i am not like him they say i resemble my mother's eldest brother an officer they shot him in twenty-eight under nicholas you know haven't i told you that this is war war but god of justice this is weary work razumov in his chair leaning his head on his hand spoke as if from the bottom of an abyss you believe in god haldin there you go catching at words that are wrung from one what does it matter what was it the englishman said there is a divine soul in things devil take him i don't remember now but he spoke the truth when the day of you thinkers comes don't you forget what's divine in the russian soul and that's resignation respect that in your intellectual restlessness and don't let your arrogant wisdom spoil its message to the world i am speaking to you now like a man with a rope round his neck what do you imagine i am a being in revolt no it's you thinkers who are in everlasting revolt i am one of the resigned when the necessity of this heavy work came to me and i understood that it had to be done what did i do did i exult did i take pride in my purpose did i try to weigh its worth and consequences no i was resigned i thought god's will be done he threw himself full length on razumov's bed and putting the backs of his hands over his eyes remained perfectly motionless and silent not even the sound of his breathing could be heard the dead stillness of the room remained undisturbed till in the darkness razumov said gloomily holden yes answered the other readily quite invisible now on the bed and without the slightest stir isn't it time for me to start yes brother the other was heard lying still in the darkness as though he were talking in his sleep the time has come to put fate to the test he paused then gave a few lucid directions in the quiet impersonal voice of a man in a trance razumov made ready without a word of answer as he was leaving the room the voice on the bed said after him go with god thou silent soul on the landing moving softly razumov locked the door and put the key in his pocket end of part one chapter one recording by expatriate in bangor maine part one chapter two section one of under western eyes by joseph conrad this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter two section one the words and events of that evening must have been graven as if with a steel tool on mr razumov's brain since he was able to write his relation with such fullness and precision a good many months afterwards the record of the thoughts which assailed him in the street is even more minute and abundant they seem to have rushed upon him with a greater freedom because his thinking powers were no longer crushed by haldin's presence the appalling presence of a great crime and the stunning force of a great fanaticism on looking through the pages of mr razumov's diary i own that a rush of thoughts is not an adequate image the more adequate description would be a tumult of thoughts the faithful reflection of the state of his feelings the thoughts in themselves were not numerous they were like the thoughts of most human beings few and simple but they cannot be reproduced here in all their exclamatory repetitions which went on in an endless and weary turmoil for the walk was long if to the western reader they appear shocking inappropriate or even improper 
it must be remembered that as to the first this may be the effect of my crude statement for the rest i will only remark here that this is not a story of the west of europe nations it may be have fashioned their governments but the governments have paid them back in the same coin it is unthinkable that any young englishman should find himself in razumov's situation this being so it would be a vain enterprise to imagine what he would think the only safe surmise to make is that he would not think as mr razumov thought at this crisis of his fate he would not have an hereditary and personal knowledge or the means by which historical autocracy represses ideas guards its power and defends its existence by an act of mental extravagance he might imagine himself arbitrarily thrown into prison but it would never occur to him unless he were delirious and perhaps not even then that he could be beaten with whips as a practical measure either of investigation or of punishment this is but a crude and obvious example of the different conditions of western thought i don't know that this danger occurred specially to mr razumov no doubt it entered unconsciously into the general dread and the general appallingness of this crisis razumov as has been seen was aware of more subtle ways in which an individual may be undone by the proceedings of a despotic government a simple expulsion from the university the very least that could happen to him with an impossibility to continue his studies anywhere was enough to ruin utterly a young man depending entirely upon the development of his natural abilities for his place in the world he was a russian and for him to be implicated meant simply sinking into the lowest social depths amongst the hopeless and the destitute the night birds of the city the peculiar circumstances of razumov's parentage or rather of his lack of parentage should be taken into the account of his thoughts and he remembered them too he had been lately reminded of them in a peculiarly atrocious way by this fatal halden because i haven't that must everything else be taken away from me he thought he nerved himself for another effort to go on along the roadway sledges glided phantom-like and jingling through a fluttering whiteness on the black face of the night for it is a crime he was saying to himself a murder is a murder though of course some sort of liberal institutions a feeling of horrible sickness came over him i must be courageous he exhorted himself mentally all his strength was suddenly gone as if taken out by a hand then by a mighty effort of will it came back because he was afraid of fainting in the street and being picked up by the police with the key of his lodgings in his pocket they would find holden there and then indeed he would be undone strangely enough it was this fear which seems to have kept him up to the end the passers-by were rare they came upon him suddenly looming up black in the snowflakes close by then vanishing all at once without footfalls it was the quarter of the very poor razumov noticed an elderly woman tied up in ragged shawls under the street lamp she seemed a beggar off duty she walked leisurely in the blizzard as though she had no home to hurry to she hugged under one arm a round loaf of black bread with an air of guarding a priceless booty and razumov averting his glance envied her the peace of her mind and the serenity of her fate to one reading mr razumov's narrative it is really a wonder how he managed to keep going as he did along one interminable street after another on pavements that were gradually becoming blocked with snow it was the thought of halden locked up in his rooms and the desperate desire to get rid of his presence which drove him forward no rational determination had any part in his exertions thus when on arriving at the low eating-house he heard that the man of horses zimianitch was not there he could only stare stupidly the waiter a wild-haired youth in tarred boots and a pink shirt exclaimed uncovering his pale gums in a silly grin the zimianitch had got his skinful early in the afternoon and had gone away with a bottle under each arm to keep it up amongst the horses he supposed the owner of the vile den a bony short man in a dirty cloth caftan coming down to his heels stood by his hands tucked into his belt and nodded confirmation the reek of spirits the greasy rancid steam of food got razumov by the throat he struck a table with his clenched hand and shouted violently you lie bleary unwashed faces were turned to his direction a mild-eyed ragged tramp drinking tea at the next table moved farther away a murmur of wonder arose with an undertone of uneasiness a laugh was heard too and an exclamation there there jeeringly soothing the waiter looked all round and announced to the room 
the gentleman won't believe that zemianitch is drunk from a distant corner a hoarse voice belonging to a horrible nondescript shaggy being with a black face like the muzzle of a bear grunted angrily the cursed driver of thieves what do we want with his gentleman here we are all honest folk in this place razumov biting his lip till blood came to keep himself from bursting into imprecations followed the owner of the den who whispering come along little father led him into a tiny hole of a place behind the wooden counter whence proceeded a sound of splashing a wet and bedraggled creature a sort of sexless and shivering scarecrow washed glasses in there bending over a wooden tub by the light of a tallow dip yes little father the man in the long caftan said plaintively he had a brown cunning little face a thin greyish beard trying to light a tin lantern he hugged it to his breast and talked garrulously the while he would show zemianitch to the gentleman to prove there were no lies told and he would show him drunk his woman it seems ran away from him last night such a hag she was thin Phew! he spat they were always running away from that driver of the devil and he sixty years old too could never get used to it but each heart knows sorrow after its own kind and zemianitch was a born fool all his days and then he would fly to the bottle who could bear life in our land without the bottle he says a proper russian man the little pig be pleased to follow me razumov crossed a quadrangle of deep snow enclosed between high walls with innumerable windows here and there a dim yellow light hung within the four-square mass of darkness the house was an enormous slum a hive of human vermin a monumental abode of misery towering on the verge of starvation and despair in a corner the ground sloped sharply down and razumov followed the light of the lantern through a small doorway into a long cavernous place like a neglected subterranean byre deep within three shaggy little horses tied up to rings hung their heads together motionless and shadowy in the dim light of the lantern it must have been the famous team of haldin's escape razumov peered fearfully into the gloom his guide pawed in the straw with his foot here he is ah the little pigeon a true russian man no heavy hearts for me he says bring out the bottle and take your ugly mug out of my sight ha 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 that's a fellow he is he held the lantern over a prone form of a man apparently fully dressed for outdoors his head was lost in a pointed cloth hood on the other side of a heap of straw protruded a pair of feet in monstrous thick boots always ready to drive commented the keeper of the eating-house a proper russian driver that saint or devil night or day is all one to zemianitch when his heart is free from sorrow i don't ask who you are but where you want to go he says he would drive satan himself to his own abode and come back chirruping to his horses many a one he has driven who is clanking his chains in the nerchink's mines by this time razumov shuddered call him wake him up he faltered out the other set down his light stepped back and launched a kick at the prostrate sleeper the man shook at the impact but did not move at the third kick he grunted but remained inert as before the eating-house keeper desisted and fetched a deep sigh you see for yourself how it is we have done what we can for you he picked up the lantern the intense black spokes of shadows swung about in the circle of light a terrible fury the blind rage of self-preservation possessed razumov ah the vile beast he bellowed out in an unearthly tone which made the lantern jump and tremble i shall wake you give me give me he looked round wildly seized the handle of a stable fork and rushing forward struck at the prostrate body with inarticulate cries after a time his cries ceased and the rain of blows fell in the stillness and shadows of the cellar-like stable razumov belaboured zemianitch with an insatiable fury in great volleys of sounding thwacks except for the violent movements of razumov nothing stirred neither the beaten man nor the spoke-like shadows on the walls and only the sound of blows was heard it was a weird scene suddenly there was a sharp crack the stick broke and half of it flew far away into the gloom beyond the light at the same time zemianitch sat up at this razumov became as motionless as the man with the lantern only his breast heaved for air as if ready to burst some dull sensation of pain must have penetrated at last the consoling night of drunkenness enwrapping the bright russian soul of haldin's enthusiastic praise 
but Zemianitch evidently saw nothing his eyeballs blinked all white in the light once twice then the gleam went out for a moment he sat in the straw with closed eyes with a strange air of weary meditation then fell over slowly on his side without making the slightest sound only the straw rustled a little razumov stared wildly fighting for his breath after a second or two he heard a light snore he flung from him the piece of stick remaining in his grasp and went off with great hasty strides without looking back once after going heedlessly for some fifty yards along the street he walked into a snowdrift and was up to his knees before he stopped this recalled him to himself and glancing about he discovered he had been going in the wrong direction he retraced his steps but now at a more moderate pace when passing before the house he had just left he flourished his fist at the sombre refuge of misery and crime rearing its sinister bulk on the white ground it had an air of brooding he let his arm fall by his side discouraged zemianitch's passionate surrender to sorrow and consolation had baffled him that was the people a true russian man razumov was glad he had beaten that brute the bright soul of the other here they were the people and the enthusiasts between the two he was done for between the drunkenness of the peasant incapable of action and the dream intoxication of the idealist incapable of perceiving the reason of things and the true character of men it was a sort of terrible childishness the children had their masters ah the stick the stick the stern hand thought razumov longing for power to hurt and destroy he was glad he had thrashed that brute the physical exertion had left his body in a comfortable glow his mental agitation too was clarified as if all the feverishness had gone out of him in a fit of outward violence together with the persisting sense of terrible danger he was conscious now of a tranquil unquenchable hate he walked slower and slower and indeed considering the guest he had in his rooms it was no wonder he lingered on the way it was like harbouring a pestilential disease that would not perhaps take your life but would take from you all that made life worth living a subtle pest that would convert earth into a hell what was he doing now lying on the bed as if dead with the back of his hands over his eyes razumov had a morbidly vivid vision of holden on his bed the white pillow hollowed by the head the legs and long boots the upturned feet and in his abhorrence he said to himself i'll kill him when i get home but he knew very well that that was of no use the corpse hanging round his neck would be nearly as fatal as the living man nothing short of complete annihilation would do and that was impossible what then must one kill oneself to escape this visitation razumov's despair was too profoundly tinged with hate to accept that issue and yet it was despair nothing less at the thought of having to live with holden for an indefinite number of days in mortal alarm at every sound but perhaps when he heard that this bright soul of zemianitch suffered from a drunken eclipse the fellow would take his infernal resignation somewhere else and that was not likely on the face of it razumov thought i am being crushed and i can't even run away other men had somewhere a corner of the earth some little house in the provinces where they had a right to take their troubles a material refuge he had nothing he had not even a moral refuge the refuge of confidence to whom could he go with this tale in all this great great land razumov stamped his foot and under the soft carpet of snow felt the hard ground of russia inanimate cold inert like a sullen and tragic mother hiding her face under a winding sheet his native soil his very own without a fireside without a heart he cast his eyes upwards and stood amazed the snow had ceased to fall and now as if by a miracle he saw above his head the clear black sky of the northern winter decorated with the sumptuous fires of the stars it was a canopy fit for the resplendent purity of the snows razumov received an almost physical impression of endless space and of countless millions he responded to it with the readiness of a russian who was born to an inheritance of space and numbers under the sumptuous immensity of the sky the snow covered the endless forests the frozen rivers the plains of an immense country obliterating the landmarks the accidents of the ground levelling everything under its uniform whiteness like a monstrous blank page awaiting the record of an inconceivable history it covered the passive land with its lives of countless people like zemianitch and its handful of agitators like this halden murdering foolishly 
it was a sort of sacred inertia razumov felt a respect for it a voice seemed to cry within him don't touch it it was a guarantee of duration of safety while the travail of maturing destiny went on a work not of revolutions with their passionate levity of action and their shifting impulses but of peace what it needed was not the conflicting aspirations of a people but a will strong and one it wanted not the babble of many voices but a man strong and one razumov stood on the point of conversion he was fascinated by its approach by its overpowering logic for a train of thought is never false the falsehood lies deep in the necessities of existence in secret fears and half-formed ambitions in the secret confidence combined with the secret mistrust of ourselves in the love of hope and the dread of uncertain days in russia the land of spectral ideas and disembodied aspirations many brave minds have turned away at last from the vain and endless conflict to the one great historical fact of the land they turn to autocracy for the peace of their patriotic conscience as a weary unbeliever touched by grace turns to the faith of his fathers for the blessing of spiritual rest like other russians before him razumov in conflict with himself felt the touch of grace upon his forehead holden means disruption he thought to himself beginning to walk again what is he with his indignation with his talk of bondage with his talk of god's justice all that means disruption better that thousands should suffer than that a people should become a disintegrated mass helpless like dust in the wind obscurantism is better than the light of incendiary torches the seed germinates in the night out of the dark soil springs the perfect plant but a volcanic eruption is sterile the ruin of the fertile ground and am i who love my country who have nothing but that to love and put my faith in am i to have my future perhaps my usefulness ruined by the sanguinary fanatic the grace entered into razumov he believed now in the man who would come at the appointed time what is a throne a few pieces of wood upholstered in velvet but a throne is a seat of power too the form of government is the shape of a tool an instrument but twenty thousand bladders inflated by the noblest sentiments and jostling against each other in the air are a miserable encumbrance of space holding no power possessing no will having nothing to give he went on thus heedless of the way holding a discourse with himself with extraordinary abundance and facility generally his phrases came to him slowly after a conscious and painstaking wooing some superior power had inspired him with a flow of masterly argument as certain converted sinners became overwhelmingly loquacious he felt an austere exultation what are the luridly smoky lucubrations of that fellow to the clear grasp of my intellect he thought is not this my country have i not got forty million brothers he asked himself unanswerably victorious in the silence of his breast and the fearful thrashing he had given the inanimate zemianitch seemed to him a sign of intimate union a pathetically severe necessity of brotherly love no if i must suffer let me at least suffer for my convictions not for a crime my reason my cool superior reason rejects he ceased to think for a moment the silence in his breast was complete but he felt a suspicious uneasiness such as we may experience when we enter an unlighted strange place the irrational feeling that something may jump upon us in the dark the absurd dread of the unseen of course he was far from being a moss-grown reactionary everything was not for the best despotic bureaucracy abuses corruption and so on capable men were wanted enlightened intelligences devoted hearts but absolute power should be preserved the tool ready for the man for the great autocrat of the future razumov believed in him the logic of history made him unavoidable the state of the people demanded him what else he asked himself ardently could move all that mass in one direction nothing could nothing but a single will he was persuaded that he was sacrificing his personal longings of liberalism rejecting the attractive error for the stern russian truth that's patriotism he observed mentally and added there's no stopping midway on that road and then remarked to himself i am not a coward and again there was a dead silence in razumov's breast he walked with lowered head making room for no one he walked slowly and his thoughts returning spoke within him with solemn slowness what is this holden and what am i only two grains of sand 
but a great mountain is made up of just such insignificant grains and the death of a man or of many men is an insignificant thing yet we combat a contagious pestilence do i want his death no i would save him if i could but no one can do that he is the withered member which must be cut off if i must perish through him let me at least not perish with him and associated against my will with his sombre folly that understands nothing either of men or things why should i leave a false memory it passed through his mind that there was no one in the world who cared what sort of memory he left behind him he exclaimed to himself instantly perish vainly for a falsehood what a miserable fate he was now in a more animated part of the town he did not remark the crash of two colliding sledges close to the curb the driver of one bellowed tearfully at his fellow oh thou vile wretch this hoarse yell let out nearly in his ear disturbed razumov he shook his head impatiently and went on looking straight before him suddenly on the snow stretched on his back right across his path he saw haldin solid distinct real with his inverted hands over his eyes clad in a brown close-fitting coat and long boots he was lying out of the way a little as though he had selected that place on purpose the snow round him was untrodden this hallucination had such a solidity of aspect that the first movement of razumov was to reach for his pocket to assure himself that the key of his rooms was there but he checked the impulse with a disdainful curve of his lips he understood his thought concentrated intensely on the figure left lying on his bed had culminated in this extraordinary illusion of the sight razumov tackled the phenomenon calmly with a stern face without a check and gazing far beyond the vision he walked on experiencing nothing but a slight tightening of the chest after passing he turned his head for a glance and saw only the unbroken track of his footsteps over the place where the breast of the phantom had been lying razumov walked on and after a little time whispered his wonder to himself exactly as if alive seemed to breathe and right in my way too i have had an extraordinary experience he made a few steps and muttered through his set teeth i shall give him up then for some twenty yards or more all was blank he wrapped his cloak closer round him he pulled his cap well forward over his eyes betray a great word what is betrayal they talk of a man betraying his country his friends his sweetheart there must be a moral bond first all a man can betray is his conscience and how is my conscience engaged here by what bond of common faith of common conviction am i obliged to let that fanatical idiot drag me down with him on the contrary every obligation of true courage is the other way razumov looked round from under his cap what can the prejudice of the world reproach me with have i provoked his confidence no have i by a single word look or gesture given him reason to suppose that i accepted his trust in me no it is true that i consented to go and see his zemianitch well i have been to see him and i broke a stick on his back too the brute something seemed to turn over in his head bringing uppermost a singularly hard clear facet of his brain it would be better however he reflected with a quite different mental accent to keep that circumstance altogether to myself he had passed beyond the turn leading to his lodgings and had reached a wide and fashionable street some shops were still open and all the restaurants lights fell on the pavement where men in expensive fur coats with here and there the elegant figure of a woman walked with an air of leisure razumov looked at them with the contempt of an austere believer for the frivolous crowd it was the world those officers dignitaries men of fashion officials members of the yacht club the event of the morning affected them all what would they say if they knew what this student in a cloak was going to do not one of them is capable of feeling and thinking as deeply as i can how many of them could accomplish an act of conscience razumov lingered in the well-lighted street he was firmly decided indeed it could hardly be called a decision he had simply discovered what he had meant to do all along and yet he felt the need of some other mind's sanction end of chapter two section one recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter two section two of under western eyes by joseph conrad this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine 
chapter two section two with something resembling anguish he said to himself i want to be understood the universal aspiration with all its profound and melancholy meaning assailed heavily razumov who amongst eighty millions of his kith and kin had no heart to which he could open himself the attorney was not to be thought of he despised the little agent of chicane too much one could not go and lay one's conscience before the policeman at the corner neither was razumov anxious to go to the chief of his district's police a common-looking person whom he used to see sometimes in the street in a shabby uniform and with a smouldering cigarette stuck to his lower lip he would begin by locking me up most probably at any rate he is certain to get excited and create an awful commotion thought razumov practically an act of conscience must be done with outward dignity razumov longed desperately for a word of advice for moral support who knows what true loneliness is not the conventional word but the naked terror to the lonely themselves it wears a mask the most miserable outcast hugs some memory or some illusion now and then a fatal conjunction of events may lift the veil for an instant for an instant only no human being could bear a steady view of moral solitude without going mad razumov had reached that point of vision to escape from it he embraced for a whole minute the delirious purpose of rushing to his lodgings and flinging himself on his knees by the side of the bed with the dark figure stretched on it to pour out a full confession in passionate words that would stir the whole being of that man to its innermost depth that would end in embraces and tears in an incredible fellowship of souls such as the world had never seen it was sublime inwardly he wept and trembled already but to the casual eyes that were cast upon him he was aware that he appeared as a tranquil student in a cloak out for a leisurely stroll he noted too the sidelong brilliant glance of a pretty woman with a delicate head and covered in the hairy skins of wild beasts down to her feet like a frail and beautiful savage which rested for a moment with a sort of mocking tenderness on the deep abstraction of that good-looking young man suddenly razumov stood still the glimpse of a passing grey whisker caught and lost in the same instant had evoked the complete image of prince k the man who once had pressed his hand as no other man had pressed it a faint but lingering pressure like a secret sign like a half unwilling caress and razumov marvelled at himself why did he not think of him before a senator a dignitary a great personage the very man he a strange softening emotion came over razumov made his knees shake a little he repressed it with a newborn austerity all that sentiment was pernicious nonsense he couldn't be quick enough and when he got into a sledge he shouted to the driver to the k palace get on you fly the startled moujik bearded up to the very whites of his eyes answered obsequiously i hear your high nobility it was lucky for razumov that prince k was not a man of timid character on the day of mr de p s murder an extreme alarm and despondency prevailed in the high official spheres prince k sitting sadly alone in his study was told by his alarmed servants that a mysterious young man had forced his way into the hall refused to tell his name and the nature of his business and would not move from there till he had seen his excellency in private instead of locking himself up and telephoning for the police as nine out of ten high personages would have done that evening the prince gave way to curiosity and came quietly to the door of his study in the hall the front door standing wide open he recognized at once razumov pale as death his eyes blazing and surrounded by perplexed lackeys the prince was vexed beyond measure and even indignant but his humane instincts and a subtle sense of self-respect could not allow him to let this young man be thrown out into the street by base menials he retreated unseen into his room and after a little rang his bell razumov heard in the hall an ominously raised harsh voice saying somewhere far away show the gentleman in here razumov walked in without a tremor he felt himself invulnerable raised far above the shallowness of common judgment though he saw the prince looking at him with black displeasure the lucidity of his mind of which he was very conscious 
gave him an extraordinary assurance he was not asked to sit down half an hour later they appeared in the hall together the lackeys stood up and the prince moving with difficulty on his gouty feet was helped into his furs the carriage had been ordered before when the great double door was flung open with a crash razumov who had been standing silent with a lost gaze but with every faculty intensely on the alert heard the prince's voice your arm young man the mobile superficial mind of the ex-guards officer man of showy missions experienced in nothing but the arts of gallant intrigue and worldly success had been equally impressed by the more obvious difficulties of such a situation and by razumov's quiet dignity in stating them he had said no upon the whole i can't condemn the step you venture to take by coming to me with your story it is not an affair for police understrappers the greatest importance is attached to set your mind at rest i shall see you through this most extraordinary and difficult situation then the prince rose to ring the bell and razumov making a short bow had said with deference i have trusted my instinct a young man having no claim upon anybody in the world has in an hour of trial involving his deepest political convictions turned to an illustrious russian that's all the prince had exclaimed hastily you have done well in the carriage it was a small brougham on sleigh runners razumov broke the silence in a voice that trembled slightly my gratitude surpasses the greatness of my presumption he gasped feeling unexpectedly in the dark a momentary pressure on his arm you have done well repeated the prince when the carriage stopped the prince murmured to razumov who had never ventured a single question the house of general t in the middle of the snow-covered roadway blazed a great bonfire some cossacks the bridles of their horses over the arm were warming themselves around two sentries stood at the door several gendarmes lounged under the great carriage gateway and on the first floor landing two orderlies rose and stood at attention razumov walked at the prince's elbow a surprising quantity of hothouse plants in pots cumbered the floor of the anteroom servants came forward a young man in civilian clothes arrived hurriedly was whispered to bowed low and exclaiming zealously certainly this minute fled within somewhere the prince signed to razumov they passed through a suite of reception rooms all barely lit and one of them prepared for dancing the wife of the general had put off her party an atmosphere of consternation pervaded the place but the general's own room with heavy sombre hangings two massive desks and deep armchairs had all the lights turned on the footman shut the door behind them and they waited there was a coal fire in an english grate razumov had never before seen such a fire and the silence of the room was like the silence of the grave perfect measureless for even the clock on the mantelpiece made no sound filling a corner on a black pedestal stood a quarter life-size smooth-limbed bronze of an adolescent figure running the prince observed in an undertone spontini's flight of youth exquisite admirable assented razumov faintly they said nothing more after this the prince silent with his grand air razumov staring at the statue he was worried by a sensation resembling the gnawing of hunger he did not turn when he heard an inner door fly open and a quick footstep muffled on the carpet the prince's voice immediately exclaimed thick with excitement we have got him ce miserable a worthy young man came to me no it's incredible razumov held his breath before the bronze as if expecting a crash behind his back a voice he had never heard before insisted politely asseyez vous donc the prince almost shrieked mais comprenez-vous mon cher l'assassin the murderer we have got him razumov spun round the general's smooth big cheeks rested on the stiff collar of his uniform he must have been already looking at razumov because that last saw the pale blue eyes fastened on him coldly the prince from a chair waved an impressive hand this is a most honourable young man whom providence itself mr razumov the general acknowledged the introduction by frowning at razumov who did not make the slightest movement sitting down before his desk the general listened with compressed lips it was impossible to detect any sign of emotion on his face 
razumov watched the immobility of the fleshy profile but it lasted only a moment till the prince had finished and when the general turned to the providential young man his florid complexion the blue unbelieving eyes and the bright white flash of an automatic smile had an air of jovial careless cruelty he expressed no wonder at the extraordinary story no pleasure or excitement no incredulity either he betrayed no sentiment whatever only with a politeness almost deferential suggested that the bird might have flown while mr mr razumov was running about the streets razumov advanced to the middle of the room and said the door is locked and i had the key in my pocket his loathing for the man was intense it had come upon him so unawares that he felt he had not kept it out of his voice the general looked up at him thoughtfully and razumov grinned all this went over the head of prince k seated in a deep armchair very tired and impatient a student called haldin said the general thoughtfully razumov ceased to grin that is his name he said unnecessarily loud victor victorovitch haldin a student the general shifted his position a little how is he dressed would you have the goodness to tell me razumov angrily described haldin's clothing in a few jerky words the general stared all the time then addressing the prince we were not without some indications he said in french a good woman who was in the street described to us somebody wearing a dress of the sort as the thrower of the second bomb we have detained her at the secretariat and every one in a cherkess coat we could lay our hands on has been brought to her to look at she kept on crossing herself and shaking her head at them it was exasperating he turned to razumov and in russian with friendly reproach take a chair mr razumov do why are you standing razumov sat down carelessly and looked at the general this goggle-eyed imbecile understands nothing he thought the prince began to speak loftily mr razumov is a young man of conspicuous abilities i have it at heart that his future should not certainly interrupted the general with a movement of the hand has he any weapons on him do you think mr razumov the general employed a gentle musical voice razumov answered with suppressed irritation no but my razors are lying about you understand the general lowered his head approvingly precisely then to the prince explaining courteously we want that bird alive it will be the devil if we can't make him sing a little before we are done with him the grave-like silence of the room with its mute clock fell upon the polite modulations of this terrible phrase the prince hidden in the chair made no sound the general unexpectedly developed a thought fidelity to menaced institutions on which depend the safety of a throne and of a people is no child's play we know that mon prince and tenez he went on with a sort of flattering harshness mr razumov here begins to understand that too his eyes which he turned upon razumov seemed to be starting out of his head this grotesqueness of aspect no longer shocked razumov he said with gloomy conviction haldin will never speak that remains to be seen muttered the general i am certain insisted razumov a man like this never speaks do you imagine that i am here from fear he added violently he felt ready to stand by his opinion of haldin to the last extremity certainly not protested the general with great simplicity of tone and i don't mind telling you mr razumov that if he had not come with his tail to such a staunch and loyal russian as you he would have disappeared like a stone in the water which would have had a detestable effect he added with a bright cruel smile under his stony stare so you see there can be no suspicion of any fear here the prince intervened looking at razumov round the back of the armchair nobody doubts the moral soundness of your action be at ease in that respect pray he turned to the general uneasily that's why i am here you may be surprised why i should the general hastened to interrupt not at all extremely natural you saw the importance yes broke in the prince and i venture to ask insistently that mine and mr razumov's intervention should not become public he is a young man of promise of remarkable aptitudes i haven't a doubt of it murmured the general he inspires confidence all sorts of pernicious views are so widespread nowadays they taint such unexpected quarters that monstrous as it seems he might suffer his studies his 
the general with his elbows on the desk took his head between his hands yes yes i am thinking it out how long is it since you left him at your rooms mr razumov razumov mentioned the hour which nearly corresponded with the time of his distracted flight from the big slum house he had made up his mind to keep zimianitch out of the affair completely to mention him at all would mean imprisonment for the bright soul perhaps cruel floggings and in the end a journey to siberia in chains razumov who had beaten zimianitch felt for him now a vague remorseful tenderness the general giving way for the first time to his secret sentiments exclaimed contemptuously and you say he came in to make you this confidence like this for nothing apropos de bot razumov felt danger in the air the merciless suspicion of despotism had spoken openly at last sudden fear sealed razumov's lips the silence of the room resembled now the silence of a deep dungeon where time does not count and a suspect person is sometimes forgotten for ever but the prince came to the rescue providence itself has led the wretch in a moment of mental aberration to seek mr razumov on the strength of some old utterly misinterpreted exchange of ideas some sort of idle speculative conversation months ago i am told and completely forgotten till now by mr razumov mr razumov queried the general meditatively after a short silence do you often indulge in speculative conversation no excellency answered razumov coolly in a sudden access of self-confidence i am a man of deep convictions crude opinions are in the air they are not always worth combating but even the silent contempt of a serious mind may be misinterpreted by headlong utopists the general stared from between his hands prince k murmured a serious young man en esprit superieur i see that mon cher prince said the general mr razumov is quite safe with me i am interested in him he has it seems the great and useful quality of inspiring confidence what i was wondering at is why the other should mention anything at all i mean even the bare fact alone if his object was only to obtain temporary shelter for a few hours for after all nothing was easier than to say nothing about it unless indeed he were trying under a crazy misapprehension of your true sentiments to enlist your assistance eh mr razumov it seemed to razumov that the floor was moving slightly this grotesque man in a tight uniform was terrible it was right that he should be terrible i can see what your excellency has in your mind but i can only answer that i don't know why i have nothing in my mind murmured the general with gentle surprise i am his prey his helpless prey thought razumov the fatigues and the disgusts of that afternoon the need to forget the fear which he could not keep off reawakened his hate for haldin then i can't help your excellency i don't know what he meant i only know there was a moment when i wished to kill him there was also a moment when i wished myself dead i said nothing i was overcome i provoked no confidence i asked for no explanations razumov seemed beside himself but his mind was lucid it was really a calculated outburst it is rather a pity the general said that you did not don't you know at all what he means to do razumov calmed down and saw an opening there he told me he was in hopes that a sledge would meet him about half an hour after midnight at the seventh lamp-post on the left from the upper end of karabelnaya at any rate he meant to be there at that time he did not even ask me for a change of clothes ah voila said the general turning to prince k with an air of satisfaction there is a way to keep your protege mr razumov quite clear of any connection with the actual arrest we shall be ready for that gentleman in karabelnaya the prince expressed his gratitude there was real emotion in his voice razumov motionless silent sat staring at the carpet the general turned to him half an hour after midnight till then we have to depend on you mr razumov you don't think he is likely to change his purpose how can i tell said razumov those men are not of the sort that ever changes its purpose what men do you mean fanatical lovers of liberty in general liberty with a capital l excellency liberty that means nothing precise liberty in whose name crimes are committed the general murmured 
I detest rebels of every kind. I can't help it. It's my nature. He clenched a fist and shook it, drawing back his arm. They shall be destroyed then. They have made a sacrifice of their lives beforehand, said Razumov, with malicious pleasure and looking the general straight in the face. If Haldin does change his purpose tonight, you may depend on it that it will not be to save his life by flight in some other way. He would have thought then of something else to attempt, but that is not likely. The general repeated as if to himself, they shall be destroyed. Razumov assumed an impenetrable expression. The prince exclaimed, what a terrible necessity. The general's arm was lowered slowly. One comfort there is. That brood leaves no posterity. I've always said it, one effort, pitiless, persistent, steady, and we are done with them forever. Razumov thought to himself that this man entrusted with so much arbitrary power must have believed what he said or else he could not have gone on bearing the responsibility i detest rebels these subversive minds these intellectual debauches my existence has been built on fidelity it's a feeling to defend it i am ready to lay down my life and even my honour if that were needed but pray tell me what honour can there be as against rebels against people that deny god himself perfect unbelievers brutes it is horrible to think of during this tirade razumov facing the general had nodded slightly twice prince k standing on one side with his grand air murmured casting up his eyes Elas. then lowering his glance and with great decision declared this young man general is perfectly fit to apprehend the bearing of your memorable words the general's whole expression changed from dull resentment to perfect urbanity i would ask now mr razumov he said to return to his home note that i don't ask mr razumov whether he has justified his absence to his guests no doubt he did this sufficiently but i don't ask mr razumov inspires confidence it is a great gift i only suggest that a more prolonged absence might awaken the criminal's suspicions and induce him perhaps to change his plans he rose and with a scrupulous courtesy escorted his visitors to the anteroom encumbered with flower pots end of chapter two section two recording by expatriate in bangor maine part one chapter two section three of under western eyes by joseph conrad this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter two section three razumov parted with the prince at the corner of a street in the carriage he had listened to speeches where natural sentiment struggled with caution evidently the prince was afraid of encouraging any hopes of future intercourse but there was a touch of tenderness in the voice uttering in the dark the guarded general phrases of goodwill and the prince too said i have perfect confidence in you mr razumov they all it seems have confidence in me thought razumov dully he had an indulgent contempt for the man sitting shoulder to shoulder with him in the confined space probably he was afraid of scenes with his wife she was said to be proud and violent it seemed to him bizarre that secrecy should play such a large part in the comfort and safety of lives but he wanted to put the prince's mind at ease and with a proper amount of emphasis he said that being conscious of some small abilities and confident in his power of work he trusted his future to his own exertions he expressed his gratitude for the helping hand such dangerous situations did not occur twice in the course of one life he added and you have met this one with a firmness of mind and correctness of feeling which give me a high idea of your worth the prince said solemnly you have now only to persevere to persevere on getting out on the pavement razumov saw an ungloved hand extended to him through the lowered window of the brougham it detained his own in its grasp for a moment while the light of a street lamp fell upon the prince's long face and old-fashioned grey whiskers i hope you are perfectly reassured now as to the consequences after what your excellency has condescended to do for me i can only rely on my conscience adieu said the whiskered head with feeling razumov bowed the brougham glided away with a slight swish in the snow he was alone on the edge of the pavement he said to himself that there was nothing to think about and began walking towards his home he walked quietly 
it was a common experience to walk thus home to bed after an evening spent somewhere with his fellows or in the cheaper seats of a theatre after he had gone a little way the familiarity of things got hold of him nothing was changed there was the familiar corner and when he turned it he saw the familiar dim light of the provision shop kept by a german woman there were loaves of stale bread bunches of onions and strings of sausages behind the small window panes they were closing it the sickly lame fellow whom he knew so well by sight staggered out into the snow embracing a large shutter nothing would change there was the familiar gateway yawning black with feeble glimmers marking the arches of the different staircases the sense of life's continuity depended on trifling bodily impressions the trivialities of daily existence were an armour for the soul and this thought reinforced the inward quietness of razumov as he began to climb the stairs familiar to his feet in the dark with his hand on the familiar clammy banister the exceptional could not prevail against the material contacts which make one day resemble another to-morrow would be like yesterday it was only on the stage that the unusual was outwardly acknowledged i suppose thought razumov that if i had made up my mind to blow out my brains on the landing i would be going up these stairs as quietly as i am doing it now what's a man to do what must be must be extraordinary things do happen but when they have happened they are done with thus too when the mind is made up that question is done with and the daily concerns the familiarities of our thought swallow it up and the life goes on as before with its mysterious and secret sides quite out of sight as they should be life is a public thing razumov unlocked his door and took the key out entered very quietly and bolted the door behind him carefully he thought he hears me and after bolting the door he stood still holding his breath there was not a sound he crossed the bare outer room stepping deliberately in the darkness entering the other he felt all over his table for the matchbox the silence but for the groping of his hand was profound could the fellow be sleeping so soundly he struck a light and looked at the bed holden was lying on his back as before only both his hands were under his head his eyes were open he stared at the ceiling razumov held the match up he saw the clear-cut features the firm chin the white forehead and the topknot of fair hair against the white pillow there he was lying flat on his back razumov thought suddenly i have walked over his chest he continued to stare till the match burnt itself out then struck another and lit the lamp in silence without looking towards the bed any more he had turned his back on it and was hanging his coat on a peg when he heard holden sigh profoundly then ask in a tired voice well and what have you arranged the emotion was so great that razumov was glad to put his hands against the wall a diabolical impulse to say i have given you up to the police frightened him exceedingly but he did not say that he said without turning round in a muffled voice it's done again he heard holden sigh he walked to the table sat down with the lamp before him and only then looked towards the bed in the distant corner of the large room far away from the lamp which was small and provided with a very thick china shade holden appeared like a dark and elongated shape rigid with the immobility of death this body seemed to have less substance than its own phantom walked over by razumov in the street white with snow it was more alarming in its shadowy persistent reality than the distinct but vanishing illusion holden was heard again you must have had a walk such a walk he murmured deprecatingly this weather razumov answered with energy horrible walk a nightmare of a walk he shuddered audibly holden sighed once more then and so you have seen zimianitch brother i've seen him razumov remembering the time he had spent with the prince thought it prudent to add i had to wait some time a character eh it's extraordinary what a sense of the necessity of freedom there is in that man and he has sayings too simple to the point such as only the people can invent in their rough sagacity a character that i you understand haven't had much opportunity razumov muttered through his teeth holden continued to stare at the ceiling you see brother i have been a good deal in that house of late i used to take their books leaflets not a few of the poor people who live there can read and you see the guest for the feast of freedom must be sought for in byways and hedges the truth is i have almost lived in that house of late i slept sometimes in the stable there is a stable 
that's where i had my interview with ziemianitch interrupted razumov gently a mocking spirit entered into him and he added it was satisfactory in a sense i came away from it much relieved ah he's a fellow went on haldin talking slowly at the ceiling i came to know him in that way you see for some weeks now ever since i resigned myself to do what had to be done i tried to isolate myself i gave up my rooms what was the good of exposing a decent widow woman to the risk of being worried out of her mind by the police i gave up seeing any of our comrades razumov drew to himself a half sheet of paper and began to trace lines on it with a pencil upon my word he thought angrily he seems to have thought of everybody's safety but mine haldin was talking on this morning ah this morning that was different how can i explain it to you before the deed was done i wandered at night and lay hid in the day thinking it out and i felt restful sleepless but restful what was there for me to torment myself about but this morning after then it was that i became restless i could not have stopped in that big house full of misery the miserable of this world can't give you peace then when that silly caretaker began to shout i said to myself there is a young man in this town head and shoulders above common prejudices is he laughing at me razumov asked himself going on with his aimless drawing of triangles and squares and suddenly he thought my behaviour must appear to him strange should he take fright at my manner and rush off somewhere i shall be undone completely that infernal general he dropped the pencil and turned abruptly towards the bed with a shadowy figure extended full length on it so much more indistinct than the one over whose breast he had walked without faltering was this too a phantom the silence had lasted a long time he is no longer here was the thought against which razumov struggled desperately quite frightened at its absurdity he is already gone and this only he could resist no longer he sprang to his feet saying aloud i am intolerably anxious and in a few headlong strides stood by the side of the bed his hand fell lightly on holden's shoulder and directly he felt its reality he was beset by an insane temptation to grip that exposed throat and squeeze the breath out of that body lest it should escape his custody leaving only a phantom behind holden did not stir a limb but his overshadowed eyes moving a little gazed upwards at razumov with wistful gratitude for this manifestation of feeling razumov turned away and strode up and down the room it would have been possibly a kindness he muttered to himself and was appalled by the nature of that apology for a murderous intention his mind had found somewhere within him and all the same he could not give it up he became lucid about it what can he expect he thought the halter in the end and i this argument was interrupted by holden's voice why be anxious for me they can kill my body but they cannot exile my soul from this world i tell you what i believe in this world so much that i cannot conceive eternity otherwise than as a very long life that is perhaps the reason i am so ready to die hm, muttered razumov and biting his lower lip he continued to walk up and down and to carry on his strange argument yes to a man in such a situation of course it would be an act of kindness the question however was not how to be kind but how to be firm he was a slippery customer i too victor victorovitch believe in this world of ours he said with force i too while i live but you seem determined to haunt it you can't seriously mean the voice of the motionless halden began haunt it truly the oppressors of thought which quickens the world the destroyers of souls which aspire to perfection of human dignity they shall be haunted as to the destroyers of my mere body i have forgiven them beforehand razumov had stopped apparently to listen but at the same time he was observing his own sensations he was vexed with himself for attaching so much importance to what haldin said the fellow's mad he thought firmly but this opinion did not mollify him towards haldin it was a particularly impudent form of lunacy and when it got loose in the sphere of public life of a country it was obviously the duty of every good citizen this train of thought broke off short there and was succeeded by a paroxysm of silent hatred towards haldin so intense that razumov hastened to speak at random yes eternity of course i too can't very well represent it to myself i imagine it however as something quiet and dull there would be nothing unexpected don't you see the element of time would be wanting he pulled out his watch and gazed at it haldin turned over on his side and looked on intently 
razumov got frightened at this movement a slippery customer this fellow with a phantom it was not midnight yet he hastened on and unfathomable mysteries can you conceive secret places in eternity impossible whereas life is full of them there are secrets of birth for instance one carries them on to the grave there is something comical but never mind and there are secret motives of conduct a man's most open actions have a secret side to them that is interesting and so unfathomable for instance a man goes out of a room for a walk nothing more trivial in appearance and yet it may be momentous he comes back he has seen perhaps a drunken brute taken particular notice of the snow on the ground and behold he is no longer the same man the most unlikely things have a secret power over one's thoughts the grey whiskers of a particular person the goggle eyes of another razumov's forehead was moist he took a turn or two in the room his head low and smiling to himself viciously have you ever reflected on the power of goggle eyes and grey whiskers excuse me you seem to think i must be crazy to talk in this vein at such a time but i am not talking lightly i have seen instances it has happened to me once to be talking to a man whose fate was affected by physical facts of that kind and the man did not know it of course it was a case of conscience but the material facts such as these brought about the solution and you tell me victor victorovitch not to be anxious why i am responsible for you razumov almost shrieked he avoided with difficulty a burst of mephistophelian laughter holden very pale raised himself on his elbow and the surprises of life went on razumov after glancing at the other uneasily just consider their astonishing nature a mysterious impulse induces you to come here i don't say you have done wrong indeed from a certain point of view you could not have done better you might have gone to a man with affections and family ties you have such ties yourself as to me you know i have been brought up in an educational institute where they did not give us enough to eat to talk of affection in such a connection you perceive yourself as to ties the only ties i have in the world are social i must get acknowledged in some way before i can act at all i sit here working and don't you think i am working for progress too i've got to find my own ideas of the true way pardon me continued razumov after drawing breath and with a short throaty laugh but i haven't inherited a revolutionary inspiration together with a resemblance from an uncle he looked again at his watch and noticed with sickening disgust that there were yet a good many minutes to midnight he tore watch and chain off his waistcoat and laid them on the table well in the circle of bright lamplight holden reclining on his elbow did not stir razumov was made uneasy by this attitude what move is he meditating over so quietly he thought he must be prevented i must keep on talking to him he raised his voice you are a son a brother or nephew a cousin i don't know what to no end of people i am just a man here i stand before you a man with a mind did it ever occur to you how a man who had never heard a word of warm affection or praise in his life would think on matters on which you would think first with or against your class your domestic tradition your fireside prejudices did you ever consider how a man like that would feel i have no domestic tradition i have nothing to think against my tradition is historical what have i to look back to but that national past from which you gentlemen want to wrench away your future am i to let my intelligence my aspirations towards a better lot be robbed of the only thing it has to go upon at the will of violent enthusiasts you come from your province but all this land is mine or i have nothing no doubt you shall be looked upon as a martyr some day a sort of hero a political saint but i beg to be excused i am content in fitting myself to be a worker and what can you people do by scattering a few drops of blood on the snow on this immensity on this unhappy immensity i tell you he cried in a vibrating subdued voice and advancing one step nearer the bed that what it needs is not a lot of haunting phantoms that i could walk through but a man alden threw his arms forward as if to keep him off in horror i understand it all now he exclaimed with awestruck dismay i understand at last razumov staggered back against the table his forehead broke out in perspiration while a cold shudder ran down his spine what have i been saying he asked himself have i let him slip through my fingers after all he felt his lips go stiff like buckram and instead of a reassuring smile only achieved an uncertain grimace what will you have he began in a conciliating voice 
which got steady after the first trembling word or two what will you have consider a man of studious retired habits and suddenly like this i am not practised in talking delicately but he felt anger a wicked anger get hold of him again what were we to do together till midnight sit here opposite each other and think of your your shambles holden had a subdued heartbroken attitude he bowed his head his hands hung between his knees his voice was low and pained but calm i see now how it is razumov brother you are magnanimous soul but my action is abhorrent to you alas razumov stared from fright he had set his teeth so hard that his whole face ached it was impossible for him to make a sound and even my person too is loathsome to you perhaps haldin added mournfully after a short pause looking up for a moment then fixing his gaze on the floor for indeed unless one he broke off evidently waiting for a word razumov remained silent haldin nodded his head dejectedly twice of course of course he murmured ah weary work he remained perfectly still for a moment then made razumov's leaden heart strike a ponderous blow by springing up briskly so be it he cried sadly in a low distinct tone farewell then razumov started forward but the sight of haldin's raised hand checked him before he could get away from the table he leaned on it heavily listening to the faint sounds of some town clock tolling the hour holden already at the door tall and straight as an arrow with his pale face and a hand raised attentively might have posed for the statue of a daring youth listening to an inner voice razumov mechanically glanced down at his watch when he looked towards the door again holden had vanished there was a faint rustling in the outer room the feeble click of a bolt drawn back lightly he was gone almost as noiseless as a vision razumov ran forward unsteadily with parted voiceless lips the outer door stood open staggering out on the landing he leaned far over the banister gazing down into the deep black shaft with a tiny glimmering flame at the bottom he traced by ear the rapid spiral descent of somebody running down the stairs on tiptoe it was a light swift pattering sound which sank away from him into the depths a fleeting shadow passed over the glimmer a wink of the tiny flame then stillness razumov hung over breathing the cold raw air tainted by the evil smells of the unclean staircase all quiet he went back into his room slowly shutting the doors after him the peaceful steady light of his reading lamp shone on the watch razumov stood looking down at the little white dial it wanted yet three minutes to midnight he took the watch into his hand fumblingly he's slow he muttered and a strange fit of nervelessness came over him his knees shook the watch and chain slipped through his fingers in an instant and fell on the floor he was so startled that he nearly fell himself when at last he regained enough confidence in his limbs to stoop for it he held it to his ear at once after a while he growled stopped and paused for quite a long time before he muttered sourly it's done and now to work he sat down reached haphazard for a book opened it in middle and began to read but after going conscientiously over two lines he lost his hold on the print completely and did not try to regain it he thought there was to a certainty a police agent of some sort watching the house across the street he imagined him lurking in a dark gateway goggle-eyed muffled up in a cloak to the nose and with a general's plumed cocked hat on his head this absurdity made him start in the chair convulsively he literally had to shake his head violently to get rid of it the man would be disguised perhaps as a peasant a beggar perhaps he would be just buttoned up in a dark overcoat and carrying a loaded stick a shifty-eyed rascal smelling of raw onions and spirits this evocation brought on positive nausea why do i want to bother about this thought razumov with disgust am i a gendarme moreover it is done he got up in great agitation it was not done not yet not till half-past twelve and the watch had stopped this reduced him to despair impossible to know the time the landlady and all the people across the landing were asleep how could he go and god knows what they would imagine or how much they would guess he dared not go into the streets to find out i am a suspect now there's no use shirking that fact he said to himself bitterly if holden from some cause or another gave them the slip and failed to turn up in the karabelnaya the police would be invading his lodging and if he were not in he could never clear himself never 
razumov looked wildly about as if for some means of seizing upon time which seemed to have escaped him altogether he had never as far as he could remember heard the striking of that town clock in his rooms before this night and he was not even sure now whether he had heard it really on this night he went to the window and stood there with slightly bent head on the watch for the faint sound i will stay here till i hear something he said to himself he stood still his ear turned to the panes an atrocious aching numbness with shooting pains in his back and legs tortured him he did not budge his mind hovered on the borders of delirium he heard himself suddenly saying i confess as a person might do on the rack i am on the rack he thought he felt ready to swoon the faint deep boom of the distant clock seemed to explode in his head he heard it so clearly one if holden had not turned up the police would have been already here ransacking the house no sound reached him this time it was done he dragged himself painfully to the table and dropped into the chair he flung the book away and took a square sheet of paper it was like the pile of sheets covered with his neat minute handwriting only blank he took a pen brusquely and dipped it with a vague notion of going on with the writing of his essay but his pen remained poised over the sheet it hung there for some time before it came down and formed long scrawly letters still-faced and his lips set hard razumov began to write when he wrote a large hand his neat writing lost its character altogether became unsteady almost childish he wrote five lines one under the other history not theory patriotism not internationalism evolution not revolution direction not destruction unity not disruption he gazed at them dully then his eyes strayed to the bed and remained fixed there for a good many minutes while his right hand groped all over the table for the penknife he rose at last and walking up with measured steps stabbed the paper with the penknife to the lath and plaster wall at the head of the bed this done he stepped back a pace and flourished his hand with a glance round the room after that he never looked again at the bed he took his big cloak down from its peg and wrapping himself up closely went to lie down on the hard horsehair sofa at the other side of his room a leaden sleep closed his eyelids at once several times that night he woke up shivering from a dream of walking through drifts of snow in a russia where he was as completely alone as any betrayed autocrat could be an immense wintry russia which somehow his view could embrace in all its enormous expanse as if it were a map but after each shuddering start his heavy eyelids fell over his glazed eyes and he slept again end of chapter two section three recording by expatriate in bangor maine part one chapter three section one of under western eyes by joseph conrad this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter three section one approaching this part of mr razumov's story my mind the decent mind of an old teacher of languages feels more and more the difficulty of the task the task is not in truth the writing in the narrative form a precy of a strange human document but the rendering i perceive it now clearly of the moral conditions ruling over a large portion of this earth's surface conditions not easily to be understood much less discovered in the limits of a story till some key word is found a word that could stand at the back of all the words covering the pages a word which if not truth itself may perchance hold truth enough to help the moral discovery which should be the object of every tale i turn over for the hundredth time the leaves of mr razumov's record i lay it aside i take up the pen and the pen being ready for its office of setting down black on white i hesitate for the word that persists in creeping under its point is no other word than cynicism for that is the mark of russian autocracy and of russian revolt in its pride of numbers and its strange pretensions of sanctity and in the secret readiness to abase itself in suffering the spirit of russia is a spirit of cynicism it informs the declarations of her statesmen the theories of her revolutionists and the mystic vaticinations of prophets to the point of making freedom look like a form of debauch and the christian virtues themselves appear actually indecent but i must apologize for the digression 
it proceeds from the consideration of the course taken by the story of mr razumov after his conservative convictions diluted in a vague liberalism natural to the ardour of his age had become crystallised by the shock of his contact with haldin razumov woke up for the tenth time perhaps with a heavy shiver seeing the light of day in his window he resisted the inclination to lay himself down again he did not remember anything but he did not think it strange to find himself on the sofa in his cloak and chilled to the bone the light coming through the window seemed strangely cheerless containing no promise as the light of each new day should for a young man it was the awakening of a man mortally ill or of a man ninety years old he looked at the lamp which had burnt itself out it stood there the extinguished beacon of his labours a cold object of brass and porcelain amongst the scattered pages of his notes and small piles of books a mere litter of blackened paper dead matter without significance or interest he got on his feet and divesting himself of his cloak hung it on the peg going through all the motions mechanically an incredible dullness a ditch-water stagnation was sensible to his perceptions as though life had withdrawn itself from all things and even from his own thoughts there was not a sound in the house turning away from the peg he thought in that same lifeless manner that it must be very early yet but when he looked at the watch on his table he saw both hands arrested at twelve o'clock ah yes he mumbled to himself and as if beginning to get roused a little he took a survey of his room the paper stabbed to the wall arrested his attention he eyed it from the distance without approval or perplexity but when he heard the servant girl beginning to bustle about in the outer room with the samovar for his morning tea he walked up to it and took it down with an air of profound indifference while doing this he glanced down at the bed on which he had not slept that night the hollow in the pillow made by the weight of haldin's head was very noticeable even his anger at this sign of the man's passage was dull he did not try to nurse it into life he did nothing all that day he neglected even to brush his hair the idea of going out never occurred to him and if he did not start a connected train of thought it was not because he was unable to think it was because he was not interested enough he yawned frequently he drank large quantities of tea he walked about aimlessly and when he sat down he did not budge for a long time he spent some time drumming on the window with his fingertips quietly in his listless wanderings round about the table he caught sight of his own face in the looking-glass and that arrested him the eyes which returned his stare were the most unhappy eyes he had ever seen and this was the first thing which disturbed the mental stagnation of that day he was not affected personally he merely thought that life without happiness is impossible what was happiness he yawned and went on shuffling about and about between the walls of his room looking forward was happiness that's all nothing more to look forward to the gratification of some desire to the gratification of some passion love ambition hate hate too indubitably love and hate and to escape the dangers of existence to live without fear was also happiness there was nothing else absence of fear looking forward oh the miserable lot of humanity he exclaimed mentally and added at once in his thought i ought to be happy enough as far as that goes but he was not excited by that assurance on the contrary he yawned again as he had been yawning all day he was mildly surprised to discover himself being overtaken by night the room grew dark swiftly though time had seemed to stand still how was it that he had not noticed the passing of that day of course it was the watch being stopped he did not light his lamp but went over to the bed and threw himself on it without any hesitation lying on his back he put his hands under his head and stared upward after a moment he thought i am lying here like that man i wonder if he slept while i was struggling with the blizzard in the streets no he did not sleep but why should i not sleep and he felt the silence of the night press upon all his limbs like a weight in the calm of the hard frost outside the clear-cut strokes of the town clock counting off midnight penetrated the quietness of his suspended animation again he began to think it was twenty-four hours since that man left his room razumov had a distinct feeling that holden in the fortress was sleeping that night it was a certitude which made him angry because he did not want to think of holden but he justified it to himself by physiological and psychological reasons the fellow had hardly slept for weeks on his own confession 
and now every incertitude was at an end for him no doubt he was looking forward to the consummation of his martyrdom a man who resigns himself to kill need not go very far for resignation to die haldin slept perhaps more soundly than general t whose task weary work too was not done and over whose head hung the sword of revolutionary vengeance razumov remembering the thick-set man with his heavy jowl resting on the collar of his uniform the champion of autocracy who had let no sign of surprise incredulity or joy escape him but whose goggle eyes could express a mortal hatred of all rebellion razumov moved uneasily on the bed he suspected me he thought i suppose he must suspect everybody he would be capable of suspecting his own wife if haldin had gone to her boudoir with his confession razumov sat up in anguish was he to remain a political suspect all his days was he to go through life as a man not wholly to be trusted with a bad secret police note tacked on to his record what sort of future could he look forward to i am now a suspect he thought again but the habit of reflection and that desire of safety of an ordered life which was so strong in him came to his assistance as the night wore on his quiet steady and laborious existence would vouch at length for his loyalty there were many permitted ways to serve one's country there was an activity that made for progress without being revolutionary the field of influence was great and infinitely varied once one had conquered a name his thought like a circling bird reverted after four and twenty hours to the silver medal and as it were poised itself there when the day broke he had not slept not for a moment but he got up not very tired and quite sufficiently self-possessed for all practical purposes he went out and attended three lectures in the morning but the work in the library was a mere dumb show of research he sat with many volumes open before him trying to make notes and extracts his new tranquillity was like a flimsy garment and seemed to float at the mercy of a casual word betrayal why the fellow had done all that was necessary to betray himself precious little had been needed to deceive him i have said no word to him that was not strictly true not one word razumov argued with himself once engaged on this line of thought there could be no question of doing useful work the same ideas went on passing through his mind and he pronounced mentally the same words over and over again he shut up all the books and rammed all his papers into his pocket with convulsive movements raging inwardly against holden as he was leaving the library a long bony student in a threadbare overcoat joined him stepping moodily by his side razumov answered his mumbled greeting without looking at him at all what does he want with me he thought with a strange dread of the unexpected which he tried to shake off lest it should fasten itself upon his life for good and all and the other muttering cautiously with downcast eyes supposed that his comrade had seen the news of de p s executioner that was the expression he used having been arrested the night before last i've been ill shut up in my rooms razumov mumbled through his teeth the tall student raising his shoulders shoved his hands deep into his pockets he had a hairless square tallowy chin which trembled slightly as he spoke and his nose nipped bright red by the sharp air looked like a false nose of painted cardboard between the sallow cheeks his whole appearance was stamped with the mark of cold and hunger he stalked deliberately at razumov's elbow with his eyes on the ground it's an official statement he continued in the same cautious mutter it may be a lie but there was somebody arrested between midnight and one in the morning on tuesday this is certain and talking rapidly under the cover of his downcast air he told razumov that this was known through an inferior government clerk employed at the central secretariat that man belonged to one of the revolutionary circles the same in fact i am affiliated to remarked the student they were crossing a wide quadrangle an infinite distress possessed razumov annihilated his energy and before his eyes everything appeared confused and as if evanescent he dared not leave the fellow there he may be affiliated to the police was the thought that passed through his mind who could tell but eyeing the miserable frost-nipped famine-struck figure of his companion he perceived the absurdity of his suspicion but i you know i don't belong to any circle i he dared not say any more neither dared he mend his pace the other raising and setting down his lamentably shod feet with exact deliberation 
protested in a low tone that it was not necessary for everybody to belong to an organization the most valuable personalities remained outside some of the best work was done outside the organization then very fast with whispering feverish lips the man arrested in the street was holden and accepting razumov's dismayed silence as natural enough he assured him that there was no mistake that government clerk was on night duty at the secretariat hearing a great noise of footsteps in the hall and aware that political prisoners were brought over sometimes at night from the fortress he opened the door of the room in which he was working suddenly before the gendarme on duty could push him back and slam the door in his face he had seen a prisoner being partly carried partly dragged along the hall by a lot of policemen he was being used very brutally and the clerk had recognized haldin perfectly less than half an hour afterwards general t arrived at the secretariat to examine that prisoner personally aren't you astonished concluded the gaunt student no said razumov roughly and at once regretted his answer everybody supposed haldin was in the provinces with his people didn't you the student turned his big hollow eyes upon razumov who said unguardedly his people are abroad he could have bitten his tongue out with vexation the student pronounced in a tone of profound meaning so you alone were aware and stopped they have sworn my ruin thought razumov have you spoken of this to anyone else he asked with bitter curiosity the other shook his head no only to you our circle thought that as holden had been often heard expressing a warm appreciation of your character razumov could not restrain a gesture of angry despair which the other must have misunderstood in some way because he ceased speaking and turned away his black lack-lustre eyes they moved side by side in silence then the gaunt student began to whisper again with averted gaze as we have at present no one affiliated inside the fortress so as to make it possible to furnish him with a packet of poison we have considered already some sort of retaliatory action to follow very soon razumov trudging on interrupted were you acquainted with haldin did he know where you live i had the happiness to hear him speak twice his companion answered in the feverish whisper contrasting with the gloomy apathy of his face and bearing he did not know where i live i am lodging poorly with an artisan family i have just a corner in a room it is not very practicable to see me there but if you should need me for anything i am ready razumov trembled with rage and fear he was beside himself but kept his voice low you are not to come near me you are not to speak to me never address a single word to me i forbid you very well said the other submissively showing no surprise whatever at this abrupt prohibition you don't wish for secret reasons perfectly i understand he edged away at once not looking up even and razumov saw his gaunt shabby famine-stricken figure cross the street obliquely with lowered head and that peculiar exact motion of the feet he watched him as one would watch a vision out of a nightmare then he continued on his way trying not to think on his landing the landlady seemed to be waiting for him she was a short thick shapeless woman with a large yellow face wrapped up everlastingly in a black woolen shawl when she saw him come up the last flight of stairs she flung both her arms up excitedly then clasped her hands before her face kirylo sidorovitch little father what have you been doing and such a quiet young man too the police are just gone this moment after searching your rooms razumov gazed down at her with silent scrutinizing attention her puffy yellow countenance was working with emotion she screwed up her eyes at him entreatingly such a sensible young man anybody can see you are sensible and now like this all at once what is the good of mixing yourself up with these nihilists do give over little father they are unlucky people razumov moved his shoulders slightly or is it that some secret enemy has been calumniating you kirylo sidorovitch the world is full of black hearts and false denunciations nowadays there is much fear about have you heard that i have been denounced by someone asked razumov without taking his eyes off her quivering face but she had not heard anything she had tried to find out by asking the police captain while his men were turning the room upside down the police captain of the district had known her for the last eleven years and was a humane person but he said to her on the landing looking very black and vexed my good woman do not ask questions i don't know anything myself the order comes from higher quarters and indeed there had appeared shortly after the arrival of the policeman of the district 
a very superior gentleman in a fur coat and a shiny hat who sat down in the room and looked through all the papers himself he came alone and went away by himself taking nothing with him she had been trying to put things straight a little since they left razumov turned away brusquely and entered his rooms all his books had been shaken and thrown on the floor his landlady followed him and stooping painfully began to pick them up into her apron his papers and notes which were kept always neatly sorted they all related to his studies had been shuffled up and heaped together into a ragged pile in the middle of the table this disorder affected him profoundly unreasonably he sat down and stared he had a distinct sensation of his very existence being undermined in some mysterious manner of his moral supports falling away from him one by one he even experienced a slight physical giddiness and made a movement as if to reach for something to steady himself with the old woman rising to her feet with a low groan shot all the books she had collected in her apron on to the sofa and left the room muttering and sighing it was only then that he noticed that the sheet of paper which for one night had remained stabbed to the wall above his empty bed was lying on top of the pile when he had taken it down the day before he had folded it in four absent-mindedly before dropping it on the table and now he saw it lying uppermost spread out smoothed out even and covering all the confused pile of pages the record of his intellectual life for the last three years it had not been flung there it had been placed there smoothed out too he guessed in that an intention of profound meaning or perhaps some inexplicable mockery he sat staring at the piece of paper till his eyes began to smart he did not attempt to put his papers in order either that evening or the next day which he spent at home in a state of peculiar irresolution this irresolution bore upon the question whether he should continue to live neither more nor less but its nature was very far removed from the hesitation of a man contemplating suicide the idea of laying violent hands upon his body did not occur to razumov the unrelated organism bearing that label walking breathing wearing these clothes was of no importance to any one unless maybe to the landlady the true razumov had his being in the willed in the determined future in that future menaced by the lawlessness of autocracy for autocracy knows no law and the lawlessness of revolution the feeling that his moral personality was at the mercy of these lawless forces was so strong that he asked himself seriously if it were worth while to go on accomplishing the mental functions of that existence which seemed no longer his own what is the good of exerting my intelligence of pursuing the systematic development of my faculties and all my plans of work he asked himself i want to guide my conduct by reasonable convictions but what security have i against something some destructive horror walking in upon me as i sit here razumov looked apprehensively towards the door of the outer room as if expecting some shape of evil to turn the handle and appear before him silently a common thief he said to himself finds more guarantees in the law he is breaking and even a brute like zemianitch has his consolation razumov envied the materialism of the thief and the passion of the incorrigible lover the consequences of their actions were always clear and their lives remained their own but he slept as soundly that night as though he had been consoling himself in the manner of zemianitch he dropped off suddenly lay like a log remembered no dream on waking but it was as if his soul had gone out in the night to gather the flowers of wrathful wisdom he got up in a mood of grim determination and as if with a new knowledge of his own nature he looked mockingly on the heap of papers on his table and left his room to attend the lectures muttering to himself we shall see he was in no humour to talk to anybody or hear himself questioned as to his absence from lectures the day before but it was difficult to repulse rudely a very good comrade with a smooth pink face and fair hair bearing the nickname amongst his fellow students of madcap kostya he was the idolized only son of a very wealthy and illiterate government contractor and attended the lectures only during the periodical fits of contrition following upon tearful paternal remonstrances noisily blundering like a retriever puppy his elated voice and great gestures filled the bare academy corridors with the joy of thoughtless animal life provoking indulgent smiles at a great distance his usual discourse is treated of trotting horses wine parties in expensive restaurants and the merits of persons of easy virtue with a disarming artlessness of outlook he pounced upon razumov about midday 
somewhat less uproariously than his habit was and led him aside just a moment kirylo sidorovitch a few words here in this quiet corner he felt razumov's reluctance and insinuated his hand under his arm caressingly no pray do i don't want to talk to you about any of my silly scrapes what are my scrapes absolutely nothing mere childishness the other night i flung a fellow out of a certain place where i was having a fairly good time a tyrannical little beast of a quill driver from the treasury department he was bullying the people of the house i rebuked him you are not behaving humanely to god's creatures that are a jolly sight more estimable than yourself i said i can't bear to see any tyranny kirylo sidorovitch upon my word i can't he didn't take it in good part at all who's that impudent puppy he begins to shout i was in excellent form as it happened and he went through the closed window very suddenly he flew quite a long way into the yard i raged like like a minotaur the women clung to me and screamed the fiddlers got under the table such fun my dad had to put his hand pretty deep into his pocket i can tell you he chuckled my dad is a very useful man jolly good thing it is for me too i do get into unholy scrapes his elation fell that was just it what was his life insignificant no good to anyone a mere festivity it would end some fine day in his getting his skull split with a champagne bottle in a drunken brawl at such times too when men were sacrificing themselves to ideas but he could never get any ideas into his head his head wasn't worth anything better than to be split by a champagne bottle razumov protesting that he had no time made an attempt to get away the other's tone changed to confidential earnestness for god's sake kirylo my dear soul let me make some sort of sacrifice it would not be a sacrifice really i have my rich dad behind me there is positively no getting to the bottom of his pocket and rejecting indignantly razumov's suggestion that this was drunken raving he offered to lend him some money to escape abroad with he could always get money from his dad he had only to say that he had lost it at cards or something of that sort and at the same time promised solemnly not to miss a single lecture for three months on end that would fetch the old man and he kostya was quite equal to the sacrifice though he really did not see what was the good for him to attend the lectures it was perfectly hopeless won't you let me be of some use he pleaded to the silent razumov who with his eyes on the ground and utterly unable to penetrate the real drift of the other's intention felt a strange reluctance to clear up the point what makes you think i want to go abroad he asked at last very quietly kostya lowered his voice you had the police in your rooms yesterday there are three or four of us who have heard of that never mind how we know it is sufficient that we do so we've been consulting together ah you got to know that so soon muttered razumov negligently yes we did and it struck us that a man like you what sort of a man do you take me to be razumov interrupted him a man of ideas and a man of action too but you are very deep kirylo there's no getting to the bottom of your mind not for fellows like me but we all agree that you must be preserved for our country of that we have no doubt whatever i mean all of us who have heard holden speak of you on certain occasions a man doesn't get the police ransacking his rooms without there being some devilry hanging over his head and so if you think that it would be better for you to bolt at once razumov tore himself away and walked down the corridor leaving the other motionless with his mouth open but almost at once he returned and stood before the amazed kostya who shut his mouth slowly razumov looked him straight in the eyes before saying with marked deliberation and separating his words i thank you very much he went away again rapidly kostya recovering from his surprise at these manoeuvres ran up behind him pressingly no wait listen i really mean it it would be like giving your compassion to a starving fellow do you hear kirylo in any disguise you may think of that too i could procure from a costumier a jew i know let a fool be made serviceable according to his folly perhaps also a false beard or something of that kind may be needed razumov turned at bay there are no false beards needed in this business kostya you good-hearted lunatic you what do you know of my ideas my ideas may be poison to you the other began to shake his head in energetic protest what have you got to do with ideas some of them would make an end of your dad's money-bags leave off meddling with what you don't understand go back to your trotting horses and your girls and then you'll be sure at least of doing no harm to anybody and hardly any to yourself the enthusiastic youth was overcome by this disdain 
you're sending me back to my pig's trough kirillo that settles it i am an unlucky beast and i shall die like a beast too but mind it's your contempt that has done for me end of chapter three section one recording by expatriate in bangor maine part one chapter three section two of under western eyes by joseph conrad this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter three section two razumov went off with long strides that this simple and grossly festive soul should have fallen too under the revolutionary curse affected him as an ominous symptom of the time he reproached himself for feeling troubled personally he ought to have felt reassured there was an obvious advantage in this conspiracy of mistaken judgment taking him for what he was not but was it not strange again he experienced that sensation of his conduct being taken out of his hands by haldin's revolutionary tyranny his solitary and laborious existence had been destroyed the only thing he could call his own on this earth by what right he asked himself furiously in what name what infuriated him most was to feel that the thinkers of the university were evidently connecting him with haldin as a sort of confidant in the background apparently a mysterious connection ha ha he had been made a personage without knowing anything about it how that wretch haldin must have talked about him yet it was likely that haldin had said very little the fellow's casual utterances were caught up and treasured and pondered over by all these imbeciles and was not all secret revolutionary action based upon folly self-deception and lies impossible to think of anything else muttered razumov to himself i'll become an idiot if this goes on the scoundrels and the fools are murdering my intelligence he lost all hope of saving his future which depended on the free use of his intelligence he reached the doorway of his house in a state of mental discouragement which enabled him to receive with apparent indifference an official-looking envelope from the dirty hand of the dvornik a gendarme brought it said the man he asked if you were at home i told him no he's not at home so he left it give it into his own hands says he now you've got it eh he went back to his sweeping and razumov climbed his stairs envelope in hand once in his room he did not hasten to open it of course this official missive was from the superior direction of the police a suspect a suspect he stared in dreary astonishment at the absurdity of his position he thought with a sort of dry unemotional melancholy three years of good work gone the course of forty more perhaps jeopardized turned from hope to terror because events started by human folly link themselves into a sequence which no sagacity can foresee and no courage can break through fatality enters your rooms while your landlady's back is turned you come home and find it in possession bearing a man's name clothed in flesh wearing a brown cloth coat and long boots lounging against the stove it asks you is the outer door closed and you don't know enough to take it by the throat and fling it downstairs you don't know you welcome the crazy fate sit down you say and it is all over you cannot shake it off any more it will cling to you forever neither halter nor bullet can give you back the freedom of your life and the sanity of your thought it was enough to dash one's head against a wall razumov looked slowly all round the walls as if to select the spot to dash his head against then he opened the letter it directed the student kirillo sidorovitch razumov to present himself without delay at the general secretariat razumov had a vision of general t s goggle eyes waiting for him the embodied power of autocracy grotesque and terrible he embodied the whole power of autocracy because he was its guardian he was the incarnate suspicion the incarnate anger the incarnate ruthlessness of a political and social regime on its defence he loathed rebellion by instinct and razumov reflected that the man was simply unable to understand a reasonable adherence to the doctrine of absolutism what can he want with me precisely i wonder he asked himself as if that mental question had evoked the familiar phantom holden stood suddenly before him in the room with an extraordinary completeness of detail though the short winter day had passed already into the sinister twilight 
of a land buried in snow razumov saw plainly the narrow leather strap round the cherkess coat the illusion of that hateful presence was so perfect that he half expected it to ask is the outer door closed he looked at it with hatred and contempt souls do not take a shape of clothing moreover haldin could not be dead yet razumov stepped forward menacingly the vision vanished and turning short on his heel he walked out of his room with infinite disdain but after going down the first flight of stairs it occurred to him that perhaps the superior authorities of police meant to confront him with holden in the flesh this thought struck him like a bullet and had he not clung with both hands to the banister he would have rolled down to the next landing most likely his legs were of no use for a considerable time but why for what conceivable reason to what end there could be no rational answer to these questions but razumov remembered the promise made by the general to prince k his action was to remain unknown he got down to the bottom of the stairs lowering himself as it were from step to step by the banister under the gate he regained much of his firmness of thought and limb he went out into the street without staggering visibly every moment he felt steadier mentally and yet he was saying to himself that general t was perfectly capable of shutting him up in the fortress for an indefinite time his temperament fitted his remorseless task and his omnipotence made him inaccessible to reasonable argument but when razumov arrived at the secretariat he discovered that he would have nothing to do with general t it is evident from mr razumov's diary that this dreaded personality was to remain in the background a civilian of superior rank received him in a private room after a period of waiting in outer offices where a lot of scribbling went on at many tables in a heated and stuffy atmosphere the clerk in uniform who conducted him said in the corridor you are going before gregor matveitch mikulin there was nothing formidable about the man bearing that name his mild expectant glance was turned on the door already when razumov entered at once with the penholder he was holding in his hand he pointed to a deep sofa between two windows he followed razumov with his eyes while that last crossed the room and sat down the mild gaze rested on him not curious not inquisitive certainly not suspicious almost without expression in its passionless persistence there was something resembling sympathy razumov who had prepared his will and his intelligence to encounter general t himself was profoundly troubled all the moral bracing up against the possible excesses of power and passion went for nothing before this sallow man who wore a full unclipped beard it was fair thin and very fine the light fell in coppery gleams on the protuberances of a high rugged forehead and the aspect of the broad soft physiognomy was so homely and rustic that the careful middle parting of the hair seemed a pretentious affectation the diary of mr razumov testifies to some irritation on his part i may remark here that the diary proper consisting of the more or less daily entries seems to have been begun on that very evening after mr razumov had returned home mr razumov then was irritated his strung-up individuality had gone to pieces within him very suddenly i must be very prudent with him he warned himself in the silence during which they sat gazing at each other it lasted some little time and was characterized for silences have their character by a sort of sadness imparted to it perhaps by the mild and thoughtful manner of the bearded official razumov learned later that he was the chief of a department in the general secretariat with a rank in the civil service equivalent to that of a colonel in the army razumov's mistrust became acute the main point was not to be drawn into saying too much he had been called there for some reason what reason to be given to understand that he was a suspect and also no doubt to be pumped as to what precisely there was nothing or perhaps holden had been telling lies every alarming uncertainty beset razumov he could bear the silence no longer and cursing himself for his weakness spoke first though he had promised himself not to do so on any account i haven't lost a moment's time he began in a hoarse provoking tone and then the faculty of speech seemed to leave him and enter the body of councillor mikulin who chimed in approvingly very proper very proper though as a matter of fact but the spell was broken and razumov interrupted him boldly 
under a sudden conviction that this was the safest attitude to take with a great flow of words he complained of being totally misunderstood even as he talked with a perception of his own audacity he thought that the word misunderstood was better than the word mistrusted and he repeated it again with insistence suddenly he ceased being seized with fright before the attentive immobility of the official what am i talking about he thought eyeing him with a vague gaze mistrusted not misunderstood was the right symbol for these people misunderstood was the other kind of curse both had been brought on his head by that fellow holden and his head ached terribly he passed his hand over his brow an involuntary gesture of suffering which he was too careless to restrain at that moment razumov beheld his own brain suffering on the rack a long pale figure drawn asunder horizontally with terrific force in the darkness of a vault whose face he failed to see it was as though he had dreamed for an infinitesimal fraction of time of some dark print of the inquisition it is not to be seriously supposed that razumov had actually dozed off and had dreamed in the presence of councillor mikulin of an old print of the inquisition he was indeed extremely exhausted and he records a remarkably dreamlike experience of anguish at the circumstance that there was no one whatever near the pale and extended figure the solitude of the racked victim was particularly horrible to behold the mysterious impossibility to see the face he also notes inspired a sort of terror all these characteristics of an ugly dream were present yet he is certain that he never lost the consciousness of himself on the sofa leaning forward with his hands between his knees and turning his cap round and round in his fingers but everything vanished at the voice of councillor mikulin razumov felt profoundly grateful for the even simplicity of its tone yes i have listened with interest i comprehend in a measure your but indeed you are mistaken in what you councillor mikulin uttered a series of broken sentences instead of finishing them he glanced down his beard it was a deliberate curtailment which somehow made the phrases more impressive but he could talk fluently enough as became apparent when changing his tone to persuasiveness he went on by listening to you as i did i think i have proved that i do not regard our intercourse as strictly official in fact i don't want it to have that character at all oh yes i admit that the request for your presence here had an official form but i put it to you whether it was a form which would have been used to secure the attendance of a suspect exclaimed razumov looking straight into the official's eyes they were big with heavy eyelids and met his boldness with a dim steadfast gaze a suspect the open repetition of that word which had been haunting all his waking hours gave razumov a strange sort of satisfaction councillor mikulin shook his head slightly surely you do know that i've had my room searched by the police i was about to say a misunderstood person when you interrupted me insinuated quietly councillor mikulin razumov smiled without bitterness the renewed sense of his intellectual superiority sustained him in the hour of danger he said a little disdainfully i know i am but a reed but i beg you to allow me the superiority of the thinking reed over the unthinking forces that are about to crush him out of existence practical thinking in the last instance is but criticism i may perhaps be allowed to express my wonder at this action of the police being delayed for two full days during which of course i could have annihilated everything compromising by burning it let us say and getting rid of the very ashes for that matter you are angry remarked the official with an unutterable simplicity of tone and manner is that reasonable razumov felt himself colouring with annoyance i am reasonable i am even permit me to say a thinker though to be sure this name nowadays seems to be the monopoly of hawkers of revolutionary wares the slaves of some french or german thought devil knows what foreign notions but i am not an intellectual mongrel i think like a russian i think faithfully and i take the liberty to call myself a thinker it is not a forbidden word as far as i know no why should it be a forbidden word councillor mikulin turned in his seat with crossed legs and resting his elbow on the table propped his head on the knuckles of a half-closed hand razumov noticed a thick forefinger clasped by a massive gold band set with a blood-red stone 
a signet ring that looking as if it could weigh half a pound was an appropriate ornament for that ponderous man with the accurate middle parting of glossy hair above a rugged socratic forehead could it be a wig razumov detected himself wondering with an unexpected detachment his self-confidence was much shaken he resolved to chatter no more reserve reserve all he had to do was to keep the zemianitch episode secret with absolute determination when the questions came keep zemianitch strictly out of all the answers councillor mikulin looked at him dimly razumov's self-confidence abandoned him completely it seemed impossible to keep zemianitch out every question would lead to that because of course there was nothing else he made an effort to brace himself up it was a failure but councillor mikulin was surprisingly detached too why should it be forbidden he repeated i too consider myself a thinking man i assure you the principal condition is to think correctly i admit it is difficult sometimes at first for a young man abandoned to himself with his generous impulses undisciplined so to speak at the mercy of every wild wind that blows religious belief of course is a great councillor mikulin glanced down his beard and razumov whose tension was relaxed by that unexpected and discursive turn murmured with gloomy discontent that man holden believed in god ah you are aware breathed out councillor mikulin making the point softly as if with discretion but making it nevertheless plainly enough as if he too were put off his guard by razumov's remark the young man preserved an impassive moody countenance though he reproached himself bitterly for a pernicious fool to have given thus an utterly false impression of intimacy he kept his eyes on the floor i must positively hold my tongue unless i am obliged to speak he admonished himself and at once against his will the question hadn't i better tell him everything presented itself with such force that he had to bite his lower lip councillor mikulin could not however have nourished any hope of confession he went on you tell me more than his judges were able to get out of him he was judged by a commission of three he would tell them absolutely nothing i have the report of the interrogatories here by me after every question there stands refuses to answer refuses to answer it's like that page after page you see i have been entrusted with some further investigations around and about this affair he has left me nothing to begin my investigations on a hardened miscreant and so you say he believed in again councillor mikulin glanced down his beard with a faint grimace but he did not pause for long remarking with a shade of scorn that blasphemers also had that sort of belief he concluded by supposing that mr razumov had conversed frequently with haldin on the subject no said razumov loudly without looking up he talked and i listened that is not a conversation listening is a great art observed mikulin parenthetically and getting people to talk is another mumbled razumov well no that is not very difficult mikulin said innocently except of course in special cases for instance this haldin nothing could induce him to talk he was brought four times before the delegated judges four secret interrogatories and even during the last when your personality was put forward my personality put forward repeated razumov raising his head brusquely i don't understand councillor mikulin turned squarely to the table and taking up some sheets of grey fool's cap dropped them one after another retaining only the last in his hand he held it before his eyes while speaking it was you see judged necessary in a case of that gravity no means of action upon the culprit should be neglected you understand that yourself i am certain razumov stared with enormous wide eyes at the side view of councillor mikulin who now was not looking at him at all so it was decided i was consulted by general t that a certain question should be put to the accused but in deference to the earnest wishes of prince k your name has been kept out of the documents and even from the very knowledge of the judges themselves prince k recognized the propriety the necessity of what we proposed to do but he was concerned for your safety things do leak out that we can't deny one cannot always answer for the discretion of inferior officials there was of course a secretary of the special tribunal one or two gendarmes in the room moreover as i have said in deference to prince k even the judges themselves were to be left in ignorance the question ready framed was sent to them by general t i wrote it out with my own hand with instructions to put it to the prisoner the very last of all here it is 
councillor mikulin threw back his head into proper focus and went on reading monotonously question as the man well known to you in whose rooms you remained for several hours on monday and on whose information you have been arrested has he had any previous knowledge of your intention to commit a political murder prisoner refuses to reply question repeated prisoner preserves the same stubborn silence the venerable chaplain of the fortress being then admitted and exhorting the prisoner to repentance and treating him also to atone for his crime by an unreserved and full confession which should help to liberate from the sin of rebellion against the divine laws and the sacred majesty of the ruler our christ-loving land the prisoner opens his lips for the first time during this morning's audience and in a loud clear voice rejects the venerable chaplain's ministrations at eleven o'clock the court pronounces in summary form the death sentence the execution is fixed for four o'clock in the afternoon subject to further instructions from superior authorities councillor mikulin dropped the page of foolscap glanced down his beard and turning to razumov added in an easy explanatory tone we saw no object in delaying the execution the order to carry out the sentence was sent by telegraph at noon i wrote out the telegram myself he was hanged at four o'clock this afternoon the definite information of haldin's death gave razumov the feeling of general lassitude which follows a great exertion or a great excitement he kept very still on the sofa but a murmur escaped him he had a belief in a future existence councillor mikulin shrugged his shoulders slightly and razumov got up with an effort there was nothing now to stay for in that room haldin had been hanged at four o'clock there could be no doubt of that he had it seemed entered upon his future existence long boots astrakhan fur cap and all down to the very leather strap round his waist a flickering vanishing sort of existence it was not his soul it was his mere phantom he had left behind on this earth thought razumov smiling caustically to himself while he crossed the room utterly forgetful of where he was and of councillor mikulin's existence the official could have said a lot of bells ringing all over the building without leaving his chair he let razumov go quite up to the door before he spoke come kirillo sidorovitch what are you doing razumov turned his head and looked at him in silence he was not in the least disconcerted councillor mikulin's arms were stretched out on the table before him and his body leaned forward a little with an effort of his dim gaze was i actually going to clear out like this razumov wondered at himself with an impassive countenance and he was aware of this impassiveness concealing a lucid astonishment evidently i was going out if he had not spoken he thought what would he have done then i must end this affair one way or another i must make him show his hand for a moment longer he reflected behind the mask as it were then let go the door-handle and came back to the middle of the room i'll tell you what you think he said explosively but not raising his voice you think that you are dealing with a secret accomplice of that unhappy man no i do not know that he was unhappy he did not tell me he was a wretch from my point of view because to keep alive a false idea is a greater crime than to kill a man i suppose you will not deny that i hated him visionaries work everlasting evil on earth their utopias inspire in the mass of mediocre minds a disgust of reality and a contempt for the secular logic of human development razumov shrugged his shoulders and stared what a tirade he thought the silence and immobility of councillor mikulin impressed him the bearded bureaucrat sat at his post mysteriously self-possessed like an idol with dim unreadable eyes razumov's voice changed involuntarily if you were to ask me where is the necessity of my hate for such as holden i would answer you there is nothing sentimental in it i did not hate him because he had committed the crime of murder abhorrence is not hate i hated him simply because i am sane it is in that character that he outraged me his death razumov felt his voice growing thick in his throat the dimness of councillor mikulin's eyes seemed to spread all over his face and make it indistinct to razumov's sight he tried to disregard these phenomena indeed he pursued pronouncing each word carefully what is his death to me if he were lying here on the floor i could walk over his breast the fellow is a mere phantom razumov's voice died out very much against his will mikulin behind the table did not allow himself the slightest movement the silence lasted for some little time before razumov could go on again 
he went about talking of me those intellectual fellows sit in each other's rooms and get drunk on foreign ideas in the same way young guards officers treat each other with foreign wines merest debauchery upon my word razumov enraged by a sudden recollection of zemianitch lowered his voice forcibly upon my word we russians are a drunken lot intoxication of some sort we must have to get ourselves wild with sorrow or maudlin with resignation to lie inert like a log or set fire to the house what is a sober man to do i should like to know to cut oneself entirely from one's kind is impossible to live in a desert one must be a saint but if a drunken man runs out of the grog shop falls on your neck and kisses you on both cheeks because something about your appearance has taken his fancy what then kindly tell me you may break perhaps a cudgel on his back and yet not succeed in beating him off councillor mikulin raised his hand and passed it down his face deliberately that's of course he said in an undertone the quiet gravity of that gesture made razumov pause it was so unexpected too what did it mean it had an alarming aloofness razumov remembered his intention of making him show his hand i have said all this to prince k he began with assumed indifference but lost it on seeing councillor mikulin's slow nod of assent you know it you've heard then why should i be called here to be told of haldin's execution did you want to confront me with his silence now that the man is dead what is his silence to me this is incomprehensible you want in some way to shake my moral balance no not that murmured councillor mikulin just audibly the service you have rendered is appreciated is it interrupted razumov ironically and your position too councillor mikulin did not raise his voice but only think you fall into prince k s study as if from the sky with your startling information you are studying yet mr razumov but we are serving already don't forget that and naturally some curiosity was bound to councillor mikulin looked down his beard razumov's lips trembled an occurrence of that sort marks a man the homely murmur went on i admit i was curious to see you general t thought it would be useful too don't think i am incapable of understanding your sentiments when i was young like you i studied yes you wished to see me said razumov in a tone of profound distaste naturally you have the right i mean the power it all amounts to the same thing but it is perfectly useless if you were to look at me and listen to me for a year i begin to think there is something about me which people don't seem able to make out it's unfortunate i imagine however that prince k understands he seemed to councillor mikulin moved slightly and spoke prince k is aware of everything that is being done and i don't mind informing you that he approved my intention of becoming personally acquainted with you razumov concealed an immense disappointment under the accents of railing surprise so he is curious too well after all prince k knows me very little it is really very unfortunate for me but it is not exactly my fault councillor mikulin raised a hasty deprecatory hand and inclined his head slightly over his shoulder now mr razumov is it necessary to take it in that way everybody i am sure can he glanced rapidly down his beard and when he looked up again there was for the moment an interested expression in his misty gaze razumov discouraged it with a cold repellent smile no that's of no importance to be sure except that in respect of all this curiosity being aroused by a very simple matter what is to be done with it it is unappeasable i mean to say there is nothing to appease it with i happen to have been born a russian with patriotic instincts whether inherited or not i am not in a position to say razumov spoke consciously with elaborate steadiness yes patriotic instincts developed by a faculty of independent thinking of detached thinking in that respect i am more free than any social democratic revolution could make me it is more than probable that i don't think exactly as you are thinking indeed how could it be you would think most likely at this moment that i am elaborately lying to cover up the track of my repentance razumov stopped his heart had grown too big for his breast councillor mikulin did not flinch why so he said simply i assisted personally at the search of your rooms i looked through all the papers myself i have been greatly impressed by a sort of political confession of faith a very remarkable document now may i ask for what purpose to deceive the police naturally said razumov savagely what is all this mockery of course you can send me straight from this room to siberia that would be intelligible 
to what is intelligible i can submit but i protest against this comedy of persecution the whole affair is becoming too comical altogether for my taste a comedy of errors phantoms and suspicions is positively indecent councillor mikulin turned an attentive ear did you say phantoms he murmured i could walk over dozens of them razumov with an impatient wave of his hand went on headlong but really i must claim the right to be done once for all with that man and in order to accomplish this i shall take the liberty razumov on his side of the table bowed slightly to the seated bureaucrat to retire simply to retire he finished with great resolution he walked to the door thinking now he must show his hand he must ring and have me arrested before i am out of the building or he must let me go and either way an unhurried voice said kirylo sidorovitch razumov at the door turned his head to retire he repeated where to asked councillor mikulin softly end of chapter three section two recording by expatriate in bangor maine Part two, chapter one of Under Western Eyes by Joseph Conrad. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part two, chapter one. In the conduct of an invented story, there are no doubt certain proprieties to be observed for the sake of clearness and effect. A man of imagination, however inexperienced in the art of narrative, has his instinct to guide him in the choice of his words and in the development of the action a grain of talent excuses many mistakes but this is not a work of imagination i have no talent my excuse for this undertaking lies not in its art but in its artlessness aware of my limitations and strong in the sincerity of my purpose i would not try were i able to invent anything i push my scruples so far that i would not even invent a transition dropping then mr razumov's record at the point where councillor mikulin's question where to comes in with the force of an insoluble problem i shall simply say that i made the acquaintance of these ladies about six months before that time by these ladies i mean of course the mother and the sister of the unfortunate halden by what arguments he had induced his mother to sell their little property and go abroad for an indefinite time i cannot tell precisely i have an idea that mrs holden at her son's wish would have set fire to her house and emigrated to the moon without any sign of surprise or apprehension and that miss holden natalie caressingly natalka would have given her assent to the scheme their proud devotion to that young man became clear to me in a very short time following his directions they went straight to switzerland to zurich where they remained the best part of a year from zurich which they did not like they came to geneva a friend of mine in lausanne a lecturer in history at the university he had married a russian lady a distant connection of mrs holden's wrote to me suggesting i should call on these ladies it was a very kindly meant business suggestion miss holden wished to go through a course of reading the best english authors with a competent teacher mrs holden received me very kindly her bad french of which she was smilingly conscious did away with the formality of the first interview she was a tall woman in a black silk dress a wide brow regular features and delicately cut lips testified to her past beauty she sat upright in an easy chair and in a rather weak gentle voice told me that her natalka simply thirsted after knowledge her thin hands were lying on her lap her facial immobility had in it something monocle in russia she went on all knowledge was tainted with falsehood not chemistry and all that but education generally she explained the government corrupted the teaching for its own purposes both her children felt that her natalka had obtained a diploma of a superior school for women and her son was a student at the st petersburg university he had a brilliant intellect a most noble unselfish nature and he was the oracle of his comrades early next year she hoped he would join them and they would then go to italy together in any other country but their own she would have been certain of a great future for a man with the extraordinary abilities and the lofty character of her son but in russia the young lady sitting by the window turned her head and said 
come mother even with us things change with years her voice was deep almost harsh and yet caressing in its harshness she had a dark complexion with red lips and a full figure she gave the impression of strong vitality the old lady sighed you are both young you two it is easy for you to hope but i too am not hopeless indeed how could i be with a son like this i addressed miss haldin asking her what authors she wished to read she directed upon me her grey eyes shaded by black eyelashes and i became aware notwithstanding my years how attractive physically her personality could be to a man capable of appreciating in a woman something else than the mere grace of femininity her glance was as direct and trustful as that of a young man yet unspoiled by the world's wise lessons and it was intrepid but in this intrepidity there was nothing aggressive a naive yet thoughtful assurance is a better definition she had reflected already in russia the young begin to think early but she had never known deception as yet because obviously she had never yet fallen under the sway of passion she was to look at her was enough very capable of being roused by an idea or simply by a person at least so i judged with i believe an unbiased mind for clearly my person could not be the person and as to my ideas we became excellent friends in the course of our reading it was very pleasant without fear of provoking a smile i shall confess that i became very much attached to that young girl at the end of four months i told her that now she could very well go on reading english by herself it was time for the teacher to depart my pupil looked unpleasantly surprised mrs haldin with her immobility of feature and kindly expression of the eyes uttered from her armchair in her uncertain french mais l'ami raviandra and so it was settled i returned not four times a week as before but pretty frequently in the autumn we made some short excursions together in company with other russians my friendship with these ladies gave me a standing in the russian colony which otherwise i could not have had the day i saw in the papers the news of mr de p s assassination it was a sunday i met the two ladies in the street and walked with them for some distance mrs holden wore a heavy grey cloak i remember over her black silk dress and her fine eyes met mine with a very quiet expression we have been to the late service she said natalka came with me her girlfriends the students here of course don't with us in russia the church is so identified with oppression that it seems almost necessary when one wishes to be free in this life to give up all hope of a future existence but i cannot give up praying for my son she added with a sort of stony grimness colouring slightly and in french ce n'est peut être qu'une habitude it may be only habit miss haldin was carrying the prayer-book she did not glance at her mother you and victor are both profound believers she said i communicated to them the news from their country which i had just read in a cafe for a whole minute we walked together fairly briskly in silence then mrs haldin murmured there will be more trouble more persecutions for this they may be even closing the university there is neither peace nor rest in russia for one but in the grave yes the way is hard came from the daughter looking straight before her at the chain of jura covered with snow like a white wall closing the end of the street but concord is not so very far off that is what my children think observed mrs haldin to me i did not conceal my feeling that these were strange times to talk of concord natalie haldin surprised me by saying as if she had thought very much on the subject that the occidentals did not understand the situation she was very calm and youthfully superior you think it is a class conflict or a conflict of interests as social contests are with you in europe but it is not that at all it is something quite different it is quite possible that i don't understand i admitted that propensity of lifting every problem from the plane of the understandable by means of some sort of mystic expression is very russian i knew her well enough to have discovered her scorn for all the practical forms of political liberty known to the western world i suppose one must be a russian to understand russian simplicity a terrible corroding simplicity in which mystic phrases clothe a naive and hopeless cynicism i think sometimes that the psychological secret of the profound difference of that people consists in this that they detest life 
the irremediable life of the earth as it is whereas we westerners cherish it with perhaps an equal exaggeration of its sentimental value but this is a digression indeed i helped these ladies into the tram-car and they asked me to call in the afternoon at least mrs holden asked me as she climbed up and her natalka smiled down at the dense westerner indulgently from the rear platform of the moving car the light of the clear wintry forenoon was softened in her grey eyes mr razumov's record like the open book of fate revives for me the memory of that day as something startlingly pitiless in its freedom from all forebodings victor holden was still with the living but with the living whose only contact with life is the expectation of death he must have been already referring to the last of his earthly affections the hours of that obstinate silence which for him was to be prolonged into eternity that afternoon the ladies entertained a good many of their compatriots more than was usual for them to receive at one time and the drawing-room on the ground floor of a large house on the boulevard de philosophes was very much crowded i outstayed everybody and when i rose miss holden stood up too i took her hand and was moved to revert to that morning's conversation in the street admitting that we occidentals do not understand the character of your i began it was as if she had been prepared for me by some mysterious foreknowledge she checked me gently their impulses their she sought the proper expression and found it but in french their mouvements d'ampe her voice was not much above a whisper very well i said but still we are looking at a conflict you say it is not a conflict of classes and not a conflict of interests suppose i admitted that are antagonistic ideas then to be reconciled more easily can they be cemented with blood and violence into that concord which you proclaim to be so near she looked at me searchingly with her clear grey eyes without answering my reasonable question my obvious my unanswerable question it is inconceivable i added with something like annoyance everything is inconceivable she said the whole world is inconceivable to the strict logic of ideas and yet the world exists to our senses and we exist in it there must be a necessity superior to our conceptions it is a very miserable and a very false thing to belong to the majority we russians shall find some better form of national freedom than an artificial conflict of parties which is wrong because it is a conflict and contemptible because it is artificial it is left for us russians to discover a better way mrs holden had been looking out of the window she turned upon me the almost lifeless beauty of her face and the living benign glance of her big dark eyes that's what my children think she declared i suppose i addressed miss holden that you will be shocked if i tell you that i haven't understood i won't say a single word i've understood all the words but what can be this era of disembodied concord you are looking forward to life is a thing of form it has its plastic shape and a definite intellectual aspect the most idealistic conceptions of love and forbearance must be clothed in flesh as it were before they can be made understandable i took my leave of mrs holden whose beautiful lips never stirred she smiled with her eyes only natalie holden went with me as far as the door very amiable mother imagines that i am the slavish echo of my brother victor it is not so he understands me better than i can understand him when he joins us and you come to know him you will see what an exceptional soul it is she paused he is not a strong man in the conventional sense you know she added but his character is without a flaw i believe that it will not be difficult for me to make friends with your brother victor don't expect to understand him quite she said a little maliciously he is not at all at all western at bottom and on this unnecessary warning i left the room with another bow in the doorway to mrs holden in her armchair by the window the shadow of autocracy all unperceived by me had already fallen upon the boulevard de philosophes in the free independent and democratic city of geneva where there is a quarter called la petite Russie. whenever two russians come together the shadow of autocracy is with them tinging their thoughts their views their most intimate feelings their private life their public utterances haunting the secret of their silences what struck me next in the course of a week or so was the silence of these ladies i used to meet them walking in the public garden near the university 
they greeted me with their usual friendliness but i could not help noticing their taciturnity by that time it was generally known that the assassin of m de p had been caught judged and executed so much had been declared officially to the news agencies but for the world at large he remained anonymous the official secrecy had withheld his name from the public i really cannot imagine for what reason one day i saw miss holden walking alone in the main valley of the bastions under the naked trees mother is not very well she explained as mrs holden had it seemed never had a day's illness in her life this indisposition was disquieting it was nothing definite too i think she is fretting because we have not heard from my brother for rather a long time no news good news i said cheerfully and we began to walk slowly side by side not in russia she breathed out so low that i only just caught the words i looked at her with more attention you too are anxious she admitted after a moment of hesitation that she was it is really such a long time since we heard and before i could offer the usual banal suggestions she confided in me oh but it is much worse than that i wrote to a family we know in petersburg they had not seen him for more than a month they thought he was already with us they were even offended a little that he should have left petersburg without calling on them the husband of the lady went at once to his lodgings victor had left there and they did not know his address i remember her catching her breath rather pitifully her brother had not been seen at lectures for a very long time either he only turned up now and then at the university gate to ask the porter for his letters and the gentleman friend was told that the student holden did not come to claim the last two letters for him but the police came to inquire if the student holden ever received any correspondence at the university and took them away my two last letters she said we faced each other a few snowflakes fluttered under the naked boughs the sky was dark what do you think could have happened i asked her shoulders moved slightly one can never tell in russia i saw then the shadow of autocracy lying upon russian lives in their submission or their revolt i saw it touch her handsome open face nestled in a fur collar and darken her clear eyes that shone upon me brilliantly grey in the murky light of a beclouded inclement afternoon let us move on she said it is cold standing to-day she shuddered a little and stamped her little feet we moved briskly to the end of the alley and back to the great gates of the garden have you told your mother i ventured to ask no not yet i came up to walk off the impression of this letter i heard a rustle of paper somewhere it came from her muff she had the letter with her in there what is it that you are afraid of i asked to us europeans of the west all ideas of political plots and conspiracies seem childish crude inventions for the theatre or a novel i did not like to be more definite in my inquiry for us for my mother specially what i am afraid of is incertitude people do disappear yes they do disappear i leave you to imagine what it is the cruelty of the dumb weeks months years this friend of ours has abandoned his inquiries when he heard of the police getting hold of the letters i suppose he was afraid of compromising himself he has a wife and children and why should he after all moreover he is without influential connections and not rich what could he do yes i am afraid of silence for my poor mother she won't be able to bear it for my brother i am afraid of she became almost indistinct of anything we were now near the gate opposite the theatre she raised her voice but lost people do turn up even in russia do you know what my last hope is perhaps the next thing we know we shall see him walking into our rooms i raised my hat and she passed out of the gardens graceful and strong after a slight movement of the head to me her hands in the muff crumpling the cruel petersburg letter on returning home i opened the newspaper i received from london and glancing down the correspondence from russia not the telegrams but the correspondence the first thing that caught my eye was the name of holden mr de p s death was no longer an actuality but the enterprising correspondent was proud of having ferreted out some unofficial information about that fact of modern history he had got hold of holden's name and had picked up the story of the midnight arrest in the street but the sensation from a journalistic point of view was already well in the past he did not allot to it more than twenty lines out of a full column 
it was quite enough to give me a sleepless night i perceived that it would have been a sort of treason to let miss haldin come without preparation upon that journalistic discovery which would infallibly be reproduced on the morrow by french and swiss newspapers i had a very bad time of it till the morning wakeful with nervous worry and nightmarish with the feeling of being mixed up with something theatrical and morbidly affected the incongruity of such a complication in those two women's lives was sensible to me all night in the form of absolute anguish it seemed due to their refined simplicity that it should remain concealed from them for ever arriving at an unconscionably early hour at the door of their apartment i felt as if i were about to commit an act of vandalism the middle-aged servant-woman led me into the drawing-room where there was a duster on a chair and a broom leaning against the centre table the motes danced in the sunshine i regretted i had not written a letter instead of coming myself and was thankful for the brightness of the day miss holden in a plain black dress came lightly out of her mother's room with a fixed uncertain smile on her lips i pulled the paper out of my pocket i did not imagine that a number of the standard could have the effect of medusa's head her face went stony in a moment her eyes her limbs the most terrible thing was that being stony she remained alive one was conscious of her palpitating heart i hope she forgave me the delay of my clumsy circumlocution it was not very prolonged she could not have kept so still from head to foot for more than a second or two and then i heard her draw a breath as if the shock had paralyzed her moral resistance and affected the firmness of her muscles the contours of her face seemed to have given way she was frightfully altered she looked aged ruined but only for a moment she said with decision i am going to tell my mother at once would that be safe in her state i objected what can be worse than the state she has been in for the last month we understand this in another way the crime is not at his door don't imagine i am defending him before you she went to the bedroom door then came back to ask me in a low murmur not to go till she returned for twenty interminable minutes not a sound reached me at last miss holden came out and walked across the room with her quick light step when she reached the armchair she dropped into it heavily as if completely exhausted mrs holden she told me had not shed a tear she was sitting up in bed and her immobility her silence were very alarming at last she lay down gently and had motioned her daughter away she will call me in presently added miss holden i left a bell near the bed i confess that my very real sympathy had no standpoint the western readers for whom this story is written will understand what i mean it was if i may say so the want of experience death is a remorseless spoliator the anguish of irreparable loss is familiar to us all there is no life so lonely as to be safe against that experience but the grief i had brought to these two ladies had gruesome associations it had the associations of bombs and gallows a lurid russian colouring which made the complexion of my sympathy uncertain i was grateful to miss haldin for not embarrassing me by an outward display of deep feeling i admired her for that wonderful command over herself even while i was a little frightened at it it was the stillness of a great tension what if it should suddenly snap even the door of mrs haldin's room with the old mother alone in there had a rather awful aspect natalie holden murmured sadly i suppose you are wondering what my feelings are essentially that was true it was that very wonder which unsettled my sympathy of a dense occidental i could get hold of nothing but of some commonplace phrases those futile phrases that give the measure of our impotence before each other's trials i mumbled something to the effect that for the young life held its hopes and compensations it held duties too but of that i was certain it was not necessary to remind her she had a handkerchief in her hands and pulled at it nervously i am not likely to forget my mother she said we used to be three now we are two two women she's not so very old she may live quite a long time yet what have we to look for in the future for what hope and what consolation you must take a wider view i said resolutely thinking that with this exceptional creature this was the right note to strike she looked at me steadily for a moment and then the tears she had been keeping down flowed unrestrained she jumped up and stood in the window with her back to me 
i slipped away without attempting even to approach her next day i was told at the door that mrs haldin was better the middle-aged servant remarked that a lot of people russians had called that day but miss haldin had not seen anybody a fortnight later when making my daily call i was asked in and found mrs haldin sitting in her usual place by the window at first one would have thought that nothing was changed i saw across the room the familiar profile a little sharper in outline and overspread by a uniform pallor as might have been expected in an invalid but no disease could have accounted for the change in her black eyes smiling no longer with gentle irony she raised them as she gave me her hand i observed the three weeks old number of the standard folded with the correspondence from russia uppermost lying on a little table by the side of the armchair mrs holden's voice was startlingly weak and colourless her first words to me framed a question has there been anything more in papers i released her long emaciated hand shook my head negatively and sat down the english press is wonderful nothing can be kept secret from it and all the world must hear only our russian news is not always easy to understand not always easy but english mothers do not look for news like that she laid her hand on the newspaper and took it away again i said we too have had tragic times in our history a long time ago a very long time ago yes there are nations that have made their bargain with fate said miss haldin who had approached us we need not envy them why this scorn i asked gently it may be that our bargain was not a very lofty one but the terms men and nations obtained from fate are hallowed by the price mrs haldin turned her head away and looked out of the window for a time with that new sombre extinct gaze of her sunken eyes which so completely made another woman of her that englishman this correspondent she addressed me suddenly do you think it is possible that he knew my son to this strange question i could only say that it was possible of course she saw my surprise if one knew what sort of man he was one could perhaps write to him she murmured mother thinks explained miss haldin standing between us with one hand resting on the back of my chair that my poor brother perhaps did not try to save himself i looked up at miss haldin in sympathetic consternation but miss haldin was looking down calmly at her mother the latter said we do not know the address of any of his friends indeed we know nothing of his petersburg comrades he had a multitude of young friends only he never spoke much of them one could guess that they were his disciples and that they idolized him but he was so modest one would think that with so many devoted she averted her head again and looked down the boulevard de philosophes a singularly arid and dusty thoroughfare where nothing could be seen at the moment but two dogs a little girl in a pinafore hopping on one leg and in the distance a workman wheeling a bicycle even amongst the apostles of christ there was found a judas she whispered as if to herself but with the evident intention to be heard by me the russian visitors assembled in little knots conversed amongst themselves meantime in low murmurs and with brief glances in our direction it was a great contrast to the usual loud volubility of these gatherings miss haldin followed me into the anteroom people will come she said we cannot shut the door in their faces while i was putting on my overcoat she began to talk to me of her mother poor mrs haldin was fretting after more news she wanted to go on hearing about her unfortunate son she could not make up her mind to abandon him quietly to the dumb unknown she would persist in pursuing him in there through the long days of motionless silence face to face with the empty boulevard de philosophes she could not understand why he had not escaped as so many other revolutionists and conspirators had managed to escape in other instances of that kind it was really inconceivable that the means of secret revolutionary organizations should have failed so inexcusably to preserve her son but in reality the inconceivable that staggered her mind was nothing but the cruel audacity of death passing over her head to strike at that young and precious heart miss haldin mechanically with an absorbed look handed me my hat i understood from her that the poor woman was possessed by the sombre and simple idea that her son must have perished because he did not want to be saved it could not have been that he despaired of his country's future that was impossible 
was it possible that his mother and sister had not known how to merit his confidence and that having done what he was compelled to do his spirit became crushed by an intolerable doubt his mind distracted by a sudden mistrust i was very much shocked by this piece of ingenuity our three lives were like that miss holden twined the fingers of both her hands together in demonstration then separated them slowly looking straight into my face that's what poor mother found to torment herself and me with for all the years to come added the strange girl at that moment her indefinable charm was revealed to me in the conjunction of passion and stoicism i imagined what her life was likely to be by the side of mrs holden's terrible immobility inhabited by that fixed idea but my concern was reduced to silence by my ignorance of her modes of feeling difference of nationality is a terrible obstacle for our complex western natures but miss holden probably was too simple to suspect my embarrassment she did not wait for me to say anything but as if reading my thoughts on my face she went on courageously at first poor mother went numb as our peasants say then she began to think and she will go on now thinking and thinking in that unfortunate strain you see yourself how cruel that is i never spoke with greater sincerity than when i agreed with her that it would be deplorable in the highest degree she took an anxious breath but all these strange details in the english paper she exclaimed suddenly what is the meaning of them i suppose they are true but is it not terrible that my poor brother should be caught wandering alone as if in despair about the streets at night we stood so close to each other in the dark anteroom that i could see her biting her lower lip to suppress a dry sob after a short pause she said i suggested to mother that he may have been betrayed by some false friend or simply by some cowardly creature it may be easier for her to believe that i understood now the poor woman's whispered allusion to judas it may be easier i admitted admiring inwardly the directness and the subtlety of the girl's outlook she was dealing with life as it was made for her by the political conditions of her country she faced cruel realities not morbid imaginings of her own making i could not defend myself from a certain feeling of respect when she added simply time they say can soften every sort of bitterness but i cannot believe that it has any power over remorse it is better that mother should think some person guilty of victor's death than that she should connect it with a weakness of her son or a shortcoming of her own but you yourself don't suppose that i began she compressed her lips and shook her head she harboured no evil thoughts against any one she declared and perhaps nothing that happened was unnecessary on these words pronounced low and sounding mysterious in the half obscurity of the anteroom we parted with an expressive and warm handshake the grip of her strong shapely hand had a seductive frankness a sort of exquisite virility i do not know why she should have felt so friendly to me it may be that she thought i understood her much better than i was able to the most precise of her sayings seemed always to me to have enigmatical prolongations vanishing somewhere beyond my reach i am reduced to suppose that she appreciated my attention and my silence the attention she could see was quite sincere so that the silence could not be suspected of coldness it seemed to satisfy her and it is to be noted that if she confided in me it was clearly not with the expectation of receiving advice for which indeed she never asked end of part two chapter one recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter two of under western eyes by joseph conrad this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter two our daily relations were interrupted at this period for something like a fortnight i had to absent myself unexpectedly from geneva on my return i lost no time in directing my steps up the boulevard de philosophes through the open door of the drawing-room i was annoyed to hear a visitor holding forth steadily in an unctuous deep voice mrs holden's armchair by the window stood empty on the sofa natalie holden raised her charming grey eyes in a glance of greeting accompanied by the merest hint of a welcoming smile but she made no movement 
with her strong white hands lying inverted in the lap of her morning dress she faced a man who presented to me a robust back covered with black broadcloth and well in keeping with a deep voice he turned his head sharply over his shoulder but only for a moment ah your english friend i know i know that's nothing he wore spectacles with smoked glasses a tall silk hat stood on the floor by the side of his chair flourishing slightly a big soft hand he went on with his discourse precipitating his delivery a little more i have never changed the faith i held while wandering in the forests and bogs of siberia it sustained me then it sustains me now the great powers of europe are bound to disappear and the cause of their collapse will be very simple they will exhaust themselves struggling against their proletariat in russia it is different in russia we have no classes to combat each other one holding the power of wealth and the other mighty with the strength of numbers we have only an unclean bureaucracy in the face of a people as great and as incorruptible as the ocean no we have no classes but we have the russian woman the admirable russian woman i received most remarkable letters signed by women so elevated in tone so courageous breathing such a noble ardour of service the greatest part of our hopes rests on women i behold their thirst for knowledge it is admirable look how they absorb how they are making it their own it is miraculous but what is knowledge i understand that you've not been studying anything especially medicine for instance no that's right had i been honoured by being asked to advise you on the use of your time when you arrived here i would have been strongly opposed to such a course knowledge in itself is mere dross he had one of those bearded russian faces without shape a mere appearance of flesh and hair with not a single feature having any sort of character his eyes being hidden by the dark glasses there was an utter absence of all expression i knew him by sight he was a russian refugee of mark all geneva knew his burly black-coated figure at one time all europe was aware of the story of his life written by himself and translated into seven or more languages in his youth he had led an idle dissolute life then a society girl he was about to marry died suddenly and thereupon he abandoned the world of fashion and began to conspire in a spirit of repentance and after that his native autocracy took good care that the usual thing should happen to him he was imprisoned in fortresses beaten within an inch of his life and condemned to work in mines with common criminals the great success of his book however was the chain i do not remember now the details of the weight and length of the fetters riveted on his limbs by an administrative order but it was in the number of pounds and the thickness of links an appalling assertion of the divine right of autocracy appalling and futile too because this big man managed to carry off that simple engine of government with him into the woods the sensational clink of these fetters is heard all through the chapters describing his escape a subject of wonder to two continents he had begun by concealing himself successfully from his guard in a hole on a river bank it was the end of the day with infinite labour he managed to free one of his legs meantime night fell he was going to begin on his other leg when he was overtaken by a terrible misfortune he dropped his file all this is precise yet symbolic and the file had its pathetic history it was given to him unexpectedly one evening by a quiet pale-faced girl the poor creature had come out to the mines to join one of his fellow convicts a delicate young man a mechanic and a social democrat with broad cheekbones and large staring eyes she had worked her way across half russia and nearly the whole of siberia to be near him and as it seems with the hope of helping him to escape but she arrived too late her lover had died only a week before through that obscure episode as he says in the history of ideas in russia the file came into his hands and inspired him with an ardent resolution to regain his liberty when it slipped through his fingers it was as if it had gone straight into the earth he could by no manner of means put his hand on it again in the dark he groped systematically in the loose earth in the mud in the water the night was passing meantime the precious night on which he counted to get away into the forest his only chance of escape for a moment he was tempted by despair to give up but recalling the quiet sad face of the heroic girl he felt profoundly ashamed of his weakness she had selected him for the gift of liberty and he must show himself worthy of the favour conferred by her feminine indomitable soul it appeared to be a sacred trust 
to fail would have been a sort of treason against the sacredness of self-sacrifice and womanly love there are in his book whole pages of self-analysis whence emerges like a white figure from a dark confused sea a conviction of woman's spiritual superiority his new faith confessed since in several volumes his first tribute to it the great act of his conversion was his extraordinary existence in the endless forests of the okoks province with a loose end of the chain wound about his waist a strip torn off his convict shirt secured the end firmly other strips fastened it at intervals up his left leg to deaden the clanking and to prevent the slack links from getting hooked in the bushes he became very fierce he developed an unsuspected genius for the arts of a wild and hunted existence he learned to creep into villages without betraying his presence by anything more than an occasional faint jingle he broke into outhouses with an axe he managed to purloin in a woodcutter's camp in the deserted tracts of country he lived on wild berries and hunted for honey his clothing dropped off him gradually his naked tawny figure glimpsed vaguely through the bushes with a cloud of mosquitoes and flies hovering about the shaggy head spread tales of terror through whole districts his temper grew savage as the days went by and he was glad to discover that there was so much of a brute in him he had nothing else to put his trust in for it was as though there had been two human beings indissolubly joined in that enterprise the civilized man the enthusiast of advanced humanitarian ideals thirsting for the triumph of spiritual love and political liberty and the stealthy primeval savage pitilessly cunning in the preservation of his freedom from day to day like a tracked wild beast the wild beast was making its way instinctively eastward to the pacific coast and the civilized humanitarian in fearful anxious dependence watched the proceedings with awe through all these weeks he could never make up his mind to appeal to human compassion in the wary primeval savage this shyness might have been natural but the other too the civilized creature the thinker the escaping political had developed an absurd form of morbid pessimism a form of temporary insanity originating perhaps in the physical worry and discomfort of the chain these links he fancied made him odious to the rest of mankind it was a repugnant and suggestive load nobody could feel any pity at the disgusting sight of a man escaping with a broken chain his imagination became affected by his fetters in a precise matter-of-fact manner it seemed to him impossible that people could resist the temptation of fastening the loose end to a staple in the wall while they went for the nearest police official crouching in holes or hidden in thickets he had tried to read the faces of unsuspecting free settlers working in the clearings or passing along the paths within a foot or two of his eyes his feeling was that no man on earth could be trusted with the temptation of the chain one day however he chanced to come upon a solitary woman it was on an open slope of rough grass outside the forest she sat on the bank of a narrow stream she had a red handkerchief on her head and a small basket was lying on the ground near her hand at a little distance could be seen a cluster of log cabins with a water mill over a dammed pool shaded by birch trees and looking bright as glass in the twilight he approached her silently his hatchet stuck in his iron belt a thick cudgel in his hand there were leaves and bits of twig in his tangled hair in his matted beard bunches of rags he had wound round the links fluttered from his waist a faint clink of his fetters made the woman turn her head too terrified by this savage apparition to jump up or even to scream she was yet too stout-hearted to faint expecting nothing less than to be murdered on the spot she covered her eyes with her hands to avoid the sight of the descending axe when at last she found courage to look again she saw the shaggy wild man sitting on the bank six feet away from her his thin sinewy arms hugged his naked legs the long beard covered the knees on which he rested his chin all these clasped folded limbs the bare shoulders the wild head with red staring eyes shook and trembled violently while the bestial creature was making efforts to speak it was six weeks since he had heard the sound of his own voice it seemed as though he had lost the faculty of speech he had become a dumb and despairing brute till the woman's sudden unexpected cry of profound pity the insight of her feminine compassion discovering the complex misery of the man under the terrifying aspect of the monster restored him to the ranks of humanity 
this point of view is presented in his book with a very effective eloquence she ended he says by shedding tears over him sacred redeeming tears while he also wept with joy in the manner of a converted sinner directing him to hide in the bushes and wait patiently a police patrol was expected in the settlement she went away towards the houses promising to return at night as if providentially appointed to be the newly wedded wife of the village blacksmith the woman persuaded her husband to come out with her bringing some tools of his trade a hammer a chisel a small anvil my fetters the book says were struck off on the banks of the stream in the starlight of a calm night by an athletic taciturn young man of the people kneeling at my feet while the woman like a liberating genius stood by with clasped hands obviously a symbolic couple at the same time they furnished his regained humanity with some decent clothing and put heart into the new man by the information that the sea-coast of the pacific was only a very few miles away it could be seen in fact from the top of the next ridge the rest of his escape does not lend itself to mystic treatment and symbolic interpretation he ended by finding his way to the west by the suez canal route in the usual manner reaching the shores of south europe he sat down to write his autobiography the great literary success of its year this book was followed by other books written with a declared purpose of elevating humanity in these works he preached generally the cult of the woman for his own part he practised it under the rites of special devotion to the transcendental merits of a certain madame de s a lady of advanced views no longer very young once upon a time the intriguing wife of a now dead and forgotten diplomat her loud pretensions to be one of the leaders of modern thought and of modern sentiment she sheltered like voltaire and madame de stael on the republican territory of geneva driving through the streets in her big landau she exhibited to the indifference of the natives and the stares of the tourists a long-waisted youthful figure of hieratic stiffness with a pair of big gleaming eyes rolling restlessly behind a short veil of black lace which coming down no further than her vividly red lips resembled a mask usually the heroic fugitive this name was bestowed upon him in a review of the english edition of his book the heroic fugitive accompanied her sitting portentously bearded and darkly bespectacled not by her side but opposite her with his back to the horses thus facing each other with no one else in the roomy carriage their airings suggested a conscious public manifestation or it may have been unconscious russian simplicity often marches innocently on the edge of cynicism for some lofty purpose but it is a vain enterprise for sophisticated europe to try and understand these doings considering the air of gravity extending even to the physiognomy of the coachman and the action of the showy horses this quaint display might have possessed a mystic significance but to the corrupt frivolity of a western mind like my own it seemed hardly decent however it is not becoming for an obscure teacher of languages to criticize a heroic fugitive of world-wide celebrity i was aware from hearsay that he was an industrious busybody hunting up his compatriots in hotels and private lodgings and i was told conferring upon them the honour of his notice in public gardens when a suitable opening presented itself i was under the impression that after a visit or two several months before he had given up the ladies halden no doubt reluctantly for there could be no question of his being a determined person it was perhaps to be expected that he should reappear again on this terrible occasion as a russian and a revolutionist to say the right thing to strike the true perhaps a comforting note but i did not like to see him sitting there i trust that an unbecoming jealousy of my privileged position had nothing to do with it i made no claim to a special standing for my silent friendship removed by the difference of age and nationality as if into the sphere of another existence i produced even upon myself the effect of a dumb helpless ghost of an anxious immaterial thing that could only hover about without the power to protect or guide by as much as a whisper since miss halden with her sure instinct had refrained from introducing me to the burly celebrity i would have retired quietly and returned later on had i not met a peculiar expression in her eyes which i interpreted as a request to stay with the view perhaps of shortening an unwelcome visit he picked up his hat but only to deposit it on his knees we shall meet again natalia victorovna Today I have called only to mark those feelings towards your honoured mother and yourself, the nature of which you cannot doubt. 
I needed no urging, but Eleanor, Madame de S , herself has in a way sent me. She extends to you the hand of feminine fellowship. There is positively in all the range of human sentiments no joy and no sorrow that woman cannot understand, elevate and spiritualize by her interpretation. That young man, newly arrived from St. Petersburg, I have mentioned to you, is already under the charm. At this point, Miss Holding got up abruptly. I was glad. He did not evidently expect anything so decisive, and at first, throwing his head back, he tilted up his dark glasses with bland curiosity. At last, recollecting himself, he stood up hastily, seizing his hat off his knees with great adroitness. How is it, Natalia Viktorovna? that you have kept aloof so long from what after all is let disparaging tongues say what they like a unique centre of intellectual freedom and of effort to shape a high conception of our future in the case of your honoured mother i understand in a measure at her age new ideas new faces are not perhaps but you was it mistrust or indifference you must come out of your reserve we russians have no right to be reserved with each other in our circumstances it is almost a crime against humanity the luxury of private grief is not for us nowadays the devil is not combated by prayers and fasting and what is fasting after all but starvation you must not starve yourself natalia viktorovna strength is what we want spiritual strength i mean as to the other kind what could withstand us russians if we only put it forth sin is different in our day and the way of salvation for pure souls is different too it is no longer to be found in monasteries but in the world in the the deep sound seemed to rise from under the floor and one felt steeped in it to the lips miss haldin's interruption resembled the effort of a drowning person to keep above water she struck in with an accent of impatience but peter ivanovitch i don't mean to retire into a monastery who would look for salvation there i spoke figuratively he boomed well then i am speaking figuratively too but sorrow is sorrow and pain is pain in the old way they make their demands upon people one has got to face them the best way one can i know that the blow which has fallen upon us so unexpectedly is only an episode in the fate of a people you may rest assured that i don't forget that but just now i have to think of my mother how can you expect me to leave her to herself that is putting it in a very crude way he protested in his great effortless voice miss haldin did not wait for the vibration to die out and run about visiting amongst a lot of strange people the idea is distasteful for me and i do not know what else you may mean he towered before her enormous deferential cropped as close as a convict and this big pinkish pole evoked for me the vision of a wild head with matted locks peering through parted bushes glimpses of naked tawny limbs slinking behind the masses of sodden foliage under a cloud of flies and mosquitoes it was an involuntary tribute to the vigour of his writing nobody could doubt that he had wandered in siberian forests naked and girt with a chain the black broadcloth coat invested his person with a character of austere decency something recalling a missionary do you know what i want natalia viktorovna he uttered solemnly i want you to be a fanatic a fanatic yes faith alone won't do his voice dropped to a still lower tone he raised for a moment one thick arm the other remained hanging down against his thigh with a fragile silk hat at the end i shall tell you now something which i entreat you to ponder over carefully listen we need a force that would move heaven and earth nothing less the profound subterranean note of this nothing less made one shudder almost like the deep muttering of wind in the pipes of an organ and are we to find that force in the salon of madame de s excuse me peter ivanovitch if i permit myself to doubt it is not that lady a woman of the great world an aristocrat prejudice he cried you astonish me and suppose she was all that she is also a woman of flesh and blood there is always something to weigh down the spiritual side in all of us but to make of it a reproach is what i did not expect from you no i did not expect that one would think you have listened to some malevolent scandal i have heard no gossip i assure you in our province how could we but the world speaks of her what can there be in common in a lady of that sort an obscure country girl like me she is a perpetual manifestation of a noble and peerless spirit he broke in her charm no i shall not speak of her charm but of course everybody who approaches her falls under the spell 
contradictions vanish trouble falls away from one unless i am mistaken but i never make a mistake in spiritual matters you are troubled in your soul natalia victorovna miss holden's clear eyes looked straight at his soft enormous face i received the impression that behind these dark spectacles of his he could be as impudent as he chose only the other evening walking back to town from chateau borel with our latest interesting arrival from petersburg i could notice the powerful soothing influence i may say reconciling influence there he was all these kilometres along the shores of the lake silent like a man who has been shown the way of peace i could feel the leaven working in his soul you understand for one thing he listened to me patiently i myself was inspired that evening by the firm and exquisite genius of eleanor madame de s you know it was a full moon and i could observe his face i cannot be deceived miss holden looking down seemed to hesitate well i will think of what you said peter ivanovitch i shall try to call as soon as i can leave mother for an hour or two safely coldly as these words were said i was amazed at the concession he snatched her right hand with such fervour that i thought he was going to press it to his lips or his breast but he only held it by the fingertips in his great paw and shook it a little up and down while he delivered his last volley of words that's right that's right i haven't obtained your full confidence as yet natalia victorovna but that will come all in good time the sister of victor holden cannot be without importance it's simply impossible and no woman can remain sitting on the steps flowers tears applause that has had its time it's a medieval conception the arena the arena itself is the place for women he relinquished her hand with a flourish as if giving it to her for a gift and remained still his head bowed in dignified submission before her femininity the arena you must descend into the arena natalia he made one step backwards inclined his enormous body and was gone swiftly the door fell to behind him but immediately the powerful resonance of his voice was heard addressing in the anteroom the middle-aged servant woman who was letting him out whether he exhorted her too to descend into the arena i cannot tell the thing sounded like a lecture and the slight crash of the outer door cut it short suddenly end of part two chapter two recording by expatria in bangor maine part two chapter three of under western eyes by joseph conrad this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter three we remained looking at each other for a time do you know who he is miss holden coming forward put this question to me in english i took her offered hand everybody knows he is a revolutionary feminist a great writer if you like and how shall i say it the the familiar guest of madame de s s mystic revolutionary salon miss haldin passed her hand over her forehead you know he was with me for more than an hour before you came in i was so glad mother was lying down she has many nights without sleep and then sometimes in the middle of the day she gets a rest of several hours it is sheer exhaustion but still i am thankful if it were not for these intervals she looked at me and with that extraordinary penetration which used to disconcert me shook her head no she would not go mad my dear young lady i cried by way of protest the more shocked because in my heart i was far from thinking mrs haldin quite sane you don't know what a fine lucid intellect mother had continued natalie haldin with her calm clear-eyed simplicity which seemed to me always to have a quality of heroism i am sure i murmured i darkened mother's room and came out here i've wanted for so long to think quietly she paused then without giving any sign of distress added it's so difficult and looked at me with a strange fixity as if watching for a sign of dissent or surprise i gave neither i was irresistibly impelled to say the visit from that gentleman has not made it any easier i fear miss holden stood before me with a peculiar expression in her eyes i don't pretend to understand completely some guide one must have even if one does not wholly give up the direction of one's conduct to him i am an inexperienced girl but i am not slavish there has been too much of that in russia why should i not listen to him there is no harm in having one's thoughts directed but i don't mind confessing to you 
that i have not been completely candid with peter ivanovitch i don't quite know what prevented me at the moment she walked away suddenly from me to a distant part of the room but it was only to open and shut a drawer in a bureau she returned with a piece of paper in her hand it was thin and blackened with close handwriting it was obviously a letter i wanted to read you the very words she said this is one of my poor brother's letters he never doubted how could he doubt they make only such a small handful these miserable oppressors before the unanimous will of our people your brother believed in the power of a people's will to achieve anything it was his religion declared miss haldin i looked at her calm face and her animated eyes of course the will must be awakened inspired concentrated she went on that is the true task of real agitators one has got to give up one's life to it the degradation of servitude the absolutist lies must be uprooted and swept out reform is impossible there is nothing to reform there is no legality there are no institutions there are only arbitrary decrees there is only a handful of cruel perhaps blind officials against a nation the letter rustled slightly in her hand i glanced down at the flimsy blackened pages whose very handwriting seemed cabalistic incomprehensible to the experience of western europe stated like this i confess the problem seems simple enough but i fear i shall not see it solved and if you go back to russia i know that i shall not see you again yet once more i say go back don't suppose that i am thinking of your preservation no i know that you will not be returning to personal safety but i had much rather think of you in danger there than see you exposed to what may be met here i tell you what said miss haldin after a moment of reflection i believe that you hate revolution you fancy it's not quite honest you belong to a people which has made a bargain with fate and wouldn't like to be rude to it but we have made no bargain it was never offered to us so much liberty for so much hard cash you shrink from the idea of revolutionary action for those you think well of as if it were something how shall i say it not quite decent i bowed my head you are quite right i said i think very highly of you don't suppose i do not know it she began hurriedly your friendship has been very valuable i have done little else but look on she was a little flushed under the eyes there is a way of looking on which is valuable i have felt less lonely because of it it's difficult to explain really well i too have felt less lonely that's easy to explain though but it won't go on much longer the last thing i want to tell you is this in a real revolution not a simple dynastic change or a mere reform of institutions in a real revolution the best characters do not come to the front a violent revolution falls into the hands of narrow-minded fanatics and of tyrannical hypocrites at first afterwards comes the turn of all the pretentious intellectual failures of the time such are the chiefs and the leaders you will notice that i have left out the mere rogues the scrupulous and the just the noble humane and devoted natures the unselfish and the intelligent may begin a movement but it passes away from them they are not the leaders of a revolution they are its victims the victims of disgust of disenchantment often of remorse hopes grotesquely betrayed ideals caricatured that is the definition of revolutionary success there have been in every revolution hearts broken by such successes but enough of that my meaning is that i don't want you to be a victim if i could believe all you have said i still wouldn't think of myself protested miss haldin i would take liberty from any hand as a hungry man would snatch at a piece of bread the true progress must begin after and for that the right men shall be found they are already amongst us one comes upon them in their obscurity unknown preparing themselves she spread out the letter she had kept in her hand all the time and looking down at it yes one comes upon such men she repeated and then read out the words unstained lofty and solitary existences folding up the letter while i looked at her interrogatively she explained these are the words which my brother applies to a young man he came to know in st petersburg an intimate friend i suppose it must be his is the only name my brother mentions in all his correspondence with me absolutely the only one and would you believe it the man is here he arrived recently in geneva have you seen him i inquired but of course you must have seen him no no i haven't 
i didn't know he was here it's peter ivanovitch himself who told me you have heard him yourself mentioning a new arrival from petersburg well that is the man of unstained lofty and solitary existence my brother's friend compromised politically i suppose i remarked i don't know yes it must be so who knows perhaps it was this very friendship with my brother which but no it is scarcely possible really i know nothing except what peter ivanovitch told me of him he has brought a letter of introduction from father zosim you know the priest democrat you have heard of father zosim oh yes the famous father zosim was staying here in geneva for some two months about a year ago i said when he left here he seems to have disappeared from the world it appears that he is at work in russia again somewhere in the centre miss haldin said with animation but please don't mention that to anyone don't let it slip from you because if it got into the papers it would be dangerous for him you are anxious of course to meet that friend of your brother i asked miss haldin put the letter into her pocket her eyes looked beyond my shoulder at the door of her mother's room not here she murmured not for the first time at least after a moment of silence i said good-bye but miss haldin followed me into the anteroom closing the door behind us carefully i suppose you guess where i mean to go to-morrow you have made up your mind to call on madame de s yes i am going to the chateau borel i must what do you expect to hear there i asked in a low voice i wondered if she were not deluding herself with some impossible hope it was not that however only think such a friend the only man mentioned in his letters he would have something to give me if nothing more than a few poor words it may be something said and thought in those last days would you want me to turn my back on what is left of my poor brother a friend certainly not i said i quite understand your pious curiosity unstained lofty and solitary existences she murmured to herself there are there are well let me question one of them about the loved dead how do you know though that you will meet him there is he staying at the chateau as a guest do you suppose i can't really tell she confessed he brought a written introduction from father zosim who it seems is a friend of madame de s too she can't be such a worthless woman after all there were all sorts of rumours afloat about father zosim himself i observed she shrugged her shoulders calumny is a weapon of our government too it's well known oh yes it is a fact that father zosim had the protection of the governor-general of a certain province we talked on the subject with my brother two years ago i remember but his work was good and now he is proscribed what better proof can one require but no matter what that priest was or is all that cannot affect my brother's friend if i don't meet him there i shall ask these people for his address and of course mother must see him too later on there is no guessing what he may have to tell us it would be a mercy if mamma could be soothed you know what she imagines some explanation perhaps may be found or or even made up perhaps it would be no sin certainly i said it would be no sin it may be a mistake though i want her only to recover some of her old spirit while she is like this i cannot think of anything calmly do you mean to invent some sort of pious fraud for your mother's sake i asked why fraud such a friend is sure to know something of my brother in these last days he could tell us there is something in the facts which will not let me rest i am certain he meant to join us abroad that he had some plans some great patriotic action in view not only for himself but for both of us i trusted in that i looked forward to the time oh with such hope and impatience i could have helped and now suddenly this appearance of recklessness as if he had not cared she remained silent for a time then obstinately she concluded i want to know thinking it over later on while i walked slowly away from the boulevard de philosophes i asked myself critically what precisely was it that she wanted to know what i had heard of her history was enough to give me a clue in the educational establishment for girls where miss haldin finished her studies she was looked upon rather unfavourably she was suspected of holding independent views on matters settled by official teaching afterwards when the two ladies returned to their country place both mother and daughter by speaking their minds openly on public events had earned for themselves a reputation of liberalism the three-horse trap of the district police captain began to be seen frequently in their village i must keep an eye on the peasants so he explained his visits up at the house 
two lonely ladies must be looked after a little he would inspect the walls as though he wanted to pierce them with his eyes peer at the photographs turn over the books in the drawing-room negligently and after the usual refreshments would depart but the old priest of the village came one evening in the greatest distress and agitation to confess that he the priest had been ordered to watch and ascertain in other ways too such as using his spiritual power with the servants all that was going on in the house and especially in respect of the visitors these ladies received who they were the length of their stay whether any of them were strangers to that part of the country and so on the poor simple old man was in an agony of humiliation and terror i came to warn you be cautious in your conduct for the love of god i am burning with shame but there is no getting out from under the net i shall have to tell them what i see because if i did not there is my deacon he would make the worst of things to curry favour and then my son-in-law the husband of my parasha who was a writer in the government domain office they would soon kick him out and maybe send him away somewhere the old man lamented the necessities of the times when people do not agree somehow and wiped his eyes he did not wish to spend the evening of his days with a shaven head in the penitent cell of some monastery and subjected to all the severities of ecclesiastical discipline for they would show no mercy to an old man he groaned he became almost hysterical and the two ladies full of commiseration soothed him the best they could before they let him go back to his cottage but as a matter of fact they had very few visitors the neighbours some of them old friends began to keep away a few from timidity others with marked disdain being grand people that came only for the summer miss holden explained to me aristocrats reactionaries it was a solitary existence for a young girl her relations with her mother were of the tenderest and most open kind but mrs holden had seen the experiences of her own generation its sufferings its deceptions its apostasies too her affection for her children was expressed by the suppression of all signs of anxiety she maintained a heroic reserve natalie holden her brother with his petersburg existence not enigmatical in the least there could be no doubt of what he felt or thought but conducted a little mysteriously was the only visible representative of a proscribed liberty all the significance of freedom its indefinite promises lived in their long discussions which breathed the loftiest hope of action and faith in success then suddenly the action the hopes came to an end with the details ferreted out by the english journalist the concrete fact the fact of his death remained but it remained obscure in its deeper causes she felt herself abandoned without explanation but she did not suspect him what she wanted was to learn almost at any cost how she could remain faithful to his departed spirit end of part two chapter three recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter four of under western eyes by joseph conrad this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter four several days elapsed before i met natalie holden again i was crossing the place in front of the theatre when i made out her shapely figure in the very act of turning between the gate pillars of the unattractive public promenade of the bastions she walked away from me but i knew we should meet as she returned down the main alley unless indeed she were going home in that case i don't think i should have called on her yet my desire to keep her away from these people was as strong as ever but i had no illusions as to my power i was but a westerner and it was clear that miss holden would not could not listen to my wisdom and as to my desire of listening to her voice it were better i thought not to indulge overmuch in that pleasure no i should not have gone to the boulevard des philosophes but when at about the middle of the principal alley i saw miss holden coming towards me i was too curious and too honest perhaps to run away there was something of the spring harshness in the air the blue sky was hard but the young leaves clung like soft mist about the uninteresting range of trees and the clear sun put little points of gold into the grey of miss holden's frank eyes turned to me with a friendly greeting i inquired after the health of her mother she had a slight movement of her shoulders and a little sad sigh but you see i did come out for a walk for exercise as you english say 
i smiled approvingly and she added an unexpected remark it is a glorious day her voice slightly harsh but fascinating with its masculine and bird-like quality had the accent of spontaneous conviction i was glad of it it was as though she had become aware of her youth for there was but little of spring-like glory in the rectangular railed space of grass and trees framed visibly by the orderly roof slopes of that town comely without grace and hospitable without sympathy in the very air through which she moved there was but little warmth and the sky the sky of a land without horizons swept and washed clean by the april showers extended a cold cruel blue without elevation narrowed suddenly by the ugly dark wall of the jura where here and there lingered a few miserable trails and patches of snow all the glory of the season must have been within herself and i was glad this feeling had come into her life if only for a little time i am pleased to hear you say these words she gave me a quick look quick not stealthy if there is one thing of which she was absolutely incapable it was stealthiness her sincerity was expressed in the very rhythm of her walk it was i who was looking at her covertly if i may say so i knew where she had been but i did not know what she had seen and heard in that nest of aristocratic conspiracies i use the word aristocratic for want of a better term the chateau borel embowered in the trees and thickets of its neglected grounds had its fame in our day like the residence of that other dangerous and exiled woman madame de stael in the napoleonic era only the napoleonic despotism the booted heir of the revolution which counted that intellectual woman for an enemy worthy to be watched was something quite unlike the autocracy in mystic vestments engendered by the slavery of a tartar conquest and madame de s was very far from resembling the gifted author of corinne she made a great noise about being persecuted i don't know if she were regarded in certain circles as dangerous as to being watched i imagine that the chateau borel could be subjected only to a most distant observation it was in its exclusiveness an ideal abode for hatching superior plots whether serious or futile but all this did not interest me i wanted to know the effect its extraordinary inhabitants and its special atmosphere had produced on a girl like miss holden so true so honest but so dangerously inexperienced her unconsciously lofty ignorance of the baser instincts of mankind left her disarmed before her own impulses and there was also that friend of her brother the significant new arrival from russia i wondered whether she had managed to meet him we walked for some time slowly and in silence you know i attacked her suddenly if you don't intend telling me anything you must say so distinctly and then of course it shall be final but i won't play at delicacy i ask you point-blank for all the details she smiled faintly at my threatening tone you are as curious as a child no i am only an anxious old man i replied earnestly she rested her glance on me as if to ascertain the degree of my anxiety or the number of my years my physiognomy has never been expressive i believe and as to my years i am not ancient enough as yet to be strikingly decrepit i have no long beard like the good hermit of a romantic ballad my footsteps are not tottering my aspect not that of a slow venerable sage those picturesque advantages are not mine i am old alas in a brisk commonplace way and it seemed to me as though there was some pity for me in miss holden's prolonged glance she stepped out a little quicker you ask for all the details let me see i ought to remember them it was novel enough for a a village girl like me after a moment of silence she began by saying that the chateau borel was almost as neglected inside as outside it was nothing to wonder at a hamburg banker i believe retired from business had it built to cheer his remaining days by the view of that lake whose precise orderly and well-to-do beauty must have been attractive to the unromantic imagination of a business man but he died soon his wife departed too but only to italy and this house of moneyed ease presumably unsaleable had stood empty for several years one went to it up a gravel drive round a large coarse grass plot with plenty of time to observe the degradation of its stuccoed front miss holden said that the impression was unpleasant it grew more depressing as one came nearer she observed green stains of moss on the steps of the terrace the front door stood wide open there was no one about 
she found herself in a wide lofty and absolutely empty hall with a good many doors these doors were all shut a broad bare stone staircase faced her and the effect of the whole was of an untenanted house she stood still disconcerted by the solitude but after a while she became aware of a voice speaking continuously somewhere you were probably being observed all the time i suggested there must have been eyes i don't see how that could be she retorted i haven't seen even a bird in the grounds i don't remember hearing a single twitter in the trees the whole place appeared utterly deserted except for the voice she could not make out the language russian french or german no one seemed to answer it it was as though the voice had been left behind by the departed inhabitants to talk to the bare walls it went on volubly with a pause now and then it was lonely and sad the time seemed very long to miss haldin an invincible repugnance prevented her from opening one of the doors in the hall it was so hopeless no one would come the voice would never stop she confessed to me that she had to resist an impulse to turn around and go away unseen as she had come really you had that impulse i cried full of regret what a pity you did not obey it she shook her head what a strange memory it would have been for one those deserted grounds that empty hall that impersonal voluble voice and nobody nothing not a soul the memory would have been unique and harmless but she was not a girl to run away from an intimidating impression of solitude and mystery no i did not run away she said i stayed where i was and i did see a soul such a strange soul as she was gazing up the broad staircase and had concluded that the voice came from somewhere above a rustle of dress attracted her attention she looked down and saw a woman crossing the hall having issued apparently through one of the many doors her face was averted so that at first she was not aware of miss holden on turning her head and seeing a stranger she appeared very much startled from her slender figure miss holden had taken her for a young girl but if her face was almost childishly round it was also sallow and wrinkled with dark rings under the eyes a thick crop of dusty brown hair was parted boyishly on the side with a lateral wave above the dry furrowed forehead after a moment of dumb blinking she suddenly squatted down on the floor what do you mean by squatted down i asked astonished this is a very strange detail miss holden explained the reason this person when first seen was carrying a small bowl in her hand she had squatted down to put it on the floor for the benefit of a large cat which appeared then from behind her skirts and hid its head into the bowl greedily she got up and approaching miss holden asked with nervous bluntness what do you want who are you miss holden mentioned her name and also the name of peter ivanovitch the girlish elderly woman nodded and puckered her face into a momentary expression of sympathy her black silk blouse was old and even frayed in places the black serge skirt was short and shabby she continued to blink at close quarters and her eyelashes and eyebrows seemed shabby too miss haldin speaking gently to her as if to an unhappy and sensitive person explained how it was that her visit could not be an altogether unexpected event to madame de s ah peter ivanovitch brought you an invitation how was i to know madame de compagnie is not consulted as you may imagine the shabby woman laughed a little her teeth splendidly white and admirably even looked absurdly out of place like a string of pearls on the neck of a ragged tramp peter ivanovitch is the greatest genius of the century perhaps but he is the most inconsiderate man living so if you have an appointment with him you must not be surprised to hear that he is not here miss holden explained that she had no appointment with peter ivanovitch she became interested at once in that bizarre person why should he put himself out for you or any one else oh these geniuses if you only knew yes and their books i mean of course the books that the world admires the inspired books but you have not been behind the scenes wait till you have to sit at a table for a half a day with a pen in your hand he can walk up and down his rooms for hours and hours i used to get so stiff and numb that i was afraid i would lose my balance and fall off the chair all at once she kept her hands folded in front of her and her eyes fixed on miss holden's face betrayed no animation whatever 
miss haldin gathering that the lady who called herself a dame de compagnie was proud of having acted as secretary to peter ivanovitch made an amiable remark you could not imagine a more trying experience declared the lady there is an anglo-american journalist interviewing madame de s now or i would take you up she continued in a changed tone and glancing towards the staircase i act as master of ceremonies it appeared that madame de s could not bear swiss servants about her person and indeed servants would not stay for very long in the chateau borel there were always difficulties miss holden had already noticed that the hall was like a dusty barn of marble and stucco with cobwebs in the corners and faint tracks of mud on the black and white tessellated floor i look also after this animal continued the dame de compagnie keeping her hands folded quietly in front of her and she bent her worn gaze upon the cat i don't mind a bit animals have their rights though strictly speaking i see no reason why they should not suffer as well as human beings do you but of course they never suffer so much that is impossible only in their case it is more pitiful because they cannot make a revolution i used to be a republican i suppose you are a republican miss holden confessed to me that she did not know what to say but she nodded slightly and asked in her turn and are you no longer a republican after taking down peter ivanovitch from dictation for two years it is difficult for me to be anything first of all you have to sit perfectly motionless the slightest movement you make puts to flight the ideas of peter ivanovitch you hardly dare to breathe and as to coughing god forbid peter ivanovitch changed the position of the table to the wall because at first i could not help raising my eyes to look out of the window while waiting for him to go on with his dictation that was not allowed he said i stared so stupidly i was likewise not permitted to look at him over my shoulder instantly peter ivanovitch stamped his foot and would roar look down on the paper it seems my expression my face put him off well i know that i am not beautiful and that my expression is not hopeful either he said that my air of unintelligent expectation irritated him these are his own words miss haldin was shocked but admitted to me that she was not altogether surprised is it possible that peter ivanovitch could treat any woman so rudely she cried the dame de compagnie nodded several times with an air of discretion then assured miss haldin that she did not mind in the least the trying part of it was to have the secret of the composition laid bare before her to see the great author of the revolutionary gospels grope for words as if he were in the dark as to what he meant to say i am quite willing to be the blind instrument of higher ends to give one's life for the cause is nothing but to have one's illusions destroyed that is really almost more than one can bear i really don't exaggerate she insisted it seemed to freeze my very beliefs in me the more so that when we worked in winter peter ivanovitch walking up and down the room required no artificial heat to keep himself warm even when we moved to the south of france there are bitterly cold days especially when you have to sit still for six hours at a stretch the walls of these villas on the riviera are so flimsy peter ivanovitch did not seem to be aware of anything it is true that i kept down my shivers from fear of putting him out i used to set my teeth till my jaws felt absolutely locked in the moments when peter ivanovitch interrupted his dictation and sometimes these intervals were very long often twenty minutes no less while he walked to and fro behind my back muttering to himself i felt i was dying by inches i assure you perhaps if i had let my teeth rattle peter ivanovitch might have noticed my distress but i don't think it would have had any practical effect she's very miserly in such matters the dame de compagnie glanced up the staircase the big cat had finished the milk and was rubbing its whiskered cheek sinuously against her skirt she dived to snatch it up from the floor miserliness is rather a quality than otherwise you know she continued holding the cat in her folded arms with us it is misers who can spare money for worthy objects not the so-called generous natures but pray don't think i am a sybarite my father was a clerk in the ministry of finances with no position at all you may guess by this that our home was far from luxurious though of course we did not actually suffer from cold i ran away from my parents you know directly i began to think by myself it is not very easy such thinking one has got to be put in the way of it awakened to the truth i am indebted for my salvation to an old apple woman who had her stall under the gateway of the house we lived in she had a kind wrinkled face and the most friendly voice imaginable one day casually we began to talk about a child 
a ragged little girl we had seen begging from men in the streets at dusk and from one thing to another my eyes began to open gradually to the horrors from which innocent people are made to suffer in this world only in order that governments might exist after i once understood the crime of the upper classes i could not go on living with my parents not a single charitable word was to be heard in our home from year's end to year's end there was nothing but the talk of vile office intrigues and of promotion and of salaries and of courting the favour of the chiefs the mere idea of marrying one day such another man as my father made me shudder i don't mean that there was any one wanting to marry me there was not the slightest prospect of anything of the kind but was it not sin enough to live on a government salary while half russia was dying of hunger the ministry of finances what a grotesque horror it is what does the starving ignorant people want with a ministry of finances i kissed my old folks on both cheeks and went away from them to live in cellars with the proletariat i tried to make myself useful to the utterly hopeless i suppose you understand what i mean i mean the people who have nowhere to go and nothing to look forward to in this life do you understand how frightful that is nothing to look forward to sometimes i think that it is only in russia that there are such people and such a depth of misery can be reached well i plunged into it and do you know there isn't much that one can do in there no indeed at least as long as there are ministries of finances and such like grotesque horrors to stand in the way i suppose i would have gone mad there just trying to fight the vermin if it had not been for a man it was my old friend and teacher the poor saintly apple woman who discovered him for me quite accidentally she came to fetch me late one evening in her quiet way i followed her where she would lead that part of my life was in her hands altogether and without her my spirit would have perished miserably the man was a young workman a lithographer by trade and he had got into trouble in connection with that affair of temperance tracts you remember there was a lot of people put in prison for that the ministry of finances again what would become of it if the poor folk ceased making beasts of themselves with drink upon my word i would think that finances and all the rest of it are an invention of the devil only that a belief in a supernatural source of evil is not necessary men alone are quite capable of every wickedness finances indeed hatred and contempt hissed in her utterance of the word finances but at the very moment she gently stroked the cat reposing in her arms she even raised them slightly and inclining her head rubbed her cheek against the fur of the animal which received this caress with a complete detachment so characteristic of its kind then looking at miss haldin she excused herself once more for not taking her upstairs to madame s the interview could not be interrupted presently the journalist would be seen coming down the stairs the best thing was to remain in the hall and besides all these rooms she glanced all round at the many doors all these rooms on the ground floor were unfurnished positively there is no chair down here to offer you she continued but if you prefer your own thoughts to my chatter i will sit down on the bottom step here and keep silent miss holden hastened to assure her that on the contrary she was very much interested in the story of the journeyman lithographer he was a revolutionist of course a martyr a simple man said the dame de compagnie with a faint sigh and gazing through the open front door dreamily she turned her misty brown eyes on miss holden i lived with him for four months it was like a nightmare as miss holden looked at her inquisitively she began to describe the emaciated face of the man his fleshless limbs his destitution the room into which the apple woman had led her was a tiny garret a miserable den under the roof of a sordid house the plaster fallen off the walls covered the floor and when the door was opened a horrible tapestry of black cobwebs waved in the draught he had been liberated a few days before flung out of prison into the streets and miss holden seemed to see for the first time a name and a face upon the body of that suffering people whose hard fate had been the subject of so many conversations between her and her brother in the garden of their country house he had been arrested with scores and scores of other people in that affair of the lithograph temperance tracts unluckily having got hold of a great many suspected persons the police thought they could extract from some of them other information relating to the revolutionist propaganda they beat him so cruelly in the course of investigation went on the dame de compagnie that they injured him internally when they had done with him he was doomed he could do nothing for himself i beheld him lying on a wooden bedstead without any bedding 
with his head on a bundle of dirty rags lent to him out of charity by an old rag picker who happened to live in the basement of the house there he was uncovered burning with fever and there was not even a jug in the room for the water to quench his thirst with there was nothing whatever just that bedstead and the bare floor was there no one in all that great town amongst the liberals and revolutionaries to extend a helping hand to a brother asked miss haldin indignantly yes but you do not know the most terrible part of that man's misery listen it seems that they ill-used him so atrociously that at last his firmness gave way and he did let out some information poor soul the flesh is weak you know what it was he did not tell me there was a crushed spirit in that mangled body nothing i found to say could make him whole when they let him out he crept into that hole and bore his remorse stoically he would not go near any one he knew i would have sought assistance for him but indeed where could i have gone looking for it where was i to look for any one who had anything to spare or any power to help the people living round us were all starving and drunken they were the victims of the ministry of finances don't ask me how we lived i couldn't tell you it was like a miracle of wretchedness i had nothing to sell and i assure you my clothes were in such a state that it was impossible for me to go out in the daytime i was indecent i had to wait till it was dark before i ventured into the streets to beg for a crust of bread or whatever i could get to keep him and me alive often i got nothing and then i would crawl back and lie on the floor by the side of his couch oh yes i can sleep quite soundly on bare boards that is nothing and i am only mentioning it to you so that you should not think i am a sybarite it was infinitely less killing than the task of sitting for hours at a table in a cold study to take the books of peter ivanovitch from dictation but you shall see yourself what that is like so i needn't say any more about it it is by no means certain that i will ever take peter ivanovitch from dictation said miss haldin no cried the other incredulously not certain you mean to say that you have not made up your mind when miss haldin assured her that there never had been any question of that between her and peter ivanovitch the woman with the cat compressed her lips tightly for a moment oh you will find yourself settled at the table before you know that you have made up your mind don't make a mistake it is disenchanting to hear peter ivanovitch dictate but at the same time there is a fascination about it he is a man of genius your face is certain not to irritate him you may perhaps even help his inspiration make it easier for him to deliver his message as i look at you i feel certain that you are the kind of woman who is not likely to check the flow of his inspiration miss haldin thought it useless to protest against all these assumptions but this man this workman did he die under your care she said after a short silence End of Part 2, Chapter 4, Section 1 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Part 2, Chapter 4, Section 2 of Under Western Eyes by Joseph Conrad This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Part 2, Chapter 4, Section 2 the dame de compagnie listening up the stairs where now two voices were alternating with some animation made no answer for a time when the loud sounds of the discussion had sunk into an almost inaudible murmur she turned to miss haldin yes he died but not literally speaking in my arms as you might suppose as a matter of fact i was asleep when he breathed his last so even now i cannot say i have seen anybody die a few days before the end some young men found us out in our extremity they were revolutionists as you might guess he ought to have trusted in his political friends when he came out of prison he had been liked and respected before and nobody would have dreamed of reproaching him with his indiscretion before the police everybody knows how they go to work and the strongest man has his moments of weakness before pain why even hunger alone is enough to give one queer ideas as to what may be done a doctor came our lot was alleviated as far as physical comforts go but otherwise he could not be consoled poor man i assure you miss haldin that he was very lovable but i had not the strength to weep i was nearly dead myself but there were kind hearts to take care of me a dress was found to clothe my nakedness i tell you i was not decent and after a time the revolutionists placed me with a jewish family going abroad as governess of course i could teach the children i finished the sixth class of the lyceum 
but the real object was that i should carry some important papers across the frontier i was entrusted with a packet which i carried next my heart the gendarmes at the station did not suspect the governess of a jewish family busy looking after three children i don't suppose those hebrews knew what i had on me for i had been introduced to them in a very roundabout way by persons who did not belong to the revolutionary movement and naturally i had been instructed to accept a very small salary when we reached germany i left that family and delivered my papers to a revolutionist in stuttgart after this i was employed in various ways but you do not want to hear all that i have never felt that i was very useful but i live in hopes of seeing all the ministries destroyed finances and all the greatest joy of my life has been to hear what your brother has done she directed her round eyes again to the sunshine outside while the cat reposed within her folded arms in lordly beatitude and sphinx-like meditation yes i rejoice she began again for me there is a heroic ring about the very name of holden they must have been trembling with fear in their ministries all those men with fiendish hearts here i stand talking to you and when i think of all the cruelties oppressions and injustices that are going on at this very moment my head begins to swim i have looked closely at what would seem inconceivable if one's own eyes had not to be trusted i have looked at things that made me hate myself for my helplessness i hated my hands that had no power my voice that could not be heard my very mind that would not become unhinged ah i have seen things and you miss holden was moved she shook her head slightly no i have seen nothing for myself as yet she murmured we have always lived in the country it was my brother's wish it is a curious meeting this between you and me continued the other do you believe in chance miss holden how could i have expected to see you his sister with my own eyes do you know that when the news came the revolutionaries here were as much surprised as pleased every bit no one seemed to know anything about your brother peter ivanovitch himself had not foreseen that such a blow was going to be struck i suppose your brother was simply inspired i myself think that such deeds should be done by inspiration it is a great privilege to have the inspiration and the opportunity did he resemble you at all don't you rejoice miss holden you must not expect too much from me said miss holden repressing an inclination to cry which came over her suddenly she succeeded then added calmly i am not a heroic person you think you couldn't have done such a thing yourself perhaps i don't know i must not even ask myself till i have lived a little longer seen more the other moved her head appreciatively the purring of the cat had a loud complacency in the empty hall no sound of voices came from upstairs miss holden broke the silence what is it precisely that you heard people say about my brother you said that they were surprised yes i suppose they were did it not seem strange to them that my brother should have failed to save himself after the most difficult part that is getting away from the spot was over conspirators should understand these things well there are reasons why i am very anxious to know how it is he failed to escape the dame de compagnie had advanced to the open hall door she glanced rapidly over her shoulder at miss holden who remained within the hall failed to escape she repeated absently didn't he make the sacrifice of his life wasn't he just simply inspired wasn't it an act of abnegation aren't you certain what i am certain of said miss holden is that it was not an act of despair have you not heard some opinion expressed here upon his miserable capture the dame de compagnie mused for a while in the doorway did i hear of course everything is discussed here has not all the world been speaking about your brother for my part the mere mention of his achievement plunges me into an envious ecstasy why should a man certain of immortality think of his life at all she kept her back turned to miss holden upstairs from behind a great dingy white and gold door visible behind the balustrade of the first floor landing a deep voice began to drone formally as if reading over notes or something of the sort it paused frequently and then ceased altogether i don't think i can stay any longer now said miss holden i may return another day she waited for the dame de compagnie to make room for her exit but the woman appeared lost in the contemplation of sunshine and shadows sharing between themselves the stillness of the deserted grounds she concealed the view of the drive from miss holden suddenly she said it will not be necessary here is peter ivanovitch himself coming up but he is not alone he is seldom alone now 
hearing that peter ivanovitch was approaching miss haldin was not so pleased as she might have been expected to be somehow she had lost the desire to see either the heroic captive or madame de s and the reason of that shrinking which came upon her at the very last minute is accounted for by the feeling that those two people had not been treated the woman with a cat kindly would you please let me pass said miss haldin at last touching lightly the shoulder of the dame de compagnie but the other pressing the cat to her breast did not budge i know who is with him she said without even looking back more unaccountably than ever miss haldin felt a strong impulse to leave the house madame de s may be engaged for some time yet and what i have got to say to peter ivanovitch is just a simple question which i might put to him when i meet him in the grounds on my way down i really think i must go i have been some time here and i am anxious to get back to my mother will you let me pass please the dame de compagnie turned her head at last i never supposed that you really wanted to see madame de s she said with unexpected insight not for a moment there was something confidential and mysterious in her tone she passed through the door with miss haldin following her on to the terrace and they descended side by side the moss-grown stone steps there was no one to be seen on the part of the drive visible from the front of the house they are hidden by the trees over there explained miss haldin's new acquaintance but you shall see them directly i don't know who that young man is to whom peter ivanovitch has taken such a fancy he must be one of us or he would not be admitted here when the others come you know what i mean by the others but i must say that he is not at all mystically inclined i don't know that i have made him out yet naturally i am never for very long in the drawing-room there is always something to do for me though the establishment here is not so extensive as the villa on the riviera but still there are plenty of opportunities for me to make myself useful to the left passing by the ivy-grown end of the stables appeared peter ivanovitch and his companion they walked very slowly conversing with some animation they stopped for a moment and peter ivanovitch was seen to gesticulate while the young man listened motionless with his arms hanging down and his head bowed a little he was dressed in a dark brown suit and a black hat the round eyes of the dame de compagnie remained fixed on the two figures which had resumed their leisurely approach an extremely polite young man she said you shall see what a bow he will make and it won't altogether be so exceptional either he bows in the same way when he meets me alone in the hall she moved on a few steps with miss haldin by her side and things happened just as she had foretold the young man took off his hat bowed and fell back while peter ivanovitch advanced quicker his black thick arms extended heartily and seized hold of both miss haldin's hands shook them and peered at her through his dark glasses that's right that's right he exclaimed twice approvingly and so you have been looked after by he frowned slightly at the dame de compagnie who was still nursing the cat i conclude eleanor madame de s is engaged i know she expected somebody to-day so the newspaper man did turn up eh she is engaged for all answer the dame de compagnie turned away her head it is very unfortunate very unfortunate indeed i very much regret that you should have been he lowered suddenly his voice but what is it surely you are not departing natalia victorovna you got bored waiting didn't you not in the least miss haldin protested only i have been here some time and i am anxious to get back to my mother the time seemed long eh i am afraid our worthy friend here peter ivanovitch suddenly jerked his head sideways towards his right shoulder and jerked it up again a worthy friend here has not the art of shortening the moments of waiting no distinctly she has not the art and in that respect good intentions alone count for nothing the dame de compagnie dropped her arms and the cat found itself suddenly on the ground it remained quite still after alighting one hind leg stretched backwards miss haldin was extremely indignant on behalf of the lady companion believe me peter ivanovitch that the moments i have passed in the hall of this house have been not a little interesting and very instructive too they are memorable i do not regret the waiting but i see that the object of my call here can be attained without taking up madame de s s time at this point i interrupted miss haldin the above relation is founded on her narrative which i have not so much dramatized as might be supposed she had rendered with extraordinary feeling and animation the very accent almost of the disciple of the old apple-woman 
the irreconcilable hater of ministries the voluntary servant of the poor miss haldin's true and delicate humanity had been extremely shocked by the uncongenial fate of her new acquaintance that lady companion secretary whatever she was for my own part i was pleased to discover in it one more obstacle to intimacy with madame de s i had a positive abhorrence for the painted bedizened dead-faced glassy-eyed egeria of peter ivanovitch i do not know what was her attitude to the unseen but i know that in the affairs of this world she was avaricious greedy and unscrupulous it was within my knowledge that she had been worsted in a sordid and desperate quarrel about money matters with the family of her late husband the diplomatist some very august personages indeed whom in her fury she had insisted upon scandalously involving in her affairs had incurred her animosity i find it perfectly easy to believe that she had come to within an ace of being spirited away for reasons of state into some discreet maison de sainte a madhouse of sorts to be plain it appears however that certain high-placed personages opposed it for reasons which but it's no use to go into details wonder may be expressed at a man in the position of a teacher of languages knowing all this with such definiteness a novelist says this and that of his personages and if only he knows how to say it earnestly enough he may not be questioned upon the inventions of his brain in which his own belief is made sufficiently manifest by a telling phrase a poetic image the accent of emotion art is great but i have no art and not having invented madame de s i feel bound to explain how i came to know so much about her my informant was the russian wife of a friend of mine already mentioned the professor of lausanne university it was from her that i learned the last fact of madame de s s history with which i intend to trouble my readers she told me speaking positively as a person who trusts her sources of the cause of madame de s s flight from russia some years before it was neither more nor less than this that she became suspect to the police in connection with the assassination of the emperor alexander the ground of this suspicion was either some unguarded expressions that escaped her in public or some talk overheard in her salon overheard we must believe by some guest perhaps a friend who hastened to play the informer i suppose at any rate the overheard matter seemed to imply her foreknowledge of that event and i think she was wise in not waiting for the investigation of such a charge some of my readers may remember a little book from her pen published in paris a mystically bad-tempered declamatory and frightfully disconnected piece of writing in which she all but admits the foreknowledge more than hints at its supernatural origin and plainly suggests in venomous innuendos that the guilt of the act was not with a terrorist but with a palace intrigue when i observed to my friend the professor's wife that the life of madame de s with its unofficial diplomacy its intrigues lawsuits favours disgrace expulsions its atmosphere of scandal occultism and charlatanism was more fit for the eighteenth century than for the conditions of our own time she assented with a smile but a moment after went on in a reflective tone charlatanism yes in a certain measure still times are changed there are forces now which were non-existent in the eighteenth century i should not be surprised if she were more dangerous than an englishman would be willing to believe and what's more she is looked upon as really dangerous by certain people chez nous chez nous in this connection meant russia in general and the russian political police in particular the object of my digression from the straight course of miss holden's relation in my own words of her visit to the chateau borel was to bring forward that statement of my friend the professor's wife i wanted to bring it forward simply to make what i have to say presently of mr razumov's presence in geneva a little more credible for this is a russian story for western ears which as i have observed already are not attuned to certain tones of cynicism and cruelty of moral negation and even of moral distress already silenced at our end of europe in this i state as my excuse for having left miss holden standing one of the little group of two women and two men who had come together below the terrace of the chateau borel the knowledge which i have just stated was in my mind when as i have said i interrupted miss holden i interrupted her with a cry of profound satisfaction so you never saw madame de s after all miss holden shook her head it was very satisfactory to me 
she had not seen madame de s that was excellent excellent i welcomed the conviction that she would never know madame de s now i could not explain the reason of the conviction but by the knowledge that miss haldin was standing face to face with her brother's wonderful friend i preferred him to madame de s as a companion and guide of that young girl abandoned to her inexperience by the miserable end of her brother but at any rate that life now ended had been sincere and perhaps its thoughts might have been lofty its moral sufferings profound its last act a true sacrifice it is not for us the staid lovers calmed by the possession of a conquered liberty to condemn without appeal the fierceness of thwarted desire i am not ashamed of the warmth of my regard for miss haldin it was it must be admitted an unselfish sentiment being its own reward the late victor haldin in the light of that sentiment appeared to me not as a sinister conspirator but as a pure enthusiast i did not wish indeed to judge him but the very fact that he did not escape that fact which brought so much trouble to both his mother and his sister spoke to me in his favour meantime in my fear of seeing the girl surrender to the influence of the chateau borel revolutionary feminism i was more than willing to put my trust in that friend of the late victor haldin he was nothing but a name you will say exactly a name and what's more the only name the only name to be found in the correspondence between brother and sister the young man had turned up they had come face to face and fortunately without the direct interference of madame de s what will come of it what will she tell me presently i was asking myself it was only natural that my thoughts should turn to the young man the bearer of the only name uttered in all the dream talk of a future to be brought about by a revolution and my thought took the shape of asking myself why this young man had not called upon these ladies he had been in geneva for some days before miss haldin heard of him first in my presence from peter ivanovitch i regretted that last presence at their meeting i would rather have had it happen somewhere out of his spectacled sight but i supposed that having both these young people there he introduced them to each other i broke the silence by beginning a question on that point i suppose peter ivanovitch miss holden gave vent to her indignation peter ivanovitch directly he had got his answer from her had turned upon the dame de compagnie in a shameful manner turned upon her i wondered what about for what reason it was unheard of it was shameful miss haldin pursued with angry eyes il lui a fait une scène like this before strangers and for what you would never guess for some eggs oh i was astonished eggs did you say from madame de s that lady observes a special diet or something of the sort it seems she complained the day before to peter ivanovitch that the eggs were not rightly prepared peter ivanovitch suddenly remembered this against the poor woman and flew out at her it was most astonishing i stood as if rooted do you mean to say that the great feminist allowed himself to be abusive to a woman i asked oh not that it was something you have no conception of it was an odious performance imagine he raised his hat to begin with he made his voice soft and deprecatory ah you are not kind to us you will not deign to remember this sort of phrases that sort of tone the poor creature was terribly upset her eyes ran full of tears she did not know where to look i shouldn't wonder if she would have preferred abuse or even a blow i did not remark that very possibly she was familiar with both on occasions when no one was by miss haldin walked by my side her head up in scornful and angry silence great men have their surprising peculiarities i observed inanely exactly like men who are not great but that sort of thing cannot be kept up for ever how did the great feminist wind up this very characteristic episode miss haldin without turning her face my way told me that the end was brought about by the appearance of the interviewer who had been closeted with madame de s he came up rapidly unnoticed lifted his hat slightly and paused to say in french the baroness has asked me in case i met a lady on my way out to desire her to come in at once after delivering this message he hurried down the drive the dame de compagnie flew towards the house and peter ivanovitch followed her hastily looking uneasy in a moment miss haldin found herself alone with the young man who undoubtedly must have been the new arrival from russia she wondered whether her brother's friend had not already guessed who she was i am in a position to say that as a matter of fact he had guessed it is clear to me that peter ivanovitch for some reason or other had refrained from alluding to these ladies presence in geneva but razumov had guessed 
the trustful girl every word uttered by holden lived in razumov's memory they were like haunting shapes they could not be exorcised the most vivid amongst them was the mention of the sister the girl had existed for him ever since but he did not recognize her at once coming up with peter ivanovitch he did observe her their eyes had met even he had responded as no one could help responding to the harmonious charm of her whole person its strength its grace its tranquil frankness and then he had turned his gaze away he said to himself that all this was not for him the beauty of women and the friendship of men were not for him he accepted that feeling with a purposeful sternness and tried to pass on it was only her outstretched hand which brought about the recognition it stands recorded in the pages of his self-confession that it nearly suffocated him physically with an emotional reaction of hate and dismay as though her appearance had been a piece of accomplished treachery he faced about the considerable elevation of the terrace concealed them from any one lingering in the doorway of the house and even from the upstairs windows they could not have been seen through the thickets run wild and the trees of the gently sloping grounds he had cold placid glimpses of the lake a moment of perfect privacy had been vouchsafed to them at this juncture i wondered to myself what use they had made of that fortunate circumstance did you have time for more than a few words i asked that animation with which she had related to me the incidents of her visit to the chateau borel had left her completely strolling by my side she looked straight before her but i noticed a little colour on her cheek she did not answer me end of part two chapter four section two recording by expatria in bangor maine part two chapter four section three of under western eyes by joseph conrad this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter four section three after some little time i observed that they could not have hoped to remain forgotten for very long unless the other two had discovered madame de s swooning with fatigue perhaps or in a state of morbid exaltation after the long interview either would require their devoted ministrations i could depict to myself peter ivanovitch rushing busily out of the house again bareheaded perhaps and on across the terrace with his swinging gait the black skirts of the frock coat floating clear of his stout light grey legs i confess to having looked upon these young people as the quarry of the heroic fugitive i had the notion that they would not be allowed to escape capture but of that i said nothing to miss holden only as she still remained uncommunicative i pressed her a little well but you can tell me at least your impression she turned her head to look at me and turned away again impression she repeated slowly almost dreamily then in a quicker tone he seems to be a man who has suffered more from his thoughts than from evil fortune from his thoughts you say and that is natural enough in a russian she took me up in a young russian so many of them are unfit for action and yet unable to rest and you think he is that sort of man no i do not judge him how could i so suddenly you ask for my impression i explain my impression i i don't know the world nor yet the people in it i have been too solitary i am too young to trust my own opinions trust your instinct i advised her most women trust to that and make no worse mistakes than men in this case you have your brother's letter to help you she drew a deep breath like a light sigh unstained lofty and solitary existences she quoted as if to herself but i caught the wistful murmur distinctly high praise i whispered to her the highest possible so high that like the award of happiness it is more fit to come only at the end of a life but still no common or altogether unworthy personality could have suggested such a confident exaggeration of praise and ah she interrupted me ardently and if you had only known the heart from which that judgment has come she ceased on that note and for a space i reflected on the character of the words which i perceived very well must tip the scale of the girl's feelings in that young man's favour they had not the sound of a casual utterance vague they were to my western mind and to my western sentiment but i could not forget that standing by miss holden's side i was like a traveller in a strange country 
it had also become clear to me that miss haldin was unwilling to enter into the details of the only material part of their visit to the chateau borel but i was not hurt somehow i didn't feel it to be a want of confidence it was some other difficulty a difficulty i could not resent and it was without the slightest resentment that i said very well but on that high ground which i will not dispute you like any one else in such circumstances you must have made for yourself a representation of that exceptional friend a mental image of him and please tell me you were not disappointed what do you mean his personal appearance i don't mean precisely his good looks or otherwise we turned at the end of the alley and made a few steps without looking at each other his appearance is not ordinary said miss haldin at last no i should have thought not from the little you've said of your first impression after all one has to fall back on that word impression what i mean is that something indescribable which is likely to mark a not ordinary person i perceived that she was not listening there was no mistaking her expression and once more i had the sense of being out of it not because of my age which at any rate could draw inferences but altogether out of it on another plane whence i could only watch her from afar and so ceasing to speak i watched her stepping out by my side no she exclaimed suddenly i could not have been disappointed with a man of such strong feeling aha strong feeling i muttered thinking to myself censoriously like this at once all in a moment what did you say inquired miss haldin innocently oh nothing i beg your pardon strong feeling i am not surprised and you don't know how abruptly i behaved to him she cried remorsefully i suppose i must have appeared surprised for looking at me with a still more heightened colour she said she was ashamed to admit that she had not been sufficiently collected she had failed to control her words and actions as the situation demanded she lost the fortitude worthy of both the men the dead and the living the fortitude which should have been the note of the meeting of victor haldin's sister with victor haldin's only known friend he was looking at her keenly but said nothing and she was she confessed painfully affected by his want of comprehension all she could say was you are mr razumov a slight frown passed over his forehead after a short watchful pause he made a little bow of assent and waited at the thought that she had before her the man so highly regarded by her brother the man who had known his value spoken to him understood him had listened to his confidences perhaps had encouraged him her lips trembled her eyes ran full of tears she put out her hand made a step towards him impulsively saying with an effort to restrain her emotion can't you guess who i am he did not take the proffered hand he even recoiled a pace and miss haldin imagined that he was unpleasantly affected miss haldin excused him directing her displeasure at herself she had behaved unworthily like an emotional french girl a manifestation of that kind could not be welcomed by a man of stern self-contained character he must have been stern indeed or perhaps very timid with women not to respond in a more human way to the advances of a girl like natalie haldin i thought to myself those lofty and solitary existences i remembered the word suddenly make a young man shy and an old man savage often well i encouraged miss haldin to proceed she was still very dissatisfied with herself i went from bad to worse she said with an air of discouragement very foreign to her i did everything foolish except actually bursting into tears i am thankful to say i did not do that but i was unable to speak for quite a long time she had stood before him speechless swallowing her sobs and when she managed at last to utter something it was only her brother's name victor victor haldin she gasped out and again her voice failed her of course she commented to me this distressed him he was quite overcome i have told you my opinion that he is a man of deep feeling it is impossible to doubt it you should have seen his face he positively reeled he leaned against the wall of the terrace their friendship must have been the very brotherhood of souls i was grateful to him for that emotion which made me feel less ashamed of my own lack of self-control of course i had regained the power of speech at once almost all this lasted not more than a few seconds i am his sister i said maybe you have heard of me and had he i interrupted i don't know how could it have been otherwise and yet but what does that matter 
i stood there before him near enough to be touched and surely not looking like an impostor all i know is that he put out both his hands then to me i may say flung them out at me with the greatest readiness and warmth and that i seized and pressed them feeling that i was finding again a little of what i thought was lost to me forever with the loss of my brother some of that hope inspiration and support which i used to get from my dear dead i understood quite well what she meant we strolled on slowly i refrained from looking at her and it was as if answering my own thoughts that i murmured no doubt it was a great friendship as you say and that young man ended by welcoming your name so to speak with both hands after that of course you would understand each other yes you would understand each other quickly it was a moment before i heard her voice mr razumov seemed to be a man of few words a reserved man even when he is strongly moved unable to forget or even to forgive the base-toned expansiveness of peter ivanovitch the arch-patron of revolutionary parties i said that i took this for a favourable trait of character it was associated with sincerity in my mind and besides we had not much time she added no you would not have of course my suspicion and even dread of the feminist and his egeria was so ineradicable that i could not help asking with real anxiety which i made smiling but you escaped all right she understood me and smiled too at my uneasiness oh yes i escaped if you like to call it that i walked away quickly there was no need to run i am neither frightened nor yet fascinated like that poor woman who received me so strangely and mr mr razumov he remained there of course i suppose he went into the house after i left him you remember that he came here strongly recommended to peter ivanovitch possibly entrusted with important messages for him ah yes from that priest to father zosim yes or from others perhaps you left him then but have you seen him since may i ask for some time miss holden made no answer to this very direct question then i have been expecting to see him here to-day she said quietly you have do you meet then in this garden in that case i had better leave you at once no why leave me and we don't meet in this garden i have not seen mr razumov since that first time not once but i have been expecting him she paused i wondered to myself why that young revolutionist should show so little alacrity before we parted i told mr razumov that i walked here for an hour every day at this time i could not explain to him then why i did not ask him to come and see us at once mother must be prepared for such a visit and then you see i do not know myself what mr razumov has to tell us he too must be told first how it is with poor mother all these thoughts flashed through my mind at once so i told him hurriedly that there was a reason why i could not ask him to see us at home but that i was in the habit of walking here this is a public place but there are never many people about at this hour i thought it would do very well and it is so near our apartments i don't like to be very far away from mother our servant knows where i am in case i should be wanted suddenly yes it is very convenient from that point of view i agreed in fact i thought the bastions a very convenient place since the girl did not think it prudent as yet to introduce that young man to her mother it was here then i thought looking round at that plot of ground of deplorable banality that their acquaintance will begin and go on in the exchange of generous indignations and of extreme sentiments too poignant perhaps for a non-russian mind to conceive i saw these two escaped out of four score of millions of human beings ground between the upper and nether millstone walking under these trees their young heads close together yes an excellent place to stroll and talk in it even occurred to me while we turned once more away from the wide iron gates that when tired they would have plenty of accommodation to rest themselves there was a quantity of tables and chairs displayed between the restaurant chalet and the bandstand a whole raft of painted deals spread out under the trees in the very middle of it i observed a solitary swiss couple whose fate was made secure from the cradle to the grave by the perfected mechanism of democratic institutions in a republic that could almost be held in the palm of one's hand the man colourlessly uncouth was drinking beer out of a glittering glass the woman rustic and placid leaning back in the rough chair gazed idly round there is little logic to be expected on this earth not only in the matter of thought but also of sentiment 
i was surprised to discover myself displeased with that unknown young man a week had gone by since they met was he callous or shy or very stupid i could not make it out do you think i asked miss haldin after we had gone some distance up the great alley that mr razumov understood your intention understood what i meant she wondered he was greatly moved that i know in my own agitation i could see it but i spoke distinctly he heard me he seemed indeed to hang on my words unconsciously she had hastened her pace her utterance too became quicker i waited a little before i observed thoughtfully and yet he allowed all these days to pass how can we tell what work he may have to do here he is not an idler travelling for his pleasure his time may not be his own nor yet his thoughts perhaps she slowed her pace suddenly and in a lowered voice added or his very life then paused and stood still for all i know he may have had to leave geneva the very day he saw me without telling you i exclaimed incredulously i did not give him time i left him quite abruptly i behaved emotionally to the end i am sorry for it even if i had given him the opportunity he would have been justified in taking me for a person not to be trusted an emotional tearful girl is not a person to confide in but even if he has left geneva for a time i am confident that we shall meet again ah you are confident i dare say but on what ground because i've told him that i was in great need of some one a fellow countryman a fellow believer to whom i could give my confidence in a certain manner i see i don't ask you what answer he made i confess that this is good ground for your belief in mr razumov's appearance before long but he has not turned up to-day no she said quietly not to-day and we stood for a time in silence like people that have nothing more to say to each other and let their thoughts run widely asunder before their bodies go off their different ways miss haldin glanced at the watch on her wrist and made a brusque movement she had already overstayed her time it seemed i don't like to be away from mother she murmured shaking her head it is not that she is very ill now but somehow when i am not with her i am more uneasy than ever mrs haldin had not made the slightest allusion to her son for the last week or more she sat as usual in the armchair by the window looking out silently on that hopeless stretch of the boulevard de philosophes when she spoke a few lifeless words it was of indifferent trivial things for any one who knows what the poor soul is thinking of that sort of talk is more painful than her silence but that is bad too i can hardly endure it and i dare not break it miss haldin sighed refastening a button of her glove which had come undone i knew well enough what a hard time of it she must be having the stress its causes its nature would have undermined the health of an occidental girl but russian natures have a singular power of resistance against the unfair strains of life straight and supple with a short jacket open on her black dress which made her figure appear more slender and her fresh but colourless face more pale she compelled my wonder and admiration i can't stay a moment longer you ought to come soon to see mother you know she calls you l'ami it is an excellent name and she really means it and now au revoir i must run she glanced vaguely down the broad walk the hand she put out to me eluded my grasp by an unexpected upward movement and rested upon my shoulder her red lips were slightly parted not in a smile however but expressing a sort of startled pleasure she gazed towards the gates and said quickly with a gasp there i knew it here he comes i understood that she must mean mr razumov a young man was walking up the alley without haste his clothes were some dull shade of brown and he carried a stick when my eyes first fell on him his head was hanging on his breast as if in deep thought while i was looking at him he raised it sharply and at once stopped i am certain he did but that pause was nothing more perceptible than a faltering check in his gait instantaneously overcome then he continued his approach looking at us steadily miss holden signed to me to remain and advanced a step or two to meet him i turned my head away from that meeting and did not look at them again till i heard miss holden's voice uttering his name in the way of introduction mr razumov was informed in a warm low tone that besides being a wonderful teacher i was a great support in our sorrow and distress 
of course i was described also as an englishman miss haldin spoke rapidly faster than i have ever heard her speak and that by contrast made the quietness of her eyes more expressive i have given him my confidence she added looking all the time at mr razumov that young man did indeed rest his gaze on miss haldin but certainly did not look into her eyes which were so ready for him afterwards he glanced backwards and forwards at us both while the faint commencement of a forced smile followed by the suspicion of a frown vanished one after another i detected them though neither could have been noticed by a person less intensely bent upon divining him than myself i don't know what natalie holden had observed but my attention seized the very shades of these movements the attempted smile was given up the incipient frown was checked and smoothed so that there should be no sign but i imagined him exclaiming inwardly her confidence to this elderly person this foreigner i imagine this because he looked foreign enough to me i was upon the whole favourably impressed he had an air of intelligence and even some distinction quite above the average of the students and other inhabitants of the petite russie his features were more decided than in the generality of russian faces he had a line of the jaw a clean-shaven sallow cheek his nose was a ridge and not a mere protuberance he wore the hat well down over his eyes his dark hair curled low on the nape of his neck in the ill-fitting brown clothes there were sturdy limbs a slight stoop brought out a satisfactory breadth of shoulders upon the whole i was not disappointed studious robust shy before miss holden had ceased speaking i felt the grip of his hand on mine a muscular firm grip but unexpectedly hot and dry not a word or even a mutter assisted this short and arid handshake i intended to leave them to themselves but miss holden touched me lightly on the forearm with a significant contact conveying a distinct wish let him smile who likes but i was only too ready to stay near natalie holden and i am not ashamed to say that it was no smiling matter to me i stayed not as a youth would have stayed uplifted as it were poised in the air but soberly with my feet on the ground and my mind trying to penetrate her intention she had turned to razumov well this is the place yes it is here that i meant you to come i have been walking every day don't excuse yourself i understand i am grateful to you for coming to-day but all the same i cannot stay now it is impossible i must hurry off home yes even with you standing before me i must run off i have been too long away you know how it is these last words were addressed to me i noticed that mr razumov passed the tip of his tongue over his lips just as a parched feverish man might do he took her hand in its black glove which closed on his and held it detained it quite visibly to me against a drawing back movement thank you once more for for understanding me she went on warmly he interrupted her with a certain effect of roughness i didn't like him speaking to this frank creature so much from under the brim of his hat as it were and he produced a faint rasping voice quite like a man with a parched throat what is there to thank me for understand you how did i understand you you had better know that i understand nothing i was aware that you wanted to see me in this garden i could not come before i was hindered and even to-day you see late she still held his hand i can at any rate thank you for not dismissing me from your mind as a weak emotional girl no doubt i want sustaining i am very ignorant but i can be trusted indeed i can you are ignorant he repeated thoughtfully he had raised his head and was looking straight into her face now while she held his hand they stood like this for a long moment she released his hand yes you did come late it was good of you to come on the chance of me having loitered beyond my time i was talking with this good friend here i was talking of you yes kirylo sidorovitch of you he was with me when i first heard of your being here in geneva he can tell you what comfort it was to my bewildered spirit to hear that news he knew i meant to seek you out it was the only object of my accepting the invitation of peter ivanovitch peter ivanovitch talked to you of me he interrupted in that wavering hoarse voice which suggested a horribly dry throat very little just told me your name and that you had arrived here why should i have asked for more what could he have told me that i did not know already from my brother's letter three lines and how much they meant to me 
i will show them to you one day kirylo sidorovitch but now i must go the first talk between us cannot be a matter of five minutes so we had better not begin i had been standing a little aside seeing them both in profile at that moment it occurred to me that mr razumov's face was older than his age if mother the girl had turned suddenly to me were to wake up in my absence so much longer than usual she would perhaps question me she seems to miss me more you know of late she would want to know what delayed me and you see it would be painful for me to dissemble before her i understood the point very well for the same reason she checked what seemed to be on mr razumov's part a movement to accompany her no no i go alone but meet me here as soon as possible then to me in a lower significant tone mother may be sitting at the window at this moment looking down the street she must not know anything of mr razumov's presence here till till something is arranged she paused before she added a little louder but still speaking to me mr razumov does not quite understand my difficulty but you know what it is end of part two chapter four section three recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter five of under western eyes by joseph conrad this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter five with a quick inclination of the head for us both and an earnest friendly glance at the young man miss holden left us covering our heads and looking after her straight supple figure receding rapidly her walk was not that hybrid and uncertain gliding affected by some women but a frank strong healthy movement forward rapidly she increased the distance disappeared with suddenness at last i discovered only then that mr razumov after ramming his hat well over his brow was looking me over from head to foot i dare say i was a very unexpected fact for that young russian to stumble upon i caught in his physiognomy and his whole bearing an expression compounded of curiosity and scorn tempered by alarm as though he had been holding his breath while i was not looking but his eyes met mine with a gaze direct enough i saw then for the first time that they were of a clear brown colour and fringed with thick black eyelashes they were the youngest feature of his face not at all unpleasant eyes he swayed slightly leaning on his stick and generally hung in the wind it flashed upon me that in leaving us together miss holden had an intention that something was entrusted to me since by a mere accident i had been found at hand on this assumed ground i put all possible friendliness into my manner i cast about for some right thing to say and suddenly in miss holden's last words i perceived the clue to the nature of my mission no i said gravely if with a smile you cannot be expected to understand his clean-shaven lip quivered ever so little before he said as if wickedly amused but haven't you heard just now i was thanked by that young lady for understanding so well i looked at him rather hard was there a hidden and inexplicable sneer in this retort no it was not that it might have been resentment yes but what had he to resent he looked as though he had not slept very well of late i could almost feel on me the weight of his unrefreshed motionless stare the stare of a man who lies unwinking in the dark angrily passive in the toils of disastrous thoughts now when i know how true it was i can honestly affirm that this was the effect he produced on me it was painful in a curiously indefinite way for of course the definition comes to me now while i sit writing in the fullness of my knowledge but this is what the effect was at that time of absolute ignorance this new sort of uneasiness which he seemed to be forcing upon me i attempted to put down by assuming a conversational easy familiarity that extremely charming and essentially admirable young girl i am as you see old enough to be frank in my expressions was referring to her own feelings surely you must have understood that much he made such a brusque movement that he even tottered a little must understand this not expected to understand that i may have other things to do and the girl is charming and admirable well and if she is i suppose i can see that for myself 
this sally would have been insulting if his voice had not been practically extinct dried up in his throat and the rustling effort of his speech too painful to give real offence i remained silent checked between the obvious fact and the subtle impression it was open to me to leave him there and then but the sense of having been entrusted with a mission the suggestion of miss haldin's last glance was strong upon me after a moment of reflection i said shall we walk together a little he shrugged his shoulders so violently that he tottered again i saw it out of the corner of my eye as i moved on with him at my elbow he had fallen back a little and was practically out of my sight unless i turned my head to look at him i did not wish to indispose him still further by an appearance of marked curiosity it might have been distasteful to such a young and secret refugee from under the pestilential shadow hiding the true kindly face of his land and the shadow the attendant of his countrymen stretching across the middle of europe was lying on him too darkening his figure to my mental vision without doubt i said to myself he seems a sombre even a desperate revolutionist but he is young he may be unselfish and humane capable of compassion of i heard him clear gratingly his parched throat and became all attention this is beyond everything were his first words it is beyond everything i find you here for no reason that i can understand in possession of something i cannot be expected to understand a confidant a foreigner talking about an admirable russian girl is the admirable girl a fool i begin to wonder what are you at what is your object he was barely audible as if his throat had no more resonance than a dry rag a piece of tinder it was so pitiful that i found it extremely easy to control my indignation when you have lived a little longer mr razumov you will discover that no woman is an absolute fool i am not a feminist like that illustrious author peter ivanovitch who to say the truth is not a little suspect to me he interrupted me in a surprising note of whispering astonishment suspect to you peter ivanovitch suspect to you to you yes in a certain aspect he is i said dismissing my remark lightly as i was saying mr razumov when you have lived long enough you will learn to discriminate between the noble trustfulness of a nature foreign to every meanness and the flattered credulity of some women though even the credulous silly as they may be unhappy as they are sure to be are never absolute fools it is my belief that no woman is ever completely deceived those that are lost leap into the abyss with their eyes open if all the truth were known upon my word he cried at my elbow what is it to me whether women are fools or lunatics i really don't care what you think of them i i am not interested in them i let them be i am not a young man in a novel how do you know that i want to learn anything about women what is the meaning of all this the object you mean of this conversation which i admit i have forced upon you in a measure forced object he repeated still keeping half a pace or so behind me you wanted to talk about women apparently that's a subject but i don't care for it i have never in fact i have had other subjects to think about i am concerned here with one woman only a young girl the sister of your dead friend miss haldin surely you can think a little of her what i meant from the first was that there is a situation which you cannot be expected to understand i listened to his unsteady footfalls by my side for the space of several strides i think that it may prepare the ground for your next interview with miss haldin if i tell you of it i imagine that she might have had something of the kind in her mind when she left us together i believe myself authorized to speak the peculiar situation i have alluded to has arisen in the first grief and distress of victor haldin's execution there was something peculiar in the circumstances of his arrest you no doubt know the whole truth i felt my arm seized above the elbow and next instant found myself swung so as to face mr razumov you spring up from the ground before me with this talk who the devil are you this is not to be borne why what for what do you know what is or is not peculiar what have you to do with any confounded circumstances or with anything that happens in russia anyway he leaned on his stick with his other hand heavily and when he let go my arm i was certain in my mind that he was hardly able to keep on his feet let us sit down at one of these vacant tables i proposed 
disregarding this display of unexpectedly profound emotion it was not without its effect on me i confess i was sorry for him what tables what are you talking about oh the empty tables the tables there certainly i will sit at one of the empty tables i led him away from the path to the very centre of the raft of deals before the chalet the swiss couple were gone by that time we were alone on the raft so to speak mr razumov dropped into a chair let fall his stick and propped on his elbows his head between his hands stared at me persistently openly and continuously while i signalled the waiter and ordered some beer i could not quarrel with this silent inspection very well because truth to tell i felt somewhat guilty of having been sprung on him with some abruptness of having sprung from the ground as he expressed it while waiting to be served i mentioned that born from parents settled in st petersburg i had acquired the language as a child the town i did not remember having left it for good as a boy of nine but in later years i had renewed my acquaintance with the language he listened without as much as moving his eyes the least little bit he had to change his position when the beer came and the instant draining of his glass revived him he leaned back in his chair and folding his arms across his chest continued to stare at me squarely it occurred to me that his clean-shaven almost swarthy face was really of the very mobile sort and that the absolute stillness of it was the acquired habit of a revolutionist of a conspirator everlastingly on his guard against self-betrayal in a world of secret spies but you are an englishman a teacher of english literature he murmured in a voice that was no longer issuing from a parched throat i have heard of you people told me you have lived here for years quite true more than twenty years and i have been assisting miss holden with her english studies you have been reading english poetry with her he said immovable now like another man altogether a complete stranger to the man of the heavy and uncertain footfalls a little while ago at my elbow yes english poetry i said but the trouble of which i speak was caused by an english newspaper he continued to stare at me i don't think he was aware that the story of the midnight arrest had been ferreted out by an english journalist and given to the world when i explained this to him he muttered contemptuously it may have been altogether a lie i should think you are the best judge of that i retorted a little disconcerted i must confess that to me it looks to be true in the main how can you tell truth from lies he queried in his new immovable manner i don't know how you do it in russia i began rather nettled by his attitude he interrupted me in russia and in general everywhere in a newspaper for instance the colour of the ink and the shapes of the letters are the same well there are other trifles one can go by the character of the publication the general verisimilitude of the news the consideration of the motive and so on i don't trust blindly the accuracy of special correspondence but why should this one have gone to the trouble of concocting a circumstantial falsehood on a matter of no importance to the world that's what it is he grumbled what's going on with us is of no importance a mere sensational story to amuse the readers of the papers the superior contemptuous europe it is hateful to think of but let them wait a bit he broke off on this sort of threat addressed to the western world disregarding the anger in his stare i pointed out that whether the journalist was well or ill-informed the concern of the friends of these ladies was with the effect the few lines of print in question had produced the effect alone and surely he must be counted as one of the friends if only for the sake of his late comrade and intimate fellow-revolutionist at that point i thought he was going to speak vehemently but he only astounded me by the convulsive start of his whole body he restrained himself folded his loosened arms tighter across his chest and sat back with a smile in which there was a twitch of scorn and malice yes a comrade and an intimate very well he said i ventured to speak to you on that assumption and i cannot be mistaken i was present when peter ivanovitch announced your arrival here to miss holden and i saw her relief and thankfulness when your name was mentioned afterwards she showed me her brother's letter and read out the few words in which he alludes to you what else but a friend could you have been obviously that's perfectly well known a friend quite correct go on you were talking of some effect i said to myself he puts on the callousness of a stern revolutionist 
the insensibility to common emotions of a man devoted to a destructive idea he is young and his sincerity assumes a pose before a stranger a foreigner an old man youth must assert itself as concisely as possible i exposed to him the state of mind poor mrs haldin had been thrown into by the news of her son's untimely end he listened i felt it with profound attention his level stare deflected gradually downwards left my face and rested at last on the ground at his feet you can enter into the sister's feelings as you said i have only read a little english poetry with her and i won't make myself ridiculous in your eyes by trying to speak of her but you have seen her she is one of these rare human beings that do not want explaining at least i think so they had only that son that brother for a link with a wider world with the future the very groundwork of active existence for natalie haldin is gone with him can you wonder then that she turns with eagerness to the only man her brother mentions in his letters your name is a sort of legacy what could he have written of me he cried in a low exasperated tone only a few words it is not for me to repeat them to you mr razumov but you may believe my assertion that these words are forcible enough to make both his mother and his sister believe implicitly in the worth of your judgment and in the truth of anything you may have to say to them it's impossible for you now to pass them by like strangers i paused and for a moment sat listening to the footsteps of the few people passing up and down the broad central walk while i was speaking his head had sunk upon his breast above his folded arms he raised it sharply must i go then and lie to that old woman it was not anger it was something else something more poignant and not so simple i was aware of it sympathetically while i was profoundly concerned at the nature of that exclamation dear me won't the truth do then i hoped you could have told them something consoling i am thinking of the poor mother now your russia is a cruel country he moved a little in his chair yes i repeated i thought you would have had something authentic to tell the twitching of his lips before he spoke was curious what if it is not worth telling not worth from what point of view i don't understand from every point of view i spoke with some asperity i should think that anything which could explain the circumstances of that midnight arrest reported by a journalist for the amusement of the civilized europe he broke in scornfully yes reported but aren't they true i can't make out your attitude in this either the man is a hero to you or he approached his face with fiercely distended nostrils close to mine so suddenly that i had the greatest difficulty in not starting back you ask me i suppose it amuses you all this look here i am a worker i studied yes i studied very hard there is intelligence here he tapped his forehead with his fingertips don't you think a russian may have sane ambitions yes i had even prospects certainly i had and now you see me here abroad everything gone lost sacrifice you see me here and you ask you see me don't you sitting before you he threw himself back violently i kept outwardly calm yes i see you here and i assume you are here on account of the holden affair his manner changed you call it the holden affair do you he observed indifferently i have no right to ask you anything i said i wouldn't presume but in that case the mother and the sister of him who must be a hero in your eyes cannot be indifferent to you the girl is a frank and generous creature having the noblest well illusions you will tell her nothing or you will tell her everything but speaking now of the object with which i have approached you first we have to deal with the morbid state of the mother perhaps something could be invented under your authority as a cure for a distracted and suffering soul filled with maternal affection his air of weary indifference was accentuated i could not help thinking wilfully oh yes something might he mumbled carelessly he put his hand over his mouth to conceal a yawn when he uncovered his lips they were smiling faintly pardon me this has been a long conversation and i have not had much sleep the last two nights this unexpected somewhat insolent sort of apology had the merit of being perfectly true he had had no nightly rest to speak of since that day when in the grounds of the chateau borel the sister of victor holden had appeared before him 
the perplexities and the complex terrors i may say of this sleeplessness are recorded in the document i was to see later the document which is the main source of this narrative at the moment he looked to me convincingly tired gone slack all over like a man who has passed through some sort of crisis i have had a lot of urgent writing to do he added i rose from my chair at once and he followed my example without haste a little heavily i must apologize for detaining you so long i said why apologize one can't very well go to bed before night and you did not detain me i could have left you at any time i had not stayed with him to be offended i am glad you have been sufficiently interested i said calmly no merit of mine though the commonest sort of regard for the mother of your friend was enough as to miss holden herself she at one time was disposed to think that her brother had been betrayed to the police in some way to my great surprise mr razumov sat down again suddenly i stared at him and i must say that he returned my stare without winking for quite a considerable time in some way he mumbled as if he had not understood or could not believe his ears some unforeseen event a sheer accident might have done that i went on or as she characteristically put it to me the folly or weakness of some unhappy fellow revolutionist folly or weakness he repeated bitterly she is a very generous creature i observed after a time the man admired by victor holden fixed his eyes on the ground i turned away and moved off apparently unnoticed by him i nourished no resentment of the moody brusqueness with which he had treated me the sentiment i was carrying away from that conversation was that of hopelessness before i had got fairly clear of the raft of chairs and tables he had rejoined me hm, yes i heard him at my elbow again but what do you think i did not look round even i think that you people are under a curse he made no sound it was only on the pavement outside the gate that i heard him again i should like to walk with you a little after all i preferred this enigmatical young man to his celebrated compatriot the great peter ivanovitch but i saw no reason for being particularly gracious i am going now to the railway station by the shortest way from here to meet a friend from england i said for all answer to his unexpected proposal i hoped that something informing could come of it as we stood on the curbstone waiting for a tram-car to pass he remarked gloomily i like what you said just now do you we stepped off the pavement together the great problem he went on is to understand thoroughly the nature of the curse that's not very difficult i think i think so too he agreed with me and his readiness strangely enough did not make him less enigmatical in the least a curse is an evil spell i tried him again and the important the great problem is to find the means to break it yes to find the means that was also an assent but he seemed to be thinking of something else we had crossed diagonally the open space before the theatre and began to descend a broad sparely frequented street in the direction of one of the smaller bridges he kept on by my side without speaking for a long time you are not thinking of leaving geneva soon i asked he was silent for so long that i began to think i had been indiscreet and should get no answer at all yet on looking at him i almost believed that my question had caused him something in the nature of positive anguish i detected it mainly in the clasping of his hands in which he put a great force stealthily once however he had overcome that sort of agonizing hesitation sufficiently to tell me that he had no such intention he became rather communicative at least relatively to the former off-hand curtness of his speeches the tone too was more amiable he informed me that he intended to study and also to write he went even so far as to tell me he had been to stuttgart stuttgart i was aware was one of the revolutionary centres the directing committee of one of the russian parties i can't tell now which was located in that town it was there that he got into touch with the active work of the revolutionists outside russia i have never been abroad before he explained in a rather inanimate voice now then after a slight hesitation altogether different from the agonizing irresolution my first simple question whether he meant to stay in geneva had aroused he made me an unexpected confidence the fact is i have received a sort of mission from them which will keep you here in geneva yes here 
in this odious i was satisfied with my faculty for putting two and two together when i drew the inference that the mission had something to do with the person of the great peter ivanovitch but i kept that surmise to myself naturally and mr razumov said nothing more for some considerable time it was only when we were nearly on the bridge we had been making for that he opened his lips again abruptly could i see that precious article anywhere i had to think for a moment before i saw what he was referring to it has been reproduced in parts by the press here there are files to be seen in various places my copy of the english newspaper i have left with miss holden i remember on the day after it reached me i was sufficiently worried by seeing it lying on a table by the side of the poor mother's chair for weeks then it disappeared it was a relief i assure you he had stopped short i trust i continued that you will find time to see these ladies fairly often that you will make time he stared at me so queerly that i hardly know how to define his aspect i could not understand it in this connection at all what ailed him i asked myself what strange thought had come into his head what vision of all the horrors that can be seen in his hopeless country had come suddenly to haunt his brain if it were anything connected with the fate of victor holden then i hoped earnestly he would keep it to himself for ever i was to speak plainly so shocked that i tried to conceal my impression by heaven forgive me a smile and the assumption of a light manner surely i exclaimed that needn't cost you a great effort he turned away from me and leaned over the parapet of the bridge for a moment i waited looking at his back and yet i assure you i was not anxious just then to look at his face again he did not move at all he did not mean to move i walked on slowly on my way towards the station and at the end of the bridge i glanced over my shoulder no he had not moved he hung well over the parapet as if captivated by the smooth rush of the blue water under the arch the current there is swift extremely swift it makes some people dizzy i myself can never look at it for any length of time without experiencing a dread of being suddenly snatched away by its destructive force some brains cannot resist the suggestion of irresistible power and of headlong motion it apparently had a charm for mr razumov i left him hanging far over the parapet of the bridge the way he had behaved to me could not be put down to mere boorishness there was something else under his scorn and impatience perhaps i thought with sudden approach to hidden truth it was the same thing which had kept him over a week nearly ten days indeed from coming near miss halden but what it was i could not tell end of part two chapter five recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three chapter one of under western eyes by joseph conrad this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three chapter one the water under the bridge ran violent and deep its slightly undulating rush seemed capable of scouring out a channel for itself through solid granite while you looked but had it flowed through razumov's breast it could not have washed away the accumulated bitterness the wrecking of his life had deposited there what is the meaning of all this he thought staring downwards at the headlong flow so smooth and clean that only the passage of a faint air bubble or a thin vanishing streak of foam like a white hair disclosed its vertiginous rapidity its terrible force why has that meddlesome old englishman blundered against me and what is this silly tale of a crazy old woman he was trying to think brutally on purpose but he avoided any mental reference to the young girl a crazy old woman he repeated to himself it is a fatality or ought i to despise all this as absurd but no i am wrong i can't afford to despise anything an absurdity may be the starting point of the most dangerous complications how is one to guard against it it puts to rout one's intelligence the more intelligent one is the less one suspects an absurdity a wave of wrath choked his thoughts for a moment it even made his body leaning over the parapet quiver then he resumed his silent thinking like a secret dialogue with himself and even in that privacy his thought had some reservations of which he was vaguely conscious after all this is not absurd it is insignificant 
it is absolutely insignificant absolutely the craze of an old woman the fussy officiousness of a blundering elderly englishman what devil put him in the way haven't i treated him cavalierly enough haven't i just that's the way to treat these meddlesome persons is it possible that he still stands behind my back waiting razumov felt a faint chill run down his spine it was not fear he was certain that it was not fear not fear for himself but it was all the same a sort of apprehension as if for another for some one he knew without being able to put a name on the personality but the recollection that the officious englishman had a train to meet tranquillized him for a time it was too stupid to suppose that he should be wasting his time in waiting it was unnecessary to look round and make sure but what did the man mean by his extraordinary rigmarole about the newspaper and that crazy old woman he thought suddenly it was a damnable presumption anyhow something that only an englishman could be capable of all this was a sort of sport for him the sport of revolution a game to look at from the height of his superiority and what on earth did he mean by his exclamation won't the truth do razumov pressed his folded arms to the stone coping over which he was leaning with force won't the truth do the truth for the crazy old mother of the the young man shuddered again yes the truth would do apparently it would do exactly and receive thanks he thought formulating the unspoken words cynically fall on my neck in gratitude no doubt he jeered mentally but this mood abandoned him at once he felt sad as if his heart had become empty suddenly well i must be cautious he concluded coming to himself as though his brain had been awakened from a trance there is nothing no one too insignificant too absurd to be disregarded he thought wearily i must be cautious razumov pushed himself with his hand away from the balustrade and retracing his steps along the bridge walked straight to his lodgings where for a few days he led a solitary and retired existence he neglected peter ivanovitch to whom he was accredited by the stuttgart group he never went near the refugee revolutionists to whom he had been introduced on his arrival he kept out of that world altogether and he felt that such conduct causing surprise and arousing suspicion contained an element of danger for himself this is not to say that during these few days he never went out i met him several times in the streets but he gave me no recognition once going home after an evening call on the ladies holden i saw him crossing the dark roadway of the boulevard de philosophes he had a broad-brimmed soft hat and the collar of his coat turned up i watched him make straight for the house but instead of going in he stopped opposite the still lighted windows and after a time went away down a side street i knew that he had not been to see mrs holden yet miss holden told me he was reluctant moreover the mental condition of mrs holden had changed she seemed to think now that her son was living and she perhaps awaited his arrival her immobility in the great armchair in front of the window had an air of expectancy even when the blind was down and the lamps lighted for my part i was convinced that she had received her death stroke miss holden to whom of course i said nothing of my forebodings thought that no good would come from introducing mr razumov just then an opinion which i shared fully i knew that she met the young man on the bastions once or twice i saw them strolling slowly up the main alley they met every day for weeks i avoided passing that way during the hour when miss holden took her exercise there one day however in a fit of absent-mindedness i entered the gates and came upon her walking alone i stopped to exchange a few words mr razumov failed to turn up and we began to talk about him naturally did he tell you anything definite about your brother's activities his end i ventured to ask no admitted miss holden with some hesitation nothing definite i understood well enough that all their conversations must have been referred mentally to that dead man who had brought them together that was unavoidable but it was in the living man that she was interested that was unavoidable too i suppose and as i pushed my inquiries i discovered that he had disclosed himself to her as a by no means conventional revolutionist contemptuous of catchwords of theories of men too i was rather pleased at that but i was a little puzzled his mind goes forward far ahead of the struggle miss holden explained of course he is an actual worker too she added and do you understand him i inquired point-blank 
she hesitated again not altogether she murmured i perceived that he had fascinated her by an assumption of mysterious reserve do you know what i think she went on breaking through her reserved almost reluctant attitude i think that he is observing studying me to discover whether i am worthy of his trust and that pleases you she kept mysteriously silent for a moment then with energy but in a confidential tone i am convinced she declared that this extraordinary man is meditating some vast plan some great undertaking he is possessed by it he suffers from it and from being alone in the world and so he's looking for helpers i commented turning away my head again there was a silence why not she said at last the dead brother the dying mother the foreign friend had fallen into a distant background but at the same time peter ivanovitch was absolutely nowhere now and this thought consoled me yet i saw the gigantic shadow of russian life deepening around her like the darkness of an advancing night it would devour her presently i inquired after mrs holden that other victim of the deadly shade a remorseful uneasiness appeared in her frank eyes mother seemed no worse but if i only knew what strange fancies she had some time then miss holden glancing at her watch declared that she could not stay a moment longer and with a hasty handshake ran off lightly decidedly mr razumov was not to turn up that day incomprehensible youth but less than an hour afterwards while crossing the place mollard i caught sight of him boarding a south shore tramcar he's going to the chateau borel i thought after depositing razumov at the gates of the chateau borel some half a mile or so from the town the car continued its journey between two straight lines of shady trees across the roadway in the sunshine a short wooden pier jutted into the shallow pale water which farther out had an intense blue tint contrasting unpleasantly with the green orderly slopes on the opposite shore the whole view with the harbour jetties of white stone underlining lividly the dark front of the town to the left and the expanding space of water to the right with jutting promontories of no particular character had the uninspiring glittering quality of a very fresh oleograph razumov turned his back on it with contempt he thought it odious oppressively odious in its unsuggestive finish the very perfection of mediocrity attained at last after centuries of toil and culture and turning his back on it he faced the entrance to the grounds of the chateau borel the bars of the central way and the wrought iron arch between the dark weather-stained stone piers were very rusty and though fresh tracks of wheels ran under it the gate looked as if it had not been opened for a very long time but close against the lodge built of the same grey stone as the piers its windows were all boarded up there was a small side entrance the bars of that were rusty too it stood ajar and looked as though it had not been closed for a long time in fact razumov trying to push it open a little wider discovered it was immovable democratic virtue there are no thieves here apparently he muttered to himself with displeasure before advancing into the grounds he looked back sourly at an idle working-man lounging on a bench in the clean broad avenue the fellow had thrown his feet up one of his arms hung over the low back of the public seat he was taking a day off in lordly repose as if everything in sight belonged to him elector eligible enlightened razumov muttered to himself a brute all the same razumov entered the grounds and walked fast up the wide sweep of the drive trying to think of nothing to rest his head to rest his emotions too but arriving at the foot of the terrace before the house he faltered affected physically by some invisible interference the mysteriousness of his quickened heartbeat startled him he stopped short and looked at the brick wall of the terrace faced with shallow arches meagrely clothed by a few unthriving creepers with an ill-kept narrow flower-bed along its foot it is here he thought with a sort of awe it is here on this very spot he was tempted to flight at the mere recollection of his first meeting with natalie halden he confessed it to himself but he did not move and that not because he wished to resist an unworthy weakness but because he knew that he had no place to fly to moreover he could not leave geneva he recognized even without thinking that it was impossible it would have been a fatal admission an act of moral suicide 
it would have been also physically dangerous slowly he ascended the stairs of the terrace flanked by two stained greenish stone urns of funereal aspect across the broad platform where a few blades of grass sprouted on the discoloured gravel the door of the house with its ground-floor windows shuttered faced him wide open he believed that his approach had been noted because framed in the doorway without his tall hat peter ivanovitch seemed to be waiting for his approach the ceremonious black frock-coat and the bared head of europe's greatest feminist accentuated the dubiousness of his status in the house rented by madame de s his egeria his aspect combined the formality of the caller with the freedom of the proprietor florid and bearded and masked by the dark blue glasses he met the visitor and at once took him familiarly under the arm razumov suppressed every sign of repugnance by an effort which the constant necessity of prudence had rendered almost mechanical and this necessity had settled his expression in a cast of austere almost fanatical aloofness the heroic fugitive impressed afresh by the severe detachment of this new arrival from revolutionary russia took a conciliatory even a confidential tone madame de s was resting after a bad night she often had bad nights he had left his hat upstairs on the landing and had come down to suggest to his young friend a stroll and a good open-hearted talk in one of the shady alleys behind the house after voicing this proposal the great man glanced at the unmoved face by his side and could not restrain himself from exclaiming on my word young man you are an extraordinary person i fancy you are mistaken peter ivanovitch if i were really an extraordinary person i would not be here walking with you in a garden in switzerland canton of geneva commune of what's the name of the commune this place belongs to never mind the heart of democracy anyhow a fit heart for it no bigger than a parched pea and about as much value i am no more extraordinary than the rest of us russians wandering abroad but peter ivanovitch dissented emphatically no no you are not ordinary i have some experience of russians who are well living abroad you appear to me and to others too a marked personality what does he mean by this razumov asked himself turning his eyes fully on his companion the face of peter ivanovitch expressed a meditative seriousness you don't suppose kirylo sidorovitch that i have not heard of you from various points where you made yourself known on your way here i have had letters oh we are great in talking about each other interjected razumov who had listened with great attention gossip tales suspicions and all that sort of thing we know how to deal in to perfection calumny even in indulging in this sally razumov managed very well to conceal the feeling of anxiety which had come over him at the same time he was saying to himself that there could be no earthly reason for anxiety he was relieved by the evident sincerity of the protesting voice heavens cried peter ivanovitch what are you talking about what reason can you have to the great exile flung up his arms as if words had failed him in sober truth razumov was satisfied yet he was moved to continue in the same vein i am talking of the poisonous plants which flourish in the world of conspirators like evil mushrooms in a dark cellar you are casting aspersions remonstrated peter ivanovitch which as far as you are concerned no razumov interrupted without heat indeed i don't want to cast aspersions but it's just as well to have no illusions peter ivanovitch gave him an inscrutable glance of his dark spectacles accompanied by a faint smile the man who says that he has no illusions has at least that one he said in a very friendly tone but i see how it is kirylo sidorovitch you aim at stoicism stoicism that's a pose of the greeks and the romans let's leave it to them we are russians that is children that is sincere that is cynical if you like but that's not a pose a long silence ensued they strolled slowly under the lime trees peter ivanovitch had put his hands behind his back razumov felt the ungravelled ground of the deeply shaded walk damp and as if slippery under his feet he asked himself with uneasiness if he were saying the right things the direction of the conversation ought to have been more under his control he reflected the great man appeared to be reflecting on his side too 
he cleared his throat slightly and razumov felt at once a painful reawakening of scorn and fear i am astonished began peter ivanovitch gently supposing you are right in your indictment how can you raise any question of calumny or gossip in your case it is unreasonable the fact is kirylo sidorovitch there is not enough known of you to give hold to gossip or even calumny just now you are a man associated with a great deed which had been hoped for and tried for too without success people have perished for attempting that which you and holden have done at last you come to us out of russia with that prestige but you cannot deny that you have not been communicative kirylo sidorovitch people you have met imparted their impressions to me one wrote this another that but i form my own opinions i waited to see you first you are a man out of the common that's positively so you are close very close this taciturnity this severe brow this something inflexible and secret in you inspires hopes and a little wonder as to what you may mean there is something of a brutus pray spare me those classical allusions burst out razumov nervously what comes junius brutus to do here it is ridiculous do you mean to say he added sarcastically but lowering his voice that the russian revolutionists are all patricians and that i am an aristocrat peter ivanovitch who had been helping himself with a few gestures clasped his hands again behind his back and made a few steps pondering not all patricians he muttered at last but you at any rate are one of us razumov smiled bitterly to be sure my name is not guggenheimer he said in a sneering tone i am not a democratic jew how can i help it not everybody has such luck i have no name i have no the european celebrity showed a great concern he stepped back a pace and his arms flew in front of his person extended deprecatory almost entreating his deep bass voice was full of pain but my dear young friend he cried my dear kirylo sidorovitch razumov shook his head the very patronymic you are so civil as to use when addressing me i have no legal right to but what of that i don't wish to claim it i have no father so much the better but i will tell you what my mother's grandfather was a peasant a serf see how much i am one of you i don't want any one to claim me but russia can't disown me she cannot razumov struck his breast with his fist i am it peter ivanovitch walked on slowly his head lowered razumov followed vexed with himself that was not the right sort of talk all sincerity was an imprudence yet one could not renounce truth altogether he thought with despair peter ivanovitch meditating behind his dark glasses became to him suddenly so odious that if he had had a knife he fancied he could have stabbed him not only without compunction but with a horrible triumphant satisfaction his imagination dwelt on that atrocity in spite of himself it was as if he were becoming light-headed it is not what is expected of me he repeated to himself it is not what is i could get away by breaking the fastening on the little gate i see there in the back wall it is a flimsy lock nobody in the house seems to know he is here with me oh yes the hat these women would discover presently the hat he has left on the landing they would come upon him lying dead in this damp gloomy shade but i would be gone and no one could ever lord am i going mad he asked himself in a fright the great man was heard musing in an undertone hm yes that no doubt in a certain sense he raised his voice there is a deal of pride about you the intonation of peter ivanovitch took on a homely familiar ring acknowledging in a way razumov's claim to peasant descent a great deal of pride brother kirylo and i don't say that you have no justification for it i have admitted you had i have ventured to allude to the facts of your birth simply because i attach no mean importance to it you were one of us en de notre i reflect on that with satisfaction i attach some importance to it also said razumov quietly i won't even deny that it may have some importance for you too he continued after a slight pause and with a touch of grimness of which he was himself aware with some annoyance he hoped it had escaped the perception of peter ivanovitch but suppose we talk no more about it well we shall not not after this one time kirylo sidorovitch persisted the noble archpriest of revolution this shall be the last occasion you cannot believe for a moment that i had the slightest idea of wounding your feelings 
you are clearly a superior nature that's how i read you quite above the common uh susceptibilities but the fact is kirylo sidorovitch i don't know your susceptibilities nobody out of russia knows much of you as yet you have been watching me suggested razumov yes the great man had spoken in a tone of perfect frankness but as they turned their faces to each other razumov felt baffled by the dark spectacles under their cover peter ivanovitch hinted that he had felt for some time the need of meeting a man of energy and character in view of a certain project he said nothing more precise however and after some critical remarks upon the personalities of the various members of the committee of revolutionary action in stuttgart he let the conversation lapse for quite a long while they paced the alley from end to end razumov silent too raised his eyes from time to time to cast a glance at the back of the house it offered no sign of being inhabited with its grimy weather-stained walls and all the windows shuttered from top to bottom it looked damp and gloomy and deserted it might very well have been haunted in traditional style by some doleful groaning feudal ghost of a middle-class order the shades evoked as worldly rumour had it by madame de s to meet statesmen diplomatists deputies of various european parliaments must have been of another sort razumov had never seen madame de s but in the carriage peter ivanovitch came out of his abstraction two things i may say to you at once i believe first that neither a leader nor any decisive action can come out of the dregs of a people now if you ask me what are the dregs of a people hm, it would take too long to tell you would be surprised at the variety of ingredients that for me go to the making up of these dregs of that which ought must remain at the bottom moreover such a statement might be subject to discussion but i can tell you what is not the dregs on that it is impossible for us to disagree the peasantry of a people is not the dregs neither is its highest class well the nobility reflect on that kirylo sidorovitch i believe you are well fitted for reflection everything in a people that is not genuine not its own by origin or development is well dirt intelligence in the wrong place is that foreign-bred doctrines are that dirt dregs the second thing i would offer to your meditation is this that for us at this moment there yawns a chasm between the past and the future it can never be bridged by foreign liberalism all attempts at it are either folly or cheating bridged it can never be it has to be filled up a sort of sinister jocularity had crept into the tones of the burly feminist he seized razumov's arm above the elbow and gave it a slight shake do you understand enigmatical young man it has got to be just filled up razumov kept an unmoved countenance don't you think that i have already gone beyond meditation on that subject he said freeing his arm by a quiet movement which increased the distance a little between himself and peter ivanovitch as they went on strolling abreast and he added that surely whole cartloads of words and theories could never fill that chasm no meditation was necessary a sacrifice of many lives could alone he fell silent without finishing the phrase peter ivanovitch inclined his big hairy head slowly after a moment he proposed that they should go and see if madame de s was now visible we shall get some tea he said turning out of the shaded gloomy walk with a brisker step the lady companion had been on the lookout her dark skirt whisked into the doorway as the two men came in sight round the corner she ran off somewhere altogether and had disappeared when they entered the hall in the crude light falling from the dusty glass skylight upon the black and white tessellated floor covered with muddy tracks their footsteps echoed faintly the great feminist led the way up the stairs on the balustrade of the first floor landing a shiny tall hat reposed rim upwards opposite the double door of the drawing-room haunted it was said by evoked ghosts and frequented it was to be supposed by fugitive revolutionists the cracked white paint of the panels the tarnished gilt of the mouldings permitted one to imagine nothing but dust and emptiness within before turning the massive brass handle peter ivanovitch gave his young companion a sharp partly critical partly preparatory glance no one is perfect he murmured discreetly 
thus the possessor of a rare jewel might before opening the casket warn the profane that no gem perhaps is flawless he remained with his hand on the door-handle so long that razumov assented by a moody no perfection itself would not produce that effect pursued peter ivanovitch in a world not meant for it but you shall find there a mind no the quintessence of feminine intuition which will understand any perplexity you may be suffering from by the irresistible enlightening force of sympathy nothing can remain obscure before that that inspired yes inspired penetration this true light of femininity the gaze of the dark spectacles in its glossy steadfastness gave his face an air of absolute conviction razumov felt a momentary shrinking before that closed door penetration light he stammered out do you mean some sort of thought reading peter ivanovitch seemed shocked i mean something utterly different he retorted with a faint pitying smile razumov began to feel angry very much against his wish this is very mysterious he muttered through his teeth you don't object to being understood to being guided queried the great feminist razumov exploded in a fierce whisper in what sense be pleased to understand that i am a serious person who do you take me for they looked at each other very closely razumov's temper was cooled by the impenetrable earnestness of the blue glasses meeting his stare peter ivanovitch turned the handle at last you shall know directly he said pushing the door open a low-pitched grating voice was heard within the room enfant in the doorway his black-coated bulk blocking the view peter ivanovitch boomed in a hearty tone with something boastful in it yes here i am he glanced over his shoulder at razumov who waited for him to move on and i am bringing you a proved conspirator a real one this time en vrai celui -là. this pause in the doorway gave the proved conspirator time to make sure that his face did not betray his angry curiosity and his mental disgust these sentiments stand confessed in mr razumov's memorandum of his first interview with madame de s the very words i use in my narrative are written where their sincerity cannot be suspected the record which could not have been meant for any one's eyes but his own was not i think the outcome of that strange impulse of indiscretion common to men who lead secret lives and accounting for the invariable existence of compromising documents in all the plots and conspiracies of history mr razumov looked at it i suppose as a man looks at himself in a mirror with wonder perhaps with anguish with anger or despair yes as a threatened man may look fearfully at his own face in the glass formulating to himself reassuring excuses for his appearance marked by the taint of some insidious hereditary disease end of part three chapter one recording by expatria in bangor maine part three chapter two section one of under western eyes by joseph conrad this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatria in bangor maine part three chapter two section one the egeria of the russian mazzini produced at first view a strong effect by the death-like immobility of an obviously painted face the eyes appeared extraordinarily brilliant the figure in a close-fitting dress admirably made but by no means fresh had an elegant stiffness the rasping voice inviting him to sit down the rigidity of the upright attitude with one arm extended along the back of the sofa the white gleam of the big eyeballs setting off the black fathomless stare of the enlarged pupils impressed razumov more than anything he had seen since his hasty and secret departure from st petersburg a witch in parisian clothes he thought a portent he actually hesitated in his advance and did not even comprehend at first what the rasping voice was saying sit down draw your chair nearer me there he sat down at close quarters the rouged cheekbones the wrinkles the fine lines on each side of the vivid lips astounded him he was being received graciously with a smile which made him think of a grinning skull 
we have been hearing about you for some time he did not know what to say and murmured some disconnected words the grinning skull effect vanished and do you know that the general complaint is that you have shown yourself very reserved everywhere razumov remained silent for a time thinking of his answer i don't you see am a man of action he said huskily glancing upwards peter ivanovitch stood in portentous expectant silence by the side of his chair a slight feeling of nausea came over razumov what could be the relations of these two people to each other she like a galvanized corpse out of some hoffman's tale he the preacher of feminist gospel for all the world and a super-revolutionist besides this ancient painted mummy with unfathomable eyes and this burly bull-necked deferential what was it witchcraft fascination it's for her money he thought she has millions the walls the floor of the room were bare like a barn the few pieces of furniture had been discovered in the garrets and dragged down into service without having been properly dusted even it was the refuse the banker's widow had left behind her the windows without curtains had an indigent sleepless look in two of them the dirty yellowy white blinds had been pulled down all this spoke not of poverty but of sordid penuriousness the hoarse voice on the sofa uttered angrily you are looking round kirylo sidorovitch i have been shamefully robbed positively ruined a rattling laugh which seemed beyond her control interrupted her for a moment a slavish nature would find consolation in the fact that the principal robber was an exalted and almost a sacrosanct person a grand duke in fact do you understand mr razumov a grand duke no you have no idea what thieves those people are downright thieves her bosom heaved but her left arm remained rigidly extended along the back of the couch you will only upset yourself breathed out a deep voice which to razumov's startled glance seemed to proceed from under the steady spectacles of peter ivanovitch rather than from his lips which had hardly moved what of that i say thieves voleurs voleurs razumov was quite confounded by this unexpected clamour which had in it something of wailing and croaking and more than a suspicion of hysteria voleurs 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 no power on earth can rob you of your genius shouted peter ivanovitch in an overpowering bass but without stirring without a gesture of any kind a profound silence fell razumov remained outwardly impassive what is the meaning of this performance he was asking himself but with a preliminary sound of bumping outside some door behind him the lady companion in a threadbare black skirt and frayed blouse came in rapidly walking on her heels and carrying in both hands a big russian samovar obviously too heavy for her razumov made an instinctive movement to help which startled her so much that she nearly dropped her hissing burden she managed however to land it on the table and looked so frightened that razumov hastened to sit down she produced then from an adjacent room four glass tumblers a teapot and a sugar basin on a black iron tray the rasping voice asked from the sofa abruptly le gateau have you remembered to bring the cakes peter ivanovitch without a word marched out on to the landing and returned instantly with a parcel wrapped up in white glazed paper which he must have extracted from the interior of his hat with imperturbable gravity he undid the string and smoothed the paper open on a part of the table within reach of madame de s s hand the lady companion poured out the tea then retired into a distant corner out of everybody's sight from time to time madame de s extended a claw-like hand glittering with costly rings towards the paper of cakes took up one and devoured it displaying her big false teeth ghoulishly meantime she talked in a hoarse tone of the political situation in the balkans she built great hopes on some complication in the peninsula for arousing a great movement of national indignation in russia against these thieves 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 you will only upset yourself peter ivanovitch interposed raising his glassy gaze he smoked cigarettes and drank tea in silence continuously when he had finished a glass he flourished his hand above his shoulder at that signal the lady companion ensconced in her corner with round eyes like a watchful animal would dart out to the table and pour him out another tumblerful razumov looked at her once or twice she was anxious tremulous though neither madame de s 
nor peter ivanovitch paid the slightest attention to her what have they done between them to that forlorn creature razumov asked himself have they terrified her out of her senses with ghosts or simply have they only been beating her when she gave him his second glass of tea he noticed that her lips trembled in the manner of a scared person about to burst into speech but of course she said nothing and retired into her corner as if hugging to herself the smile of thanks he gave her she may be worth cultivating thought razumov suddenly he was calming down getting hold of the actuality into which he had been thrown for the first time perhaps since victor haldin had entered his room and had gone out again he was distinctly aware of being the object of the famous or notorious madame de s s ghastly graciousness madame de s was pleased to discover that this young man was different from the other types of revolutionist members of committees secret emissaries vulgar and unmannerly fugitive professors rough students ex-cobblers with apostolic faces consumptive and ragged enthusiasts hebrew youths common fellows of all sorts that used to come and go around peter ivanovitch fanatics pedants proletarians all it was pleasant to talk to this young man of notably good appearance for madame de s was not always in a mystical state of mind razumov's taciturnity only excited her to a quicker more voluble utterance it still dealt with the balkans she knew all the statesmen of that region turks bulgarians montenegrins roumanians greeks armenians and nondescripts young and old the living and the dead with some money an intrigue could be started which would set the peninsula in a blaze and outrage the sentiment of the russian people a cry of abandoned brothers could be raised and then with the nation seething with indignation a couple of regiments or so would be enough to begin a military revolution in st petersburg and make an end of these thieves apparently i've got only to sit still and listen the silent razumov thought to himself as to that hairy and obscene brute in such terms did mr razumov refer mentally to the popular expounder of a feministic conception of social state as to him for all his cunning he too shall speak out some day razumov ceased to think for a moment then a sombre toned reflection formulated itself in his mind ironical and bitter i have the gift of inspiring confidence he heard himself laughing aloud it was like a goad to the painted shiny-eyed harridan on the sofa you may well laugh she cried hoarsely what else can one do perfect swindlers and what base swindlers at that cheap germans holstein gotorps though indeed it's hardly safe to say who and what they are a family that counts a creature like catherine the great in its ancestry you understand you are only upsetting yourself said peter ivanovitch patiently but in a firm tone this admonition had its usual effect on the egeria she dropped her thick discoloured eyelids and changed her position on the sofa all her angular and lifeless movements seemed completely automatic now that her eyes were closed presently she opened them very full peter ivanovitch drank tea steadily without haste well i declare she addressed razumov directly the people who have seen you on your way here are right you are very reserved you haven't said twenty words altogether since you came in you let nothing of your thoughts be seen in your face either i have been listening madame said razumov using french for the first time hesitatingly not being certain of his accent but it seemed to produce an excellent impression madame de s looked meaningly into peter ivanovitch's spectacles as if to convey her conviction of this young man's merit she even nodded the least bit in his direction and razumov heard her murmur under her breath the words later on in the diplomatic service which could not but refer to the favourable impression he had made the fantastic absurdity of it revolted him because it seemed to outrage his ruined hopes with the vision of a mock career peter ivanovitch impassive as though he were deaf drank some more tea razumov felt that he must say something yes he began deliberately as if uttering a meditated opinion clearly even in planning a purely military revolution the temper of the people should be taken into account you have understood me perfectly the discontent should be spiritualized that is what the ordinary heads of revolutionary committees will not understand they aren't capable of it for instance mordatiev was in geneva last month peter ivanovitch brought him here you know mordatiev yes you've heard of him they call him an eagle a hero he has never done half as much as you have 
never attempted not half madame de s agitated herself angularly on the sofa we of course talked to him and do you know what he said to me what have we to do with balkan intrigues we must simply extirpate the scoundrels extirpate is all very well but what then the imbecile i screamed at him but you must spiritualize don't you understand spiritualize the discontent she felt nervously in her pocket for a handkerchief she pressed it to her lips spiritualize said razumov interrogatively watching her heaving breast the long ends of an old black lace scarf she wore over her head slipped off her shoulders and hung down on each side of her ghastly rosy cheeks an odious creature she burst out again imagine a man who takes five lumps of sugar in his tea yes i said spiritualize how else can you make discontent effective and universal listen to this young man peter ivanovitch made himself heard solemnly effective and universal razumov looked at him suspiciously some say hunger will do that he remarked yes i know our people are starving in heaps but you can't make famine universal and it is not despair that we want to create there is no moral support to be got out of that it is indignation madame de s let her thin extended arms sink on her knees i am not a mordatiev began razumov Beyonce, murmured madame de s though i too am ready to say extirpate extirpate but in my ignorance of political work permit me to ask a balkan well intrigue wouldn't that take a very long time peter ivanovitch got up and moved off quietly to stand with his face to the window razumov heard a door close he turned his head and perceived that the lady companion had scuttled out of the room in matters of politics i am a supernaturalist madame de s broke the silence harshly peter ivanovitch moved away from the window and struck razumov lightly on the shoulder this was a signal for leaving but at the same time he addressed madame de s in a peculiar reminding tone eleanor whatever it meant she did not seem to hear him she leaned back in the corner of the sofa like a wooden figure the immovable peevishness of the face framed in the limp rusty lace had a character of cruelty as to extirpating she croaked at the attentive razumov there is only one class in russia which must be extirpated only one and that class consists of only one family you understand me that one family must be extirpated her rigidity was frightful like the rigour of a corpse galvanised into harsh speech and glittering stare by the force of murderous hate the sight fascinated razumov yet he felt more self-possessed than at any other time since he had entered this weirdly bare room he was interested but the great feminist by his side again uttered his appeal eleanor she disregarded it her carmine lips vaticinated with an extraordinary rapidity the liberating spirit would use arms before which rivers would part like jordan and ramparts fall down like the walls of jericho the deliverance from bondage would be effected by plagues and by signs by wonders and by war the women eleanor she ceased she had heard him at last she pressed her hand to her forehead what is it ah yes that girl the sister of it was miss holden that she meant that young girl and her mother had been leading a very retired life they were provincial ladies were they not the mother had been very beautiful traces were left yet peter ivanovitch when he called there for the first time was greatly struck but the cold way they received him was really surprising he is one of our national glories madame de s cried out with sudden vehemence all the world listens to him i don't know these ladies said razumov loudly rising from his chair what are you saying kirylo sidorovitch i understand that she was talking to you here in the garden the other day yes in the garden said razumov gloomily then with an effort she made herself known to me and then ran away from us all madame de s continued with ghastly vivacity after coming to the very door what a peculiar proceeding well i have been a shy little provincial girl at one time yes razumov she fell into this familiarity intentionally with an appalling grimace of graciousness razumov gave a perceptible start yes that's my origin a simple provincial family you are a marvel peter ivanovitch uttered but it was to razumov that she gave her death's head smile her tone was quite imperious you must bring the wild young thing here she is wanted i reckon upon your success mind 
she is not a wild young thing muttered razumov in a surly voice well then that's all the same she may be one of these young conceited democrats do you know what i think i think she is very much like you in character there is a smouldering fire of scorn in you you are darkly self-sufficient but i can see your very soul her shiny eyes had a dry intense stare which missing razumov gave him an absurd notion that she was looking at something which was visible to her behind him he cursed himself for an impressionable fool and asked with forced calmness what is it you see anything resembling me she moved her rigidly set face from left to right negatively some sort of phantom in my image pursued razumov slowly for i suppose a soul when it is seen is just that a vain thing there are phantoms of the living as well as of the dead the tenseness of madame de s s stare had relaxed and now she looked at razumov in a silence that became disconcerting i myself have had an experience he stammered out as if compelled i've seen a phantom once the unnaturally red lips moved to frame a question harshly of a dead person no living a friend no an enemy i hated him ah it was not a woman then a woman repeated razumov his eyes looking straight into the eyes of madame de s why should it have been a woman and why this conclusion why should i not have been able to hate a woman as a matter of fact the idea of hating a woman was new to him at that moment he hated madame de s but it was not exactly hate it was more like the abhorrence that may be caused by a wooden or plaster figure of a repulsive kind she moved no more than if she were such a figure even her eyes whose unwinking stare plunged into his own though shining were lifeless as though they were as artificial as her teeth for the first time razumov became aware of a faint perfume but faint as it was it nauseated him exceedingly again peter ivanovitch tapped him lightly on the shoulder thereupon he bowed and was about to turn away when he received the unexpected favour of a bony inanimate hand extended to him with the two words in hoarse french au revoir he bowed over the skeleton hand and left the room escorted by the great man who made him go out first the voice from the sofa cried after them you remain here pierre certainly ma chère amie but he left the room with razumov shutting the door behind him the landing was prolonged into a bare corridor right and left desolate perspectives of white and gold decoration without a strip of carpet the very light pouring through a large window at the end seemed dusty and a solitary speck reposing on the balustrade of white marble the silk top hat of the great feminist asserted itself extremely black and glossy in all that crude whiteness end of part three chapter two section one Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part 3, Chapter 2, Section 2 of Under Western Eyes by Joseph Conrad. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part 3, Chapter 2, Section 2. Peter Ivanovitch escorted the visitor without opening his lips even when they had reached the head of the stairs peter ivanovitch did not break the silence razumov's impulse to continue down the flight and out of the house without as much as a nod abandoned him suddenly he stopped on the first step and leaned his back against the wall below him the great hall with its checkered floor of black and white seemed absurdly large and like some public place where a great power of resonance awaits the provocation of footfalls and voices as if afraid of awakening the loud echoes of that empty house razumov adopted a low tone i really have no mind to turn into a dilettante spiritualist peter ivanovitch shook his head slightly very serious or spend my time in spiritual ecstasies or sublime meditations upon the gospel of feminism continued razumov i made my way here for my share of action action most respected peter ivanovitch it was not the great european writer who attracted me here to this odious town of liberty it was somebody much greater it was the idea of the chief which attracted me there are starving young men in russia who believe in you so much that it seems the only thing that keeps them alive in their misery think of that peter ivanovitch no but only think of that the great man thus entreated perfectly motionless and silent 
was the very image of patient placid respectability of course i don't speak of the people they are brutes added razumov in the same subdued but forcible tone at this a protesting murmur issued from the heroic fugitive's beard a murmur of authority say children no brutes razumov insisted bluntly but they are sound they are innocent the great man pleaded in a whisper as far as that goes a brute is sound enough razumov raised his voice at last and you can't deny the natural innocence of a brute but what's the use of disputing about names you just try to give these children the power and stature of men and see what they will be like you just give it to them and see but never mind i tell you peter ivanovitch that half a dozen young men do not come together nowadays in a shabby student's room without your name being whispered not as a leader of thought but as a centre of revolutionary energies the centre of action what else has drawn me near you do you think it is not what all the world knows of you surely it's precisely what the world at large does not know i was irresistibly drawn let us say impelled yes impelled or rather compelled driven driven repeated razumov loudly and ceased as if startled by the hollow reverberation of the word driven along two bare corridors and in the great empty hall peter ivanovitch did not seem startled in the least the young man could not control a dry uneasy laugh the great revolutionist remained unmoved with an effect of commonplace homely superiority curse him said razumov to himself he is waiting behind his spectacles for me to give myself away then aloud with a satanic enjoyment of the scorn prompting him to play with the greatness of the great man ah peter ivanovitch if you only knew the force which drew no which drove me towards you the irresistible force he did not feel any desire to laugh now this time peter ivanovitch moved his head sideways knowingly as much as to say don't i this expressive movement was almost imperceptible razumov went on in secret derision all these days you have been trying to read me peter ivanovitch that is natural i have perceived it and i have been frank perhaps you may think i have not been very expansive but with a man like you it was not needed it would have looked like an impertinence perhaps and besides we russians are prone to talk too much as a rule i have always felt that and yet as a nation we are dumb i assure you that i am not likely to talk to you so much again ha 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 razumov still keeping on the lower step came a little nearer to the great man you have been condescending enough i quite understood it was to lead me on you must render me the justice that i have not tried to please i have been impelled compelled or rather sent let us say sent towards you for a work that no one but myself can do you would call it a harmless delusion a ridiculous delusion at which you don't even smile it is absurd of me to talk like this yet some day you shall remember these words i hope enough of this here i stand before you confessed but one thing more i must add to complete it a mere blind tool i can never consent to be whatever acknowledgment razumov was prepared for he was not prepared to have both his hands seized in the great man's grasp the swiftness of the movement was aggressive enough to startle the burly feminist could not have been quicker had his purpose been to jerk razumov treacherously up on the landing and bundle him behind one of the numerous closed doors near by this idea actually occurred to razumov his hands being released after a darkly eloquent squeeze he smiled with a beating heart straight at the beard and the spectacles hiding that impenetrable man he thought to himself it stands confessed in his handwriting i won't move from here till he either speaks or turns away this is a duel many seconds passed without a sign or sound yes yes the great man said hurriedly in subdued tones as if the whole thing had been a stolen breathless interview exactly come to see us here in a few days this must be gone into deeply deeply between you and me quite to the bottom to the and by the by you must bring along natalia victorovna you know the holden girl am i to take this as my first instruction from you inquired razumov stiffly peter ivanovitch seemed perplexed by this new attitude ah hm. you are naturally the proper person la personne indique every one shall be wanted presently every one he bent down from the landing over razumov who had lowered his eyes the moment of action approaches he murmured razumov did not look up 
he did not move till he heard the door of the drawing-room close behind the greatest of feminists returning to his painted egeria then he walked down slowly into the hall the door stood open and the shadow of the house was lying aslant over the greatest part of the terrace while crossing it slowly he lifted his hat and wiped his damp forehead expelling his breath with force to get rid of the last vestiges of the air he had been breathing inside he looked at the palms of his hands and rubbed them gently against his thighs he felt bizarre as it may seem as though another self an independent sharer of his mind had been able to view his whole person very distinctly indeed this is curious he thought after a while he formulated his opinion of it in the mental ejaculation beastly this disgust vanished before a marked uneasiness this is an effect of nervous exhaustion he reflected with weary sagacity how am i to go on day after day if i have no more power of resistance moral resistance he followed the path at the foot of the terrace moral resistance moral resistance he kept on repeating these words mentally moral endurance yes that was the necessity of the situation an immense longing to make his way out of these grounds into the other end of the town of throwing himself on his bed and going to sleep for hours swept everything clean out of his mind for a moment is it possible that i am but a weak creature after all he asked himself in sudden alarm eh what's that he gave a start as if awakened from a dream he even swayed a little before recovering himself ah you stole away from us quietly to walk about here he said the lady companion stood before him but how she came there he had not the slightest idea her folded arms were closely cherishing the cat i have been unconscious as i walked it's a positive fact said razumov to himself in wonder he raised his hat with marked civility the sallow woman blushed duskily she had her invariably scared expression as if somebody had just disclosed to her some terrible news but she held her ground razumov noticed without timidity she is incredibly shabby he thought in the sunlight her black costume looked greenish with here and there threadbare patches where the stuff seemed decomposed by age into a velvety black furry state her very hair and eyebrows looked shabby razumov wondered whether she were sixty years old her figure though was young enough he observed that she did not appear starved but rather as if she had been fed on unwholesome scraps and leavings of plates razumov smiled amiably and moved out of her way she turned her head to keep her scared eyes on him i know what you have been told in there she affirmed without preliminaries her tone in contrast with her manner had an unexpectedly assured character which put razumov at his ease do you you must have heard all sorts of talk on many occasions in there she varied her phrase with the same incongruous effect of positiveness i know to a certainty what you have been told to do really razumov shrugged his shoulders a little he was about to pass on with a bow when a sudden thought struck him yes to be sure in your confidential position you are aware of many things he murmured looking at the cat that animal got a momentary convulsive hug from the lady companion everything was disclosed to me a long time ago she said everything razumov repeated absently peter ivanovitch is an awful despot she jerked out razumov went on studying the stripes on the grey fur of the cat an iron will is an integral part of such a temperament how else could he be a leader and i think you are mistaken in there she cried you tell me that i am mistaken but i tell you all the same that he cares for no one she jerked her head up don't you bring that girl here that's what you have been told to do to bring that girl here listen to me you had better tie a stone round her neck and throw her into the lake razumov had a sensation of chill and gloom as if a heavy cloud had passed over the sun the girl he said what have i to do with her but you have been told to bring natalie halden here am i not right of course i am right i was not in the room but i know i know peter ivanovitch sufficiently well he is a great man great men are horrible well that's it have nothing to do with her that's the best you can do unless you want her to become like me disillusioned disillusioned like you repeated razumov glaring at her face as devoid of all comeliness of feature and complexion as the most miserable beggar is of money he smiled still feeling chilly a peculiar sensation which annoyed him disillusioned as to peter ivanovitch 
is that all you have lost she declared looking frightened but with immense conviction peter ivanovitch stands for everything then she added in another tone keep the girl away from this house and are you absolutely inciting me to disobey peter ivanovitch just because because you are disillusioned she began to blink directly i saw you for the first time i was comforted you took your hat off to me you looked as if one could trust you oh she shrank before razumov's savage snarl of i have heard something like this before she was so confounded that she could do nothing but blink for a long time it was your humane manner she explained plaintively i have been starving for i won't say kindness but just for a little civility for i don't know how long and now you are angry but no on the contrary he protested i am very glad you trust me it's possible that later on i may yes if you were to get ill she interrupted eagerly or meet some bitter trouble you would find i am not a useless fool you have only to let me know i will come to you i will indeed and i will stick to you misery and i are old acquaintances but this life here is worse than starving she paused anxiously then in a voice for the first time sounding really timid she added or if you were engaged in some dangerous work sometimes a humble companion i would not want to know anything i would follow you with joy i could carry out orders i have the courage razumov looked attentively at the scared round eyes at the withered sallow round cheeks they were quivering about the corners of the mouth she wants to escape from here he thought suppose i were to tell you that i am engaged in dangerous work he uttered slowly she pressed the cat to her threadbare bosom with a breathless exclamation ah then not much above a whisper under peter ivanovitch no not under peter ivanovitch he read admiration in her eyes and made an effort to smile then alone he held up his closed hand with the index raised like this finger he said she was trembling slightly but it occurred to razumov that they might have been observed from the house and he became anxious to be gone she blinked raising up to him her puckered face and seemed to beg mutely to be told something more to be given a word of encouragement for her starving grotesque and pathetic devotion can we be seen from the house asked razumov confidentially she answered without showing the slightest surprise at the question no we can't on account of this end of the stables and she added with an acuteness which surprised razumov but anybody looking out of an upstairs window would know that you have not passed through the gates yet who's likely to spy out of the window queried razumov peter ivanovitch she nodded why should he trouble his head he expects somebody this afternoon you know the person there's more than one she had lowered her eyelids razumov looked at her curiously of course you hear everything they say she murmured without any animosity so do the tables and chairs he understood that the bitterness accumulated in the heart of that helpless creature had got into her veins and like some subtle poison had decomposed her fidelity to that hateful pair it was a great piece of luck for him he reflected because women are seldom venal after the manner of men who can be bought for material considerations she would be a good ally though it was not likely that she was allowed to hear as much as the tables and chairs at the chateau borel that could not be expected but still and at any rate she could be made to talk when she looked up her eyes met the fixed stare of razumov who began to speak at once well well dear but upon my word i haven't the pleasure of knowing your name yet isn't it strange for the first time she made a movement of the shoulders is it strange no one is told my name no one cares no one talks to me no one writes to me my parents don't even know if i'm alive i have no use for a name and i have almost forgotten it myself razumov murmured gravely yes but still she went on much slower with indifference you may call me tekla then my poor andrei called me so i was devoted to him he lived in wretchedness and suffering and died in misery that is the lot of all us russians nameless russians there is nothing else for us and no hope anywhere unless unless what unless all these people with names are done away with she finished blinking and pursing up her lips it will be easier to call you tekla as you direct me said razumov if you consent to call me kirillo when we are talking like this quietly only you and me and he said to himself here's a being who must be terribly afraid of the world 
else she would have run away from this situation before then he reflected that the mere fact of leaving the great man abruptly would make her a suspect she could expect no support or countenance from any one this revolutionist was not fit for an independent existence she moved with him a few steps blinking and nursing the cat with a small balancing movement of her arms yes only you and i that's how i was with my poor andre only he was dying killed by these official brutes while you you are strong you kill the monsters you have done a great deed peter ivanovitch himself must consider you well don't forget me especially if you are going back to work in russia i could follow you carrying anything that was wanted at a distance you know or i could watch for hours at the corner of a street if necessary in wet or snow yes i could all day long or i could write for you dangerous documents lists of names or instructions so that in case of mischance the handwriting could not compromise you and you need not be afraid if they were to catch me i would know how to keep dumb we women are not so easily daunted by pain i heard peter ivanovitch say it is our blunt nerves or something we can stand it better and it's true i would just as soon bite my tongue out and throw it at them as not what's the good of speech to me who would ever want to hear what i could say ever since i closed the eyes of my poor andre i haven't met a man who seemed to care for the sound of my voice i should never have spoken to you if the very first time you appeared here you had not taken notice of me so nicely i could not help speaking of you to that charming dear girl oh the sweet creature and strong one can see that at once if you have a heart don't let her set her foot in here good-bye razumov caught her by the arm her emotion at being thus seized manifested itself by a short struggle after which she stood still not looking at him but you can tell me he spoke in her ear why they these people in that house there are so anxious to get hold of her she freed herself to turn upon him as if made angry by the question don't you understand that peter ivanovitch must direct inspire influence it is the breath of his life there can never be too many disciples he can't bear thinking of any one escaping him and a woman too there is nothing to be done without women he says he has written it he the young man was staring at her passion when she broke off suddenly and ran away behind the stable end of part three chapter two section two Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part 3, Chapter 3, Section 1 of Under Western Eyes by Joseph Conrad. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part 3, Chapter 3, Section 1. Razumov, thus left to himself, took the direction of the gate but on this day of many conversations he discovered that very probably he could not leave the grounds without having to hold another one stepping in view from beyond the lodge appeared the expected visitors of peter ivanovitch a small party composed of two men and a woman they noticed him too immediately and stopped short as if to consult but in a moment the woman moving aside motioned with her arm to the two men who leaving the drive at once struck across the large neglected lawn or rather grass plot and made directly for the house the woman remained on the path waiting for razumov's approach she had recognized him he too had recognized her at the first glance he had been made known to her at zurich where he had broken his journey while on his way from dresden they had been much together for the three days of his stay she was wearing the very same costume in which he had seen her first a blouse of crimson silk made her noticeable at a distance with that she wore a short brown skirt and a leather belt her complexion was the colour of coffee and milk but very clear her eyes black and glittering her figure erect a lot of thick hair nearly white was done up loosely under a dusty tyrolese hat of dark cloth which seemed to have lost some of its trimmings the expression of her face was grave intent so grave that razumov after approaching her close felt obliged to smile she greeted him with a manly hand grasp what are you going away she exclaimed how is that razumov i am going away because i haven't been asked to stay razumov answered returning the pressure of her hand with much less force than she had put into it she jerked her head sideways like one who understands meantime razumov's eyes had strayed after the two men they were crossing the grass plot obliquely without haste 
the shorter of the two was buttoned up in a narrow overcoat of some thin grey material which came nearly to his heels his companion much taller and broader wore a short close-fitting jacket and tight trousers tucked into shabby top boots the woman who had sent them out of razumov's way apparently spoke in a business-like voice i had to come rushing from zurich on purpose to meet the train and take these two along here to see peter ivanovitch i've just managed it ah indeed razumov said perfunctorily and very vexed at her staying behind to talk to him from zurich yes of course and these two they come from she interrupted without emphasis from quite another direction from a distance too a considerable distance razumov shrugged his shoulders the two men from a distance after having reached the wall of the terrace disappeared suddenly at its foot as if the earth had opened to swallow them up oh well they have just come from america the woman in the crimson blouse shrugged her shoulders too a little before making that statement the time is drawing near she interjected as if speaking to herself i did not tell them who you were yakovlitch would have wanted to embrace you is that he with a wisp of hair hanging from his chin in the long coat you've guessed aright that's yakovlitch and they could not find their way here from the station without you coming on purpose from zurich to show it to them verily without women we can do nothing so it stands written and apparently so it is he was conscious of an immense lassitude under his effort to be sarcastic and he could see that she had detected it with those steady brilliant black eyes what is the matter with you i don't know nothing i've had a devil of a day she waited with her black eyes fixed on his face then what of that you men are so impressionable and self-conscious one day is like another hard hard and there's an end of it till the great day comes i came over for a very good reason they wrote to warn peter ivanovitch of their arrival but where from only from cherbourg on a bit of ship's note-paper anybody could have done that yakovlitch has lived for years and years in america i am the only one at hand who had known him well in the old days i knew him very well indeed so peter ivanovitch telegraphed asking me to come it's natural enough is it not you came to vouch for his identity inquired razumov yes something of the kind fifteen years of a life like his make changes in a man lonely like a crow in a strange country when i think of yakovlitch before he went to america the softness of the low tone caused razumov to glance at her sideways she sighed her black eyes were looking away she had plunged the fingers of her right hand deep into the mass of nearly white hair and stirred them there absently when she withdrew her hand the little hat perched on the top of her head remained slightly tilted with a queer inquisitive effect contrasting strongly with a reminiscent murmur that escaped her we were not in our first youth even then but a man is a child always razumov thought suddenly they have been living together then aloud why didn't you follow him to america he asked point-blank she looked up at him with a perturbed air don't you remember what was going on fifteen years ago it was a time of activity the revolution has its history by this time you are in it and yet you don't seem to know it yakovlitch went away then on a mission i went back to russia it had to be so afterwards there was nothing for him to come back to ah indeed muttered razumov with affected surprise nothing what are you trying to insinuate she exclaimed quickly well and what then if he did get discouraged a little he looks like a yankee with that goatee hanging from his chin a regular uncle sam growled razumov well and you you who went to russia you did not get discouraged never mind yakovlitch is a man who cannot be doubted he at any rate is the right sort her black penetrating gaze remained fixed upon razumov while she spoke and for a moment afterwards pardon me razumov inquired coldly but does it mean that you for instance think that i am not the right sort she made no protest gave no sign of having heard the question she continued looking at him in a manner which he judged not to be absolutely unfriendly in zurich when he passed through she had taken him under her charge in a way and was with him from morning till night during his stay of two days she took him round to see several people at first she talked to him a great deal and rather unreservedly but always avoiding all reference to herself towards the middle of the second day she fell silent attending him zealously as before 
and even seeing him off at the railway station where she pressed his hand firmly through the lowered carriage window and stepping back without a word waited till the train moved he had noticed that she was treated with quiet regard he knew nothing of her parentage nothing of her private history or political record he judged her from his own private point of view as being a distinct danger in his path judged is not perhaps the right word it was more of a feeling the summing up of slight impressions aided by the discovery that he could not despise her as he despised all the others he had not expected to see her again so soon no decidedly her expression was not unfriendly yet he perceived an acceleration in the beat of his heart the conversation could not be abandoned at that point he went on in accents of scrupulous inquiry is it perhaps because i don't seem to accept blindly every development of the general doctrine such for instance as the feminism of our great peter ivanovitch if that is what makes me suspect then i can only say i would scorn to be a slave even to an idea she had been looking at him all the time not as a listener looks at one but as if the words he chose to say were only of secondary interest when he finished she slipped her hand by a sudden and decided movement under his arm and impelled him gently towards the gate of the grounds he felt her firmness and obeyed the impulsion at once just as the other two men had a moment before obeyed unquestioningly the wave of her hand they made a few steps like this no razumov your ideas are probably all right she said you may be valuable very valuable what's the matter with you is that you don't like us she released him he met her with a frosty smile am i expected then to have love as well as convictions she shrugged her shoulders you know very well what i mean people have been thinking you not quite whole-hearted i have heard that opinion from one side and another but i have understood you at the end of the first day razumov interrupted her speaking steadily i assure you that your perspicacity is at fault here what phrases he uses she exclaimed parenthetically ah kirylo sidorovitch you like other men are fastidious full of self-love and afraid of trifles moreover you had no training what you want is to be taken in hand by some woman i am sorry i am not staying here a few days i am going back to zurich to-morrow and shall take yakovlitch with me most likely this information relieved razumov i am sorry too he said but all the same i don't think you understand me he breathed more freely she did not protest but asked and how did you get on with peter ivanovitch you have seen a good deal of each other how is it between you two not knowing what answer to make the young man inclined his head slowly her lips had been parted in expectation she pressed them together and seemed to reflect that's all right this had a sound of finality but she did not leave him it was impossible to guess what she had in her mind razumov muttered it is not of me that you should have asked that question in a moment you shall see peter ivanovitch himself and the subject will come up naturally he will be curious to know what has delayed you so long in this garden no doubt peter ivanovitch will have something to say to me several things he may even speak of you question me peter ivanovitch is inclined to trust me generally question you that's very likely she smiled half serious well and what shall i say to him i don't know you may tell him of your discovery what's that why my lack of love for oh that's between ourselves she interrupted it was hard to say whether in jest or earnest i see that you want to tell peter ivanovitch something in my favour said razumov with grim playfulness well then you can tell him that i am very much in earnest about my mission i mean to succeed you have been given a mission she exclaimed quickly it amounts to that i have been told to bring about a certain event she looked at him searchingly a mission she repeated very grave and interested all at once what sort of mission something in the nature of propaganda work ah far away from here no not very far said razumov restraining a sudden desire to laugh although he did not feel joyous in the least so she said thoughtfully well i am not asking questions it's sufficient that peter ivanovitch should know what each of us is doing everything is bound to come right in the end you think so i don't think young man i just simply believe it and is it to peter ivanovitch that you owe that faith she did not answer the question and they stood idle silent as if reluctant to part with each other 
that's just like a man she murmured at last as if it were possible to tell how a belief comes to one her thin mephistophelian eyebrows moved a little truly there are millions of people in russia who would envy the life of dogs in this country it is a horror and a shame to confess this even between ourselves one must believe for very pity this can't go on no it can't go on for twenty years i have been coming and going looking neither to the left nor to the right what are you smiling to yourself for you are only at the beginning you have begun well but you just wait till you have trodden every particle of yourself under your feet in your comings and goings for that is what it comes to you've got to trample down every particle of your own feelings for stop you cannot you must not i have been young too but perhaps you think that i am complaining eh i don't think anything of the sort protested razumov indifferently i dare say you don't you dear superior creature you don't care she plunged her fingers into the bunch of hair on the left side and that brusque movement had the effect of setting the tyrolese hat straight on her head she frowned under it without animosity in the manner of an investigator razumov averted his face carelessly you men are all alike you mistake luck for merit you do it in good faith too i would not be too hard on you it's masculine nature you men are ridiculously pitiful in your aptitude to cherish childish illusions down to the very grave there are a lot of us who have been at work for fifteen years i mean constantly trying one way after another underground and above ground looking neither to the right nor to the left i can talk about it i have been one of these that never rested there what's the use of talking look at my grey hairs and here two babies come along i mean you and holden you come along and manage to strike a blow at the very first try at the name of holden falling from the rapid and energetic lips of the woman revolutionist razumov had the usual brusque consciousness of the irrevocable but in all the months which had passed over his head he had become hardened to the experience the consciousness was no longer accompanied by the blank dismay and the blind anger of the early days he had argued himself into new beliefs and he had made for himself a mental atmosphere of gloomy and sardonic reverie a sort of murky medium through which the event appeared like a featureless shadow having vaguely the shape of a man a shape extremely familiar yet utterly inexpressive except for its air of discreet waiting in the dusk it was not alarming what was he like the woman revolutionist asked unexpectedly what was he like echoed razumov making a painful effort not to turn upon her savagely but he relieved himself by laughing a little while he stole a glance at her out of the corners of his eyes this reception of her inquiry disturbed her how like a woman he went on what is the good of concerning yourself with his appearance whatever it was he is removed beyond all feminine influences now a frown making three folds at the root of her nose accentuated the mephistophelian slant of her eyebrows you suffer razumov she suggested in her low confident voice what nonsense razumov faced the woman fairly but now i think of it i am not sure that he is beyond the influence of one woman at least the one over there madame de s you know formerly the dead were allowed to rest but now it seems they are at the beck and call of a crazy old harridan we revolutionists make wonderful discoveries it is true that they are not exactly our own we have nothing of our own but couldn't the friend of peter ivanovitch satisfy your feminine curiosity couldn't she conjure him up for you he jested like a man in pain her concentrated frowning expression relaxed and she said a little wearily let us hope she will make an effort and conjure up some tea for us but that is by no means certain i am tired razumov you tired what a confession well there has been tea up there i had some if you hurry on after yakovlitch instead of wasting your time with such an unsatisfactory sceptical person as myself you may find the ghost of it the cold ghost of it still lingering in the temple but as to you being tired i can hardly believe it we are not supposed to be we mustn't we can't the other day i read in some paper or other an alarmist article on the tireless activity of the revolutionary parties it impresses the world it's our prestige he flings out continually these flouts and sneers the woman in the crimson blouse spoke as if appealing quietly to a third person but her black eyes never left razumov's face and what for pray simply because some of his conventional notions are shocked 
some of his petty masculine standards you might think he was one of these nervous sensitives that come to a bad end and yet she went on after a short reflective pause and changing the mode of her address and yet i have just learned something which makes me think you are a man of character kirylo sidorovitch yes indeed you are the mysterious positiveness of this assertion startled razumov their eyes met he looked away and through the bars of the rusty gate stared at the clean wide road shaded by the leafy trees an electric tram-car quite empty ran along the avenue with a metallic rustle it seemed to him he would have given anything to be sitting inside all alone he was inexpressibly weary weary in every fibre of his body but he had a reason for not being the first to break off the conversation at any instant in the visionary and criminal babble of revolutionists some momentous words might fall on his ear from her lips from anybody's lips as long as he managed to preserve a clear mind and to keep down his irritability there was nothing to fear the only condition of success and safety was indomitable will-power he reminded himself he longed to be on the other side of the bars as though he were actually a prisoner within the grounds of this centre of revolutionary plot of this house of folly of blindness of villainy and crime silently he indulged his wounded spirit in a feeling of immense moral and mental remoteness he did not even smile when he heard her repeat the words yes a strong character he continued to gaze through the bars like a moody prisoner not thinking of escape but merely pondering upon the faded memories of freedom if you don't look out he mumbled still looking away you shall certainly miss seeing as much as the mere ghost of that tea she was not to be shaken off in such a way as a matter of fact he had not expected to succeed never mind it will be no great loss i mean the missing of her tea and only the ghost of it at that as to the lady you must understand that she has her positive uses see that razumov he turned his head at this imperative appeal and saw the woman revolutionist making the motions of counting money into the palm of her hand that's what it is you see razumov uttered a slow i see and returned to his prisoner-like gazing upon the neat and shady road material means must be obtained in some way and this is easier than breaking into banks more certain too there i am joking what is he muttering to himself now she cried under her breath my admiration of peter ivanovitch's devoted self-sacrifice that's all it's enough to make one sick oh you squeamish masculine creature sick makes him sick and what do you know of the truth of it there's no looking into the secrets of the heart peter ivanovitch knew her years ago in his worldly days when he was a young officer in the guards it is not for us to judge an inspired person that's where you men have an advantage you are inspired sometimes both in thought and action i have always admitted that when you are inspired when you manage to throw off your masculine cowardice and prudishness you are not to be equalled by us only how seldom whereas the silliest woman can always be made of use and why because we have passion unappeasable passion i should like to know what he is smiling at i am not smiling protested razumov gloomily well how is one to call it you made some sort of face yes i know you men can love here and hate there and desire something or other and you make a great to-do about it and you call it passion yes while it lasts but we women are in love with love and with hate with these very things i tell you and with desire itself that's why we can't be bribed off so easily as you men in life you see there is not much choice you have either to rot or to burn and there is not one of us painted or unpainted that would not rather burn than rot she spoke with energy but in a matter-of-fact tone razumov's attention had wandered away on a track of its own outside the bars of the gate but not out of earshot he stuck his hands into the pockets of his coat rot or burn powerfully stated painted or unpainted very vigorous painted or do tell me she would be infernally jealous of him wouldn't she who what the baroness eleanor maximovna jealous of peter ivanovitch heavens are these the questions the man's mind is running on such a thing is not to be thought of why can't a wealthy old woman be jealous or are they all pure spirits together but what put it into your head to ask such a question she wondered nothing i just asked 
masculine frivolity if you like i don't like she retorted at once it is not the time to be frivolous what are you flinging your very heart against or perhaps you are only playing a part end of part three chapter three section one recording by expatriate in bangor maine